theatrical lowlifes. A rich courtesan financed his political career. At age fifty, Sulla retained his louche habits, but cultivated a love of art and literature, and won a reputation as a hard-driving, brave military leader. Shrewd and calculating, Sulla could also be rash and unpredictable. As Sulla and many other leaders well understood, capricious behavior made one seem godlike, and it kept friends and foes off balance. Alternating clemency with sudden brutality was a tried-and-true power trip practiced by autocrats of all eras, including Mithridates. Scylla was distinguished by red blonde hair, pale gray eyes, and very fair skin. According to Plutarch, the name Scylla, Pimples, was an insulting reference to his unfortunate complexion. Perhaps because of some dermatological affliction, his skin was spotty with coarse bright red patches. Jesters joked that Sulla's face resembled a purplish-red mulberry mash sprinkled with white flour. Today the cruel expression might be pizza face, yet Sulla's imperious personality and his piercing gray eyes gave him a fearsome expression. Years before, when Sulla had bested Tigranes' army in Cappadocia to reinstate Ariobarzanes, a Babylonian seer had cast Sulla's fortune. Staring into the Romans' cold, pinpoint pupils— Taking account of his haughty bearing, his striking red hair, and odd skin markings, the holy man predicted that Sulla was bound to rise to great power. In his own memoirs, lost but quoted by Plutarch and others, Sulla proudly recounted how a chasm had opened up in the earth, belching forth huge gouts of flames to the sky. Interpreting this omen, the soothsayers predicted that a brave man of rare valor and surpassing appearance would take charge of Rome. Sulla identified himself as that man because of his golden hair and his great and noble deeds. As soon as Sulla's ship set sail across the Adriatic Sea, his political rival Cinna broke his promise of peace. Cinna issued a people's decree nullifying Sulla's command and proclaiming Sulla public enemy of Rome. Thus it happened that Rome's public enemy number one marched out to battle Rome's most dangerous enemy. Cut loose from Rome, Sulla now had to provision his five legions in a hostile land with no supply lines or money from Italy. The year's delay since the massacre meant that instead of sailing directly to Anatolia to crush Mithridates and retake the province of Asia, Sulla had to defeat the vast and victorious Pontic army occupying Greece. Upon landing in Greece, Sulla demanded money, reinforcements, horses, mules, and food from Aetolia, Thessaly, and Boeotia. At Sulla's approach, the city of Thebes got cold feet about its alliance with Mithridates and promised to supply iron, catapults, and weapons to the Romans. Dispatching half of his legions to attack Aristion in Athens, Sulla marched to Piraeus. He could have simply laid siege and waited for starvation and thirst to wear down Piraeus and Athens, but he was too worried about the events out of his control in Rome, impatient to return to Italy as supreme war hero. The Battle for Piraeus Like the great walls surrounding Athens, Piraeus's walls were constructed of limestone blocks with upper courses of brick and wood. Sulla immediately sent his men to try to scale the high walls, but Archelaus's defenders inflicted heavy casualties. Sulla's legions dragged themselves to safety, taking over the nearby towns of Eleusis and Megara. As hardware and material began to arrive from Thebes, Sulla scoured the countryside for mules. He needed at least ten thousand draft animals to operate his huge siege engines and towers. To build those machines, he ordered his men to hack down all the beautiful olive trees in the vicinity, ancient groves sacred to Athena. A bolt of lightning killed one of Sulla's soldiers cutting trees, but his soothsayers insisted it was a good omen because the man had fallen with his head pointing toward Piraeus. Next, Sulla's soldiers set about demolishing Piraeus' long walls connecting the harbor to Athens. They piled stones, timber, and dirt into a great mound for his catapults and siege machines. Inside Piraeus, two men conspired to betray Archelaus and help Sulla. Ironically, despite Mithridates' well-publicized liberation of the enslaved, these plotters were Athenian slaves. 
Were they, as Plutarch speculated, simply looking out for their own safety in the emergency? Perhaps the men suffered under cruel masters. At any rate, the pair secretly inscribed messages about Archelaus's plans onto lead sling balls and hurled them to land harmlessly near the Roman workers. After many volleys of these oddly aimed balls, Sulla noticed and picked one up. It read, Tomorrow Archelaus's soldiers will sally out to attack your workers, while his cavalry attacks both flanks of your army. Thus warned, Sulla ambushed and killed Archelaus's assault force. As Sulla's mound rose, Archelaus erected numerous catapult towers on Piraeus's ramparts and sent for Dramachetes' reinforcements. Neoptolemus's army remained in Chalcis. In this tense period, before the battle, Archelaus armed all his oarsmen and distributed bowmen and slingers to defend his fire archers and catapults on the walls. Other men massed inside the gates with torches, ready to dash out and burn the enemy's machines. Appian and Plutarch recount how the first battle for Piraeus raged for many days. Archelaus led an all-out attack that sent the Roman legions reeling. Scylla's lieutenant, Murina, desperately screaming out orders, managed to drive the Romans forward, although the odds were against them. But just then another Roman legion returned from a wood-gathering detail. Dropping the logs, these legionnaires barreled into the battle. The Romans managed to kill more than two thousand of Archelaus's men and forced the rest back inside the walls. Archelaus, hoarse and possessed, urged his men to keep fighting. Appian reports that Mithridates' valiant commander stood his ground so long, even after the city gates slammed shut behind him, that he barely escaped. At the last moment he was hoisted over the wall by ropes. Archelaus could inform his king in Pergamon that Piraeus stood fast against Sulla. Up in Athens, however, starvation loomed. Piraeus had abundant grain supplies because Sulla could not stop ships in the fortified harbor. Archelaus attempted to deliver wheat to Athens under cover of night, but the two informers in Piraeus alerted Sulla by lobbing more messages on lead balls. Sulla ambushed several supply trains. Just as Archelaus realized that there were traitors in his city, he received miserable news from Neoptolemus in Chalcis. One of Sulla's officers had attacked there, killing fifteen hundred soldiers and capturing twice as many prisoners. Work on Sulla's siege mound continued outside Piraeus. All winter, Archelaus kept up constant pressure, slamming the Roman workers with catapult boulders, lead balls, stones, javelins, and fire arrows. Unseen, Archelaus's sappers secretly tunneled under the mound, carrying away tubs of earth. Suddenly, the mound collapsed, killing Romans and toppling war machines. The Romans rebuilt the mound and dug a counter-tunnel. The tunnelers met underground. Swords and spears clashed in the dark passage. Above, Sulla pounded Piraeus's walls with battering rams until a section fell away. He directed volleys of firebolts at Archelaus's catapult towers. But Piraeus's towers were oddly impervious to fire. Archelaus knew a secret method. He had coated his walls and towers with alum, an opaque crystal formed by the vapors of volcanoes imported from Smyrna, Syria, and Egypt. Alum was used in tanning, dyeing, and medicine, mixed with water it hardened plaster and strengthened rope. Painted on wood, it's an effective fire retardant. Sulla's men, unfamiliar with alum, were stymied. Finally, the Romans lit an enormous bonfire of pine logs under the wooden beams of the damaged wall. Copying a tactic invented by the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War, Sulla tossed sulfur and pine resin onto the flames, which burst into a raging conflagration, spewing toxic gases. The burning wall crashed down, killing many defenders. Pressing his advantage, Sulla sent men to scale the walls in the middle of the night. They snuffed the sleeping guards, but Archelaus's soldiers hurled the attackers over the wall and ran out to set fire to Sulla's towers. A full-scale battle raged in the dark, lit by fires and flaming missiles. A great many defenders of Piraeus died, killed by fire from Sulla's siege towers, each of which could catapult twenty heavy lead balls and bolts at once at a range of four hundred yards. In 2004, 
An exceptional archaeological discovery in Greece, the skeleton of a soldier killed instantly by a catapult bolt, graphically illustrates the kind of massive damage that was inflicted by Sulla's machines. The demoralized and jittery troops on the walls could only offer feeble resistance to Sulla's relentless assault. Sensing weakness, Sulla pushed harder, continually sending in fresh divisions and cheering them on. This is our main chance. But Archelaus met Sulla's challenge, bringing up fresh troops to replace the discouraged ones and imploring his men to fight on. Casualties were extremely high on both sides. Appian's sources agreed that it was again Mithridates' general Archelaus who surpassed all others in endurance and valor. Relief flooded his men when they heard Sulla sound the retreat. They labored several nights to repair their walls. Sulla tried one last attack with his entire army, but the Romans fell back under a heavy rain of missiles from the restored walls. Archelaus honored his men with tokens for their bravery. A remarkable discovery of one of these tokens brings the battle for Piraeus alive for us more than two thousand years later, and it indicates the ethnic diversity of Mithridates' liberation army in Greece. The silver bracelet, presented to a soldier in 86 BC, is inscribed with the words, In Piraeus, the general Archelaus gives this to Apollonius, a Syrian, as a reward for his courage. Forced to abandon any idea of taking Piraeus by assault, Sulla had to settle in for a very long siege, but he still had no way to blockade the harbor and deny Archelaus food and reinforcements arriving by sea. Mithridates' strategy of occupying Euboea and Macedonia and dominating the Aegean Sea was paying off. Ships and Treasure Seething with hatred for the Greeks, anxious to win this damnable war and return to Rome, Sulla knew he needed a lot of money and a navy to destroy Mithridates' forces in Greece. But as Rome's public outlaw, he could expect nothing from the Senate. Sulla got a message through to Rhodes demanding ships, but to no avail. Rhodes had the ships, but pointed out that Mithridates' navy and pirate fleets controlled the entire Aegean. So Sulla sent his aide, Lucullus, on a daring secret mission. Sailed to Rhodes and Alexandria to procure ships and sailors, then somehow escort these fleets evading Mithridates' navy back to Sulla. Lucullus embarked at night on a swift vessel. Taking evasive action, changing ships frequently, Lucullus managed to slip past Mithridates' blockade and roving pirates. He spent the winter in Rhodes, and in early 85 BC he arrived in Alexandria. But his success so far was unknown to Sulla. Sulla, in the meantime, solved his financial problem. He seized the sacred treasures of Greece, plundering the temples of Zeus at Olympia and Asclepius in Epidaurus. Selecting the most beautiful, precious art objects for himself, he melted down massive amounts of silver to pay his men and buy supplies. Delphi was the most ancient and richest treasury of antiquity, its integrity traditionally guarded by distinguished citizens from around the Greek world. Wealthy monarchs had dedicated magnificent riches and artworks to Apollo's Delphic oracle over the centuries. In the 6th century BC, for example, King Croesus of Lydia had donated 117 enormous ingots of gold, many solid gold statues, including a lion weighing more than 500 pounds, immense silver urns and golden bowls, and other fabulous artifacts, jewels, and weaponry. The guardians at Delphi were horrified to receive Sulla's blunt command. Apollo's treasures were to be transferred to him for safekeeping. If he found it necessary to melt down the god's property, Sulla assured them the loan would be repaid. Sulla sent a Greek, Cephas, to take possession, with orders to record the weight of each valuable object. But once inside the temple, Cephas burst out crying. He couldn't bring himself to touch Apollo's treasure, which had escaped even Xerxes' Persian looters in 480 B.C. and marauding Gauls two centuries later. He sent a desperate message to Sulla, swearing that the god could be heard playing his lyre in the inner sanctum. Sulla's reply, don't you understand? The music signals Apollo's approval. Bring me the treasure immediately. Delphi's treasures were packed onto mules. 
Only one item remained, one of the royal gifts of King Croesus described by the historian Herodotus, a huge repoussé silver jar with a capacity of five thousand gallons. The tearful guardians were forced to cut the beautiful jar into pieces to be loaded on the mules. Plutarch, who later served as a priest at Apollo's Delphic Oracle, felt their anguish. In the past, he exclaimed more honorable, disciplined Roman commanders had not only spared Greece's sanctuaries, they had bestowed important gifts to the gods themselves. But those generals were lawful, self-restrained, incorruptible Romans from olden days, wrote Plutarch, nothing like the grasping and brutal Sulla who paved the way for horrors in Greece and Italy. From the treasures of Delphi, Sulla again picked out choice artifacts for himself. One of the dedications became his personal amulet, an exquisite little golden figure of the god Apollo. From that day on, says Plutarch, Sulla always wore this image around his neck. Before battles, it was his habit to ostentatiously pull out the little statuette and kiss it, admonishing the god to bring a speedy victory. The Fall of Athens while Lucullus negotiated for ships in Egypt, Sulla set up camp outside Athens. From the Dipolon Gate, the Athenians watched aghast as Roman soldiers hacked down the venerable groves of Plato's Academy and Aristotle's Lyceum. The logs were hammered into enormous siege engines on the very spot where an unbroken line of philosophers had taught since Socrates. Sulla took personal possession of the precious library of works by Aristotle and Theophrastus, which had been rescued from a moldy cellar in Skepsis near Troy and stored in Athens. A gifted Athenian student named Linnaeus may have been taken as Sulla's slave at this time. Many years later, he would find himself translating Mithridates' toxicological notes into Latin. The citizens of Athens, delirious with starvation, defiantly took to the ramparts, deriding the Romans, mocking Sulla's ugly mulberry face, and belting out obscene songs about his wife. Their leader, the philosopher Aristion, put on his bronze helmet and breastplate, and danced about on the walls with them, shouting out insults. Against Aristion's orders, a party of councilmen ventured out to beg Sulla for mercy. They began by reminding the Roman warlord of Athens' heroic ancient history from the mythic Theseus to the great Pan-Hellenic victory in the Persian Wars. Sulla interrupted, Stop rambling, he sent them away. I'm not here for a history lesson. Rome sent me to subdue you Athenian rebels. Roman intelligence, probably wrung from famished Greeks attempting to forage herbs outside the walls, had informed Sulla that the Athenians were starving. All the sheep, goats, cattle, rabbits, chickens, tortoises, and other animals had disappeared long ago. There was no oil. Even Athena's sacred lamp was extinguished in the Parthenon. A shower of black ashes the year before had been a very bad omen, and still no rain fell to fill the cisterns. There was no wheat or barley, no fruit or olives. The people devoured weeds that grew on the Acropolis. Sulla's sources revealed that the trapped citizens were boiling down cow hides and leather sandals in cauldrons, licking up whatever sustenance they could. There were even rumors of cannibalism. With wolfish pleasure, Sulla directed his men to strangle the city by digging a deep trench around the walls. Plutarch wondered, why was Sulla possessed by such a dreadful and inexorable passion to punish Athens? Was Sulla so resentful of Athens' former glory? Was he provoked? by the scurrilous abuse showered on him and his wife by Aristion and the Athenians on the walls. Appian, writing centuries later, believed that Sulla's wrath stemmed from Greece's brazen loyalty to Mithridates and the Athenians' violent animosity toward himself. Every day the Athenians held out was a day wasted, while Sulla's enemies grew strong in Rome and Mithridates gloated in Pergamon. Plutarch's description of Sulla's destruction of Athens is vivid. A native of Chironia, Plutarch, born A.D. 46, interviewed some elderly Athenians whose grandparents had survived Sulla's siege. His other details came from Sulla's own journals and soldiers serving with him. Appian and Pausanias added further information. Sulla commanded his army to raise Athens' walls. He had learned that the weakest area between the Agora and the Kerameikos cemetery was not well guarded. 
evidence of Sulla's attack is still visible today. Several of his stone catapult balls can be seen in the ruins of the Kerameikos Cemetery. The citizen soldiers defending the walls were courageous, fully committed to Mithridates and freedom, but they were no match for five Roman legions. The starving people, wandering or dying inside, were too frail to fight. At midnight Sulla himself led the charge. Screaming war cries, the Roman soldiers vaulted over the walls and rammed through the gates. They ran through the dark streets, swords drawn, lusting to carry out their leader's explicit orders to pillage, rape, and massacre. No one, not even women and children, was to be spared. One exception was slaves. They counted as loot, at least as profitable as the hidden Athenian valuables the Romans dragged up from the wells. A great and pitiless slaughter swept through Athens, gem of ancient Greek civilization. The city of Athens, which had survived burning by Xerxes nearly five hundred years earlier, the Peloponnesian War, and the Macedonian Conquest, was utterly destroyed. Amid terrifying trumpet blasts and blood-curdling cries, many of the hopeless mustered their last wisp of energy to rush onto the enemy's swords. Others, expecting no humanity from Sulla, killed their families and themselves. As the Roman soldiers went about their bloody business, they found evidence of human flesh prepared as food in the houses. In this way, laments Appian, did Athens have her fill of horrors. Plutarch's sources described blood coursing from the Agra to the Karabekos Cemetery. The only way to gauge how many died that night was to measure how much ground was soaked in blood, wrote Plutarch. When the attack came... Aristion and company made their feeble way up to the Acropolis, the citadel where the last Athenians would make their last stand. On the way, Aristion stopped to set fire to the timbers of Pericles' famous concert hall, the Odeon, to deny Scylla wood for storming the sacred hill. The next day Scylla was busy auctioning off captive slaves, while his officers laid siege to Athens' last garrison on the Acropolis. Thirst compelled Aristion and his companions to surrender some days later. Scylla seized the Acropolis treasure, six hundred pounds of silver and forty pounds of gold. He gave a curt speech, praising the Athens of antiquity, boasting that he had spared the city from burning and pardoned some citizens who had survived on the Acropolis. Then, as the skies opened up and poured down rain too late to save the holdouts, Scylla executed Aristion, the last elected leader, of democratic Athens. Nearly three centuries later, the Greek historian Pausanias decried the merciless destruction inflicted in 86 BC on Athens by Scylla, whose cruelty surpassed even what you might expect from a Roman. Athens didn't begin to flourish again until two hundred years later. Unable to wait any longer for besieged Piraeus to surrender, Scylla now brought all his troops catapults, battering rams, and siege towers to strike Archelaus with savage force. Sulla led the attack himself, riding his large white war-horse among the troops, shouting encouragement, promising lavish rewards. His men, spurred to their work by love of glory and pride in the idea that it would be a splendid thing to conquer such impressive walls as Pericles' fort at Piraeus, pressed on like madmen. The Romans' frenzied surge astounded Archelaus. A wise tactician, and eager to fight another day, he ordered his men to abandon the walls and run for their ships in the fortified harbor. Behind them, the enraged Sulla ravaged the city of Piraeus, setting fire to Philo's magnificent arsenal, the navy yard, and all the other buildings admired since antiquity. Victory was finally his. Yet Sulla had nothing to show for it but loot, ashes, and ruins. He had no ships to pursue Archelaus. Burning with frustration, Sulla watched as Mithridates' intrepid general escaped with his army of ten thousand. Chaeronea When Archelaus joined Mithridates' other forces in Thessaly, he learned tragic news from Arcathius' co-commander Taxiles, news that would deal a grievous blow to Mithridates in Pergamon. The king's beloved son, Arcathius, had fallen ill in Macedonia and died near Mount Tisaon, Thessaly. Despite his untimely death, I think Arcathius was the happiest of Mithridates' many sons. His father placed absolute confidence in him. 
He died a victorious war hero who knew nothing but pride and love for Mithridates, unlike his brothers, who would end up enmeshed in betrayal and suspicion. The combined Mithridatic army was now one hundred and twenty thousand strong, with ninety scythe chariots. Each nationality in this polyglot mass had its own general, with Archelaus as supreme commander. This horde marched south as Sulla advanced north. In late summer of 86 BC, the two armies converged in Phocis. Archelaus led out his multitudes again and again, trying to provoke a battle, but Sulla held back. According to Appian, Sulla's troops numbered only about thirty or forty thousand. As Archelaus anticipated and Sulla understood, the sight of Mithridates' milling throngs of warriors from so many unfamiliar lands presented a fearsome spectacle for the Roman soldiers. The sheer opulence of the barbarians' equipment awed the Romans. Huddled in their trenches, the soldiers eyed the fine swords inlaid with precious gems, flashing armor embellished with silver and gold. The rich colors of the Median and Scythian corselets and mail all intermingled with gleaming bronze and glinting steel. The clamor of dozens of different languages filled the air. Mithridates had gathered recruits from a vast area, Joining the former Roman slaves, Greeks, and pirates were Thracians, Macedonians, Bastarni, Sarmatians, Scythians, Taurians, Meotians. From the Caucasus came Colchians, Heniacoi, Albanoi, Iberi. There were Pontians, Bithynians, Phrygians, Paphlagonians, Cappadocians, Chaldeans, Cilicians, Galatians, Turret folk, Calabians. Tiberani, Armenians, Medes, and Syrians. Some of the eastern groups brought camels presenting the Romans and their horses with strange sights and stranger smells. Many of the barbarians wore their hair long and adorned themselves with golden, copper, and silver earrings, wristlets, and necklaces. Warriors from Thrace, Sarmatia, Scythia, Trapezus, and Colchis proudly sported extensive tattoos as signs of manhood and battle prowess, a confusing concept for the Romans who inflicted tattoos to brand slaves and punish runaway soldiers. Swaggering about and shouting out insults and boasts, the barbarian multitude intimidated the Roman soldiers even though no one could understand their speech. Indeed, so many language and culture differences posed problems for Mithridates' generals. The unruly barbarians often ignored the chain of command and even raided towns and villages in Boeotia while they waited for the battle to commence. Scylla hunkered down and set onerous tasks to distract his nervous soldiers, digging ditches and taking over forts in the area. He reasoned that they would soon tire of the drudgery and be eager to fight. Meanwhile, he sent out spies, communicating with them secretly. One of Sulla's methods was to inflate a pig bladder like a balloon and dry it out. A message was written on the inflated bladder, dried out, and stuffed into an oil jar. Oil, carefully poured into the neck of the bladder, caused it to fill and adhere to the inside of the jar. The recipient broke open the jar and replied by the same method. Scylla's spies informed him that Archelaus's army had moved southeast and camped in the rocky hills above Chaeronea. It seemed a clever choice, defensible high ground with a good view of the plain below. Obviously Archelaus didn't expect to fight here. Two pro-Roman Greeks from Chaeronea, Anaxidamus and Homoloicus, approached Scylla with a plan. They knew a hidden path high above Archelaus's encampment. They proposed to sneak up this trail and rain down stones on the enemy tents, forcing the army out onto the plain in disorder. Scylla agreed. While the raiders set off, Sulla moved to occupy a broad meadow with an advantageous slope facing the cramped enemy encampment. If he could force Archelaus to muster his army in haste on uneven ground, they would be hedged in by boulders and outcrops, unable to maneuver or retreat. The sneak attack worked. Suddenly boulders crashed down on the unsuspecting barbarians. Crowded together, they stumbled in confusion down the steep cliffs, some falling on their own spears. The attackers leaped down and finished off at least three thousand men. The survivors rushed down to the lower main camp, causing a domino effect of terror and chaos. This was Sulla's chance. He immediately charged Archelaus's snarled army. 
Archelaus's advantage of higher numbers was lost. There was a cacophony of shouted commands in many languages as Archelaus sent out cavalry to meet Sulla's attack, but his horsemen were driven back onto the rocks. Desperate now, Archelaus launched sixty scythe chariots to rip through Sulla's legions. The goal was to replay the shock charge that had routed Nicomedes in 89 BC, but the situation was far from ideal. War chariots require a very long start on smooth ground, a target in disarray, and the element of surprise. The chariots failed to get up enough speed in the confined rocky space, and everyone saw them coming. Plutarch says the Romans burst out in guffaws and simply stepped aside, mimicking the evasion used by Alexander's army in 331 B.C. Scythes whirling impotently in the empty air, the chariots passed through the openings. All the chariot drivers were cut down by the javelins of Sulla's rear guard. Applauding uproariously, the Romans shouted for more chariots, as if they were at the races in the circus at Rome. As Sulla's forces steadily advanced, Archelaus organized his remaining men in the craggy cliffs. The barbarians resolutely locked their shields together and held their spears out before them. As the Romans marched forward, they were astonished to see that Archelaus's front lines consisted of fifteen thousand Roman slaves. These men, freed by Mithridates' proclamation since 88 BC, were probably identified by their slave tattoos and a special standard. Jeering in rage, the Roman soldiers dropped their javelins and drew their short swords, ready to slash through the wall of lowly slaves to get to the real soldiers. But Plutarch reported that the dense ranks of former slaves, boiling with hatred of everything Roman, demonstrated tremendous courage and grace under pressure. They held steadfast for a very long time. At last they fell back under the storm of fire bolts and javelins unleashed by Sulla's rear guard. Now Archelaus himself led a cavalry charge. It was a wild success, cutting the Roman formation in half. Slashing at the surrounded Romans, inspired by their commander at their side, the barbarians fought at the highest pitch of valor. Mithridates' general, Taxiles, led his bronze-shield barbarians into the fray. In the din of men, horses, and weapons, echoing off the hillsides, Sulla plunged into the maelstrom, yelling out directions. His cavalry struck with an impetuous charge joined by Murena's cohorts. Both wings of Archelaus's army gave way. In the constricted space, blinded by swirling dust and fear, many of his men ran headlong into the Roman lines, others scattered into the hills. Archelaus desperately tried to rally, but there was no room to regroup. The cheering Romans crushed the fleeing troops against the rocks. Hacking and stabbing, Sulla's men demolished the enemy. Mithridates' Greek liberation army was shredded. The Romans took thousands of prisoners, and only ten thousand men of the original one hundred and twenty thousand escaped. The survivors straggled to Archelaus' ships and retired to Chalcis, their haven in Euboea. Few believed Sulla's preposterous claim to have lost fewer than twenty men at Chaeronea, but he still commanded a sizable body of troops. His men piled up a mountain of barbarian weapons, scythed war chariots, and spoils. After selecting the best things for his triumph in Rome, Sulla burned the heaps of spoils as a sacrifice to the gods of war. He planned his victory festival in Thebes, but to punish the city for its earlier support of Mithridates, he seized half its territory and dedicated it to the gods. With this cynical act, Sulla claimed to have paid back the treasures he had borrowed from the gods at Delphi, Epidaurus, and Olympia. Sulla erected two victory monuments at Chaeronea, one of the greatest battles in ancient history. To celebrate the two decisive moments in the battle, Sulla's monument followed the archaic Greek style of a battle trophy, a branching tree festooned with the armor, shields, and weapons of the vanquished. The exotic arms and armor of Mithridates' colorful barbarian warriors carved in marble made an especially striking display. Plutarch, who lived his whole life overlooking the dancing ground of Ares, saw the Roman victory monuments himself, and they were still standing in the time of Pausanias in A.D. 180. Sulla placed his first trophy on the precipice where the rolling stones had routed the barbarians. The base was inscribed with the names of Mars, Zeus, and Aphrodite, and those of the two Chaeroneans who masterminded that exploit. The other monument stood on the battlefield by the brook 
where Archelaus's troops first gave way. Scylla's first monument was discovered in 1990 by archaeologist John Camp and students of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. Their discovery allowed modern historians to pinpoint for the first time the precise location of the ambush with stones. The Greek inscription matches Plutarch's account. Just below the monument, Camp found a crude rubble wall, the remains of the barbarians crushed encampment, still known in Plutarch's day as Archelaus. Sulla featured his two trophies on coins issued in Greece and later in Rome. After his triumph at Chaeronea, Sulla began to refer to himself as Felix or Lucky, and bragged in his memoirs that Greek oracles predicted another great victory soon in the same neighborhood. But Mithridates' wily general Archelaus was still free, with a substantial army and navy. Sulla, still lacking a fleet, was helpless to pursue him. Archelaus sailed here and there among the Greek islands, venturing as far west as Zacynthos, across from Italy, requisitioning and raiding more supplies and money at will. Appian remarked that Archelaus and his men returned to their headquarters in Chalcis more like pirates than soldiers. Or Orchomenus Meanwhile, bad news from Rome overshadowed Sulla's battlefield victory. Under Cinna and Marius there was a mass slaughter of Sulla's supporters in 86 BC. Cinna's newly elected co-consul, Flaccus, was officially named as Sulla's replacement in the war against Mithridates. Flaccus, inexperienced and unpopular with his troops, was accompanied by a young officer named Fimbria. They were hurrying to Greece with two legions to take over Sulla's command, and they had orders to make war on Sulla if he resisted. Compelled to turn his back on Mithridates, Sulla had to prepare to fight his Roman rivals. The fortunes of Sulla the Lucky were seesawing wildly. As he marched west to meet Flaccus and Fimbria, Sulla received equally alarming news from the Greek front he'd just left behind. Somehow, Mithridates' forces had regained Boeotia. In Pergamon, by all ancient reports, Mithridates was appalled to hear the bad tidings from Chaeronea. The disaster took him by surprise and struck fear into the heart of a father already grieving over the death of his son Arcathius. Some in his court suggested that only treachery could account for such lopsided losses. But Mithridates reacted quickly and forcefully. For the first time he collected taxes in Anatolia. Gathering another enormous army from all his subject lands, he sent his most trustworthy friend from Pontus, Dorilaeus, to the rescue. Dorilaeus sailed to Chalcis with a large fleet and 80,000 fresh, highly trained, disciplined soldiers eager to take back Greece and get even with Sulla for the humiliating losses at Chaeronea. Behind Sulla's back, Dorilaeus and Archelaus, with a combined army of about 90,000 soldiers, secured Boeotia. The two generals decided to camp at Orchomenus, east of Chaeronea. For an army like theirs, with a superior cavalry of 10,000 horsemen, the sweeping, treeless plain along the river Melus was the best battleground in Boeotia. But they made notes to avoid the reedy swamps at the margins of the plain. Sulla was forced to turn away from Flaccus and Fimbria and rush back to Orchomenus. Observing the landscape's advantages and disadvantages, Scylla immediately dug wide trenches that would funnel the enemy into the treacherous marshes. But Archelaus and Dorilaeus responded with a bold cavalry charge that sent the edgy Romans into flight. Scylla rode back and forth in the mad dash, but his soldiers were terrified of Mithridates' fearsome nomad horsemen. Finally, Scylla leaped off his horse, grabbed up a standard, and pushed past his soldiers bellowing, Romans, I'll win an honorable death here without you. When they ask where you betrayed your commander, you'll have to tell them about Orchomenus. His words spurred his men to surge back. In the ferocious fight, both sides struggled bravely. Archelaus's son Diogenes, a cavalryman, was cut down. The barbarian archers were so hard-pressed by the Romans at close quarters that they couldn't draw their bows. Grabbing handfuls of arrows, they wielded them like swords to hold off the Roman soldiers. But Archelaus and Dorilaeus passed a dismal night collecting their dead. Incredibly, they had lost fifteen thousand men. Tasting blood, Sulla fell upon the decimated enemy camp the next morning, exhorting his men to finish the job once and for all. 
he had to make certain that Archelaus couldn't escape yet again and raise yet another army. Archelaus roused his men, and the terrible last battle began. His defenders leaped down from a wooden parapet and stood with their swords drawn against a cohort of Romans advancing behind their shields. For an excruciatingly long moment, no one moved. The standoff seemed to last forever. Suddenly, the spell was broken. A daring Roman soldier dashed out and chopped down the man in front of him. Then all hell broke loose. There was a great rush and shouting on each side, followed by many valiant deeds, wrote Appian. Mithridates' second grand army was driven into the marshes that Archelaus strove to avoid. Many barbarians fell into deep pools and drowned. Others perished as they pleaded for mercy in their strange tongues, mocked by their slayers. The corpses of Mithridates' warriors choked the stagnant ponds where the Boeotians used to gather reeds for their famous flutes. Their commander, Archelaus, was presumed dead. Two hundred years after the battle, Plutarch and his fellow Chironians often dragged up from the mud bows and arrows embossed helmets, bronze shields, fragments of fine armor, and decorated spears and swords, all of barbarian manufacture. Even today, metal remnants emerge from the soggy ground, the only memorial to Mithridates' Greek liberation warriors from distant lands. Sulla's tactical skills and amazing personal power over his troops were factors in the spectacular upsets in Boeotia. His battle-hardened legions, loyalty and courage, constituted another. Mithridates' infantry was just as valiant and determined, but they suffered from significant disadvantages. The ancient historian Memnon reported that the barbarians didn't understand how to manage supply lines. Sulla ambushed them when they carelessly foraged for food. Each barbarian group had its own dialect and distinctive style of fighting. Managing such diverse cultures, groups that had never fought together before, presented problems of coordination and discipline. Dorilaeus's units, trained in old-fashioned Greek hoplite combat, proved cumbersome and slow in the face of the efficient, fast, and flexible new Roman formations, part of Marius's military legacy. Sulla erected another monument to mark this victory at Orchomenus, one against daunting odds. He also minted coins depicting his three victory monuments, and on his meaty, freckled fingers the signet ring commemorating Sulla's triumph over Jugurtha was joined by another large agate ring carved with a design depicting his three trophies. In 2004, a Greek farmer plowing his cotton field at Orchomenus uncovered Sulla's victory monument of 86 B.C. The farmer scooped up the marble column and broken pieces with a bulldozer and deposited them anonymously at the local archaeological institute. Eventually the farmer was located, and Greek archaeologist Eleni Kunduri unearthed the rest of the trophy. This monument, from another of the most spectacular battles in Greek history, was more extravagant and much more complete than the one found at Chaeronea in 1990. Standing twenty-three feet high, It also took the form of a branching tree, draped with a defeated enemy's arms and armor. The marble fragments represent a pair of greaves, a breastplate, spears, and other weapons and equipment, including a chariot wheel to commemorate Mithridates' scythe chariots. The inscription celebrates Scylla's victory over King Mithridates and his allies, and thanks Aphrodite for the victory. After his victory, Scylla spitefully ordered his men to ravage Boeotia, cutting down olive groves and burning vineyards and crops. He did this to take further revenge on the Greek population for supporting Mithridates. But the war was far from over. Scylla still had no idea whether Lucullus had succeeded on his dangerous mission to get a fleet. He also needed to monitor Flaccus and Fimbria's two legions coming to take over his command. Scylla's plan was to set up winter quarters in northern Greece and spend the season building his own ships. As Sulla had retired, exhausted but exultant, from the battlefield at Orchomenus, his greatest victory, he was unaware of furtive movement at the edge of the swamp still red with blood of the defeated army. In the waning light of dusk, a shadowy form emerged from the muddy stand of reeds. It was Archelaus. The crafty general had survived the slaughter, hiding for two days in the marshes. Now he headed for the seashore, found a small boat, and rowed alone to Chalcis, 
his headquarters. Archelaus summoned all the detachments of Mithridates' army stationed around the Aegean and Anatolia. Chapter 10 Killer's Kiss How long could Mithridates' honeymoon of absolute power and freedom last? That question was answered by the gods of war in 86 to 85 BC. The heartbreaking loss of Mithridates' favorite son, Arcathius, was followed by inexplicable losses in Greece. How on earth could Scylla's five legions have destroyed so many multitudes? Mithridates' friends encouraged the king to suspect treachery. Dorylaeus had voiced his own suspicions after the defeats in Greece. Traitors were a genuine threat. Betrayals were involved in the Greek losses, and there were others who conspired with the Romans. Mithridates feared that his Anatolian allies would withdraw their support, perhaps abet his enemies, even plot assassination. Before disaffection could spread throughout his realm, he sent out agents to arrest turncoats. There was a new urgency for the royal toxicologists to perfect an antidote to all forms of poison. Mithridates still held the strategic island of Euboea, and he trusted his generals in the Aegean. But Archelaus's army contained many Galatian soldiers. Had some of them aided Sulla? Galatians had a reputation for treachery. If Sulla advanced to Anatolia, Mithridates felt certain that Galatia would aid him. Something had to be done. Galatia Mithridates invited sixty princes from Galatia's ruling families to reside in Pergamon as his guests. They were really hostages under surveillance. One chieftain, named Peredorix, a very large, robust man, plotted to kill Mithridates. The assassination was to take place during a tribunal in a small pavilion perched on a ravine. In a superman-like feat, Peredorix and his friends intended to tip the structure into the gorge, but informers overheard, and Mithridates cancelled his court appearance. Peredorix devised a new plan, the Galatian guests would attack Mithridates at the next banquet, but this plot also reached the king's ears. He seized Peredorix and his co-conspirators, and summoned the other chiefs along with their families to a feast. Enough arsenic was on the poison king's menu to murder all the guests. Somehow, however, three princes survived and managed to escape to Galatia, where they raised an army. They drove out Mithridates' satrap, Eumachus. Despite his careful planning, this outcome was just what Mithridates had feared. He no longer controlled Galatia. Now an example had to be set. In Pergamon, Peredorix and his friends were sentenced to death by the sword. Their bodies were to be denied burial, left to rot on the outskirts of the city. As the Galatians were marched away to the execution ground, Mithridates reflected on his affection for one of them, a handsome youth named Bipolitanus. They'd enjoyed such friendly conversations. Surely this innocent young man didn't deserve to die for the older men's conspiracy. Plutarch says Mithridates became extremely distressed, imagining the death of this youth. Did Bipolitanus remind Mithridates of his lost son, Arcathius? The king sent an emergency order to spare the youth's life. Peredorix and the others had already been thrown out for the crows, but, as Plutarch relates by a stroke of luck, Bipolitanus was wearing beautiful, costly clothing when he was seized. His executioner wanted this fine outfit for himself. To keep the garments from being bloodstained, the soldier was stripping them off in a leisurely way when he saw Mithridates' messengers running towards him and shouting the youth's name. So Bipolitanus lived, while his friends lay unburied. The next day, Mithridates' guards discovered a young woman weeping by the naked corpse of Peredorix. For the crime of trying to cover him with dirt, she was brought before the king. The girl's lovely appearance, her touching grief and innocence, stirred pity in Mithridates. Why had she dared to disobey his orders? When he discovered that she was Peredorix's lover, Mithridates relented. He allowed her to give the would-be assassin a proper burial. Mithridates knew the famous tragedy Antigone by Sophocles, in which a tyrant executes a young girl for this very same crime. By giving this widely known story a happy ending, Mithridates enhanced his reputation for mercy. According to Plutarch, 
These two realistic and detailed stories of Mithridates' empathy for innocent lives circulated by word of mouth more than a century after his death as counterpoints to other tales of his cruelty and hard heart. Leavening harsh behavior with chivalrous gestures made one's power seem godlike. It commanded the respect of enemies and friends, and might salve a bad conscience, too. Mithridates was familiar with the stories of the great Alexander's gallantry toward courageous men and women, and mercy was an important virtue of the ancient Persian kings. Mithridates still trusted his Galatian general, Conochorix, and he loved a Galatian princess named Adabagiana, the sister of a prince distrusted by Mithridates. Part of a portrait bust of Adabagiana has been discovered by archaeologists in the ruins of Pergamon. Perhaps she captured Mithridates' heart during his purge of the Galatian royal families. We might guess that the king saved her from succumbing to the poison he served at the deadly banquet. Chaos Mithridates' paranoid thoughts kept returning to Chios, that prosperous island whose sailors had rammed his royal warship during the battle for Rhodes. Chios had allied with Rome in the past. Was it another nest of traitors? Some Chian aristocrats had joined Sulla after the massacre of 88 BC. When Mithridates sent spies to Chios, their reports doomed the island. Master of malicious punishments on a theatrical scale, Mithridates wrote detailed instructions to his generals Dorileus and Zenobius. Mithridates' revenge began with a surprise attack on Chios. Zenobius's army took over the city and delivered a proclamation. The citizens of Chios were to come to the assembly to hear a message from Mithridates. In happier times he had won chariot races in Chios. One of the island's prized possessions was a letter from Alexander the Great, written after he captured Chios in 333 B.C., now displayed in the island's museum. Alexander had exiled all Chians who aided his enemies. Now Mithridates the Great wrote his own letter to Chios. He accused them of aiding his enemies, noting that his suspicions were first aroused when the Chian trireme tried to sink his boat. Why, he demanded, have you refused to confiscate the Romans' property as agreed? Why have you allowed Romans to flee to Sulla? For cooperating with Sulla and conspiring against me, all my friends say I should condemn you to death. But I am merciful, wrote Mithridates. I will be satisfied if you turn in your weapons and send the children from the leading families of Chios to me as hostages. The Chians gave over their arms, and the young men and women of aristocratic families to Zenobius and Dorileus, who sent them to Pergamon. But Mithridates wasn't finished with Chios. Zenobius read out another royal letter. I know that you still favor the Romans, but instead of the death you deserve, I sentence you to pay a penalty of two thousand talents. One talent was equal to six thousand drachmas. Two thousand talents was a very large amount of silver. The total yearly income of Athens at the height of its empire was one thousand talents. In Mithridates' day, two thousand talents was equal to twelve million drachmas. A mercenary soldier's pay averaged about one drachma per day of active service, so two thousand talents would provide a year's pay for an army of about thirty-five thousand soldiers. Crying out lamentations, the Chians gathered ornaments from their temples and women's jewelry to pay the fine. Following Mithridates' secret orders, Zenobius summoned everyone, men, women, children, and slaves, but no foreigners, to the theater to weigh out the goods. Fear shot through the crowd, as Zenobius thundered, You have shortchanged the king. His soldiers had surrounded the theater and lined the street to the harbor. Inside the theater, Zenobius singled out the slaves owned by the Chians and declared them free. This act by Mithridates carried a powerful propaganda message. Chios was notorious in antiquity for introducing the slave trade to the Greek world, a commerce that later became so profitable on Delos under the Romans. Chios was a wealthy society, with an inordinate number of slaves. As early as the 5th century B.C., the island possessed more domestic slaves than any other Greek state except Sparta. Next, the soldiers roughly separated the men from the women and children. They marched the two groups down the gauntlet of soldiers to the sea. The entire population of Chios was loaded onto Mithridates' ships. While their former household slaves watched from shore, The ships, full of wretched, wailing Chians, sailed away. They were destined for the Black Sea, 
where they were to spend the rest of their lives as slaves in Mithridates' mines in remote Colchis. Again, in devising this theatrical punishment for Caius, it appears that Mithridates may have been replaying yet another famous Greek tragedy, Euripides' Trojan Women. For their payment of two thousand talents, the Caians had purchased slavery. The calamity inspired an ironic proverb in antiquity. The Caian has finally bought himself a master. The Roman writer Athenaeus blamed the slave-trading Caians for their fate, and the ancient villainy of Caius was often recalled in the nineteenth century by anti-slavery groups. For example, the abolitionist poet John Greenleaf Whittier penned his famous poem Mithridates in Caius in 1864 during the American Civil War. Whittier praised Mithridates for his just punishment of that slave-cursed land. Chained and scourged the slaves of slaves, the lords of Caius into exile went. The fisher in his net is caught, the Caian hath his master bought. From Caius, Mithridates plucked another prize for his harem, a captivating young woman named Berenice. She must have been very young since her mother accompanied her to the royal harem. Berenice was probably selected from among the aristocratic children sent to Pergamon. Like the Galatian princess, Adabagiana, Berenice was saved from a people's fate by the all-powerful, compassionate, and lustful king. Another honeymoon was now over. Mithridates had grown dissatisfied with Queen Monomy. Plutarch says that their marriage became unhappy. She complained that her beauty had won a master instead of a husband. Maybe the king superstitiously believed that his strong-willed Greek wife had brought him bad luck in the Greek campaign. At any rate, at some point after the terrible omen of the crashing statue of victory and the defeats in Greece that this event seemed to foretell, Monomy was sent away. She traveled in opulent fashion, probably in a Persian-style harmamaxa, a private four-wheeled golden chariot with purple awnings attended by royal eunuchs, to live the rest of her days in luxury in Pontus. Mithridates found comfort with his recently acquired lovers. He savored the sound of Berenice's name on his tongue. She was his new lucky charm. A Macedonian name, Berenice, means bringer of victory. Rebellion and Repression His tasks completed in Chios, Zenobius approached Ephesus with his army. Unnerved by Mithridates' setbacks in Greece and the fate of Chios, the Ephesians insisted that Zenobius enter the city alone and unarmed. He agreed and visited Philopemon, Monomy's father, Mithridates' overseer in Ephesus, perhaps to reassure him that Monomy was well cared for in Pontus. Ephesus had been an early supporter of Mithridates, complying with his orders to murder Romans just two years ago. We don't know what Mithridates had in mind for Ephesus, but the citizens of the wealthy commercial city were nervous enough to disobey Zenobius' ominous summons to the theater the next day. That night, the Ephesians murdered Zenobius. Nothing personal, just business. The city depended on stable trade and gambled that Rome would prevail. After the murder, Ephesus went on red alert, hoarding food supplies and preparing to defend the city. Other towns now had two violent models to follow. Chios or Ephesus, Tralles, Hypipa, Mesopolis, Smyrna, Colophon, Sardis, and other towns previously allied with Mithridates followed the example of Ephesus and revolted. Mithridates reacted with rage, dispatching armies to inflict terrible vengeance on these rebels. Was this when Mithridates poisoned his rival in chariot racing, Alcius of Sardis? To preempt further defections, Mithridates sent proclamations to many Anatolian cities, freeing slaves, cancelling debts, and bestowing citizenship rights on resident foreigners. These privileges irritated the local aristocracy, but won strong popular support among former slaves, debtors, and new citizens in each town. Some of the king's closest associates, alarmed by the events in Greece and western Anatolia, began to hold secret meetings. Prominent Greeks began to reconsider their devotion to Mithridates. Two men of Smyrna invited two men of Lesbos to join a cabal against Mithridates. But one of them, a personal friend of the king, informed on the others. He arranged for Mithridates himself to hide under his couch to hear the plot from their own mouths. The three men were tortured to death. 
Mithridates' paranoia emerged in full force now. His fears were justified. Betrayals and revolts were not imaginary, but his draconian reactions cut his support among the upper classes, and many people took advantage of the climate of fear to turn in their personal enemies. Mithridates rewarded informers lavishly. Plots continued, very close to home. One night in Pergamon, eighty citizens were discovered planning to murder the king. Mithridates executed them. According to Appian sources, about sixteen hundred men suspected of treason lost their lives in this purge. We don't have the details of how they died, but many of these men must have been involuntary guinea pigs for Mithridates' poison experiments. The king was known to test toxins and antidotes on prisoners condemned to death. In 85 BC, Mithridates' spies reported more bad news. Scylla's aide, Lucullus, had done the impossible. Despite pirates and winter storms, he had assembled a navy. Ptolemy of Egypt welcomed Lucullus, inviting him to visit the pyramids in luxurious style, but Lucullus declined, worried about his commander-in-chief Scylla enduring hardships at the siege of Athens. Lucullus accepted an emerald and gold ring engraved with Ptolemy's likeness and enough cash to hire ships and sailors from Syria, Cyprus, Phoenicia, Pamphylia, and Rhodes. He sailed on the Rhodian flagship commanded by Mithridates' old enemy, Admiral Demagoras, who had chased the Pontic navy away from Rhodes in 88 BC. Moving north, they took possession of Kos, Samos, and Chios, but Mithridates' admiral, Neoptolemus, Archelaus his brother, was lying in wait near the small island of Tenedos. In the naval battle that followed, Demagoras put Neoptolemus to flight. Is this the moment when Mithridates finally began to realize that he wouldn't be victorious in the war against Rome, as suggested by the historian Renac? Scylla had the upper hand, yet there were some positive signs for the king. His defeats in mainland Greece hadn't been due to disloyalty or disillusionment on the Greeks' part. His armies fought courageously, but were overwhelmed by professional, technologically advanced Roman legions. Even so, Sulla had struggled for nearly two years to take Greece, and Archelaus held Euboea, a key position. Flaccus, Sulla's rival, lost most of his ships in a tempest in the Adriatic. Through intelligence sources, Mithridates learned that Flaccus was detested by his soldiers, many deserted to join Sulla. Meanwhile, in Rome, Marius was dead, but Sulla's supporters were murdered on a daily basis, exerting a strong pull on Sulla to return as soon as possible. Flaccus had bypassed Sulla, marching across Thrace. It appeared that he intended to invade Mithridates' territory by himself. Sulla was tracking this rival Roman army with his own legions, and Lucullus was bringing up a vast navy. Mithridates still commanded two hundred ships and an army of eighty thousand men in Anatolia under the command of Doraleus. It was time to make contingency plans. Perhaps diplomacy, a truce, could buy time. Reflecting on the enormity of his losses in Greece, and calculating that Sulla must be itching to get home, Mithridates sent word to Archelaus to make peace on the best terms possible. The Peace of Dardanus Sulla and Archelaus met at the Roman camp near Delion, Boeotia. Both men were practical soldiers of fortune, looking to make the best bargain. Their first volleys over the peace table were tests of the other's commitments. As Archelaus well knew, Sulla was in a great hurry to conclude the war, so he could take his army back to Italy, kill his foes there, celebrate a triumph, and become the absolute dictator of Rome. Archelaus proposed that Sulla should be satisfied with recovering Greece and leave Asia to Mithridates. If you promise to return to Italy now, my king Mithridates promises to give you a very generous war chest, many ships and as many soldiers as you need. With these, you can destroy Marius's populars and take over Rome. Sulla's counteroffer was equally audacious. Why don't you desert Mithridates and bring me all his mercenary armies? Together, we can crush Mithridates and I'll crown you king of Pontus. Each general professed to be insulted by the other's treasonous proposal. With their cards on the table, they began the negotiations. 
Sulla summarized Mithridates' crimes, deploring his takeover of vast territories, his confiscations of public and sacred funds of cities allied with Rome, his seizures of Roman property, land, and slaves, his murder of Roman allies, and the great massacre of Italian men, women, and children, and even slaves of Italian blood in 88 B.C. Such hatred did Mithridates bear towards Italy, and now he professes to want our friendship and mercy— but only after I destroyed one hundred and sixty thousand of his troops in Greece? Archelaus responded coolly. It was the greed of other Roman generals that caused this war. My king will agree to fair terms. These were the conditions the generals hammered out. Return to the territorial status quo of 89 B.C. Greece belongs to Rome— Mithridates keeps his possessions as of 89 B.C., but withdraws from Paphlagonia, Bithynia, and Cappadocia, allowing Nicomedes and Ariobarzanes to recover their thrones. Sulla promises that Mithridates will be declared a friend and ally of Rome upon Mithridates' payment of a fine equal to the cost of the war. Mithridates must give Sulla seventy fully equipped bronze-armored warships. Mithridates must release all Roman prisoners of war, including captive ambassadors and officers. All Roman deserters and runaway Roman slaves who had joined Mithridates' armies must be surrendered to Sulla. A general amnesty would be declared, no reprisals against partisans. Archelaus had been fighting as a mercenary general for Mithridates for several hard years. The war to liberate Greece was lost with sobering casualties. As Sulla enjoyed pointing out, Boeotia was left impassable for the multitude of dead bodies, the remains of Mithridates' grand army. Archelaus negotiated an armistice remarkably favorable to Mithridates by playing to Sulla's impatience. One of the terms of their agreement was personal. Sulla gave Archelaus an estate of ten thousand acres in Euboea. Archelaus withdrew his troops from Euboea and agreed to accompany Sulla to Dardanus to finalize the treaty with Mithridates. On the way, Archelaus fell ill. Sulla tended Archelaus as if he were one of his own officers. Sulla's favors and concern for Archelaus made some in Mithridates' court suspicious that there had been collusion, that Archelaus had somehow thrown the battles at Chaeronea and Orchomenus, a dubious notion. Sulla defended his treatment of Archelaus in his memoirs, now lost. It seems likely that Sulla respected the commander as a noble adversary, and realized that he needed his cooperation in convincing Mithridates to accept the treaty quickly. Mithridates sent envoys to Sulla and Archelaus to contest two of the conditions. Mithridates wanted to keep Paphlagonia, which he had always maintained was his by inheritance, and he refused to turn over seventy ships. The ambassadors slyly hinted that Mithridates might obtain a better deal if he were to negotiate with your other general, Fimbria. Scylla flew into a rage. What? Mithridates has been sitting in Pergamon all this time, directing a disastrous war from afar? He should humbly thank me for not chopping off his right hand, with which he signed the death warrant for thousands of innocent Romans. He'll sing a different tune when I march into Asia. Archelaus intervened. According to Sulla's memoirs, the general tearfully begged for a chance to personally persuade Mithridates to accept the treaty. If I fail, Archelaus vowed, I'll kill myself. That emotional scene may have been concocted by Sulla, but he did send Archelaus to confer with Mithridates. Fimbria and Lucullus intervene. Mithridates held a stronger hand than it might seem but it had to be played carefully. Civil war was raging in Italy. Sulla was desperate to return, but suddenly he found himself caught in new emergencies, and Mithridates himself was in the same boat. An incredible situation was developing. Before their peace treaty could be ratified, a strange parallel war loomed on the horizon. Sulla's rival Flaccus had now reached Bithynia with his army, but taking advantage of his superior's ineptitude, Flaccus's young officer, Fimbria, led a mutiny against the older man. Flaccus, rabbit ears, fled to Bithynia's capital, Nicomedia, but Fimbria and his men hunted him down and discovered Flaccus cowering in a well. Fimbria chopped off Flaccus's head and flung it into the sea, 
leaving the body on the beach for the Gauls. The Roman Senate angrily withdrew support for Fimbria, who was now an outlaw but in control of two legions. Mithridates now faced two rogue Roman armies in his territory, commanded by outlawed generals who were bitter enemies, each lusting to win credit for Mithridates' downfall. Sulla feared that the ruthless, hot-headed Fimbria, a Marius loyalist, would steal his hard-won victory over Mithridates. These unforeseen developments meant that Fimbria was now the common enemy of both Mithridates and Sulla. Cut off from Rome, Fimbria desperately needed to reward his troops with rich booty. He fixed his sights on Pergamon. He would sack Mithridates' palace and take all the credit for concluding the war on Mithridates. Along the way, Fimbria devastated the land like a hurricane, destroying towns that refused to open their gates to his army. At Ilium, ancient Troy, the citizens reminded Fimbria that according to the Roman foundation myth, Troy was Rome's sacred mother city. Fimbria sardonically thanked the citizens and demanded entry. Once inside, he slaughtered the men, women, and children. Many fled into the temple of Athena. Fimbria ordered the temple burned down along with the entire town and unleashed his men to pillage. Witnesses described the awesome sight of the marble statue of Athena left standing in the ashes of her temple. Plutarch remarked that Troy hadn't experienced such utter destruction since Agamemnon had sacked Priam's city in the legendary Trojan War. Indeed, Fimbria crowed that it took him only ten days to raise Troy, while it took Agamemnon ten years. While Sulla sped to intercept the rival outlaw general, Mithridates sent out a contingent led by his oldest son, Mithridates the Younger. But Fimbria set a trap and killed six thousand of Mithridates' cavalry. Fimbria continued toward Pergamon. Pergamon's walls were strong, but after the recently discovered plots, Mithridates could no longer trust the citizens. Fearing they might sell him out to Fimbria before he could make peace with Sulla on advantageous terms, Mithridates was compelled to flee for his life. From Pergamon he rushed to Pitani on the coast. Fimbria pursued and laid siege to Pitani. As if on cue, Lucullus suddenly arrived on the scene with his armada. Fimbria ordered Lucullus to block Pitani's harbor, trapping Mithridates, Rome's dire enemy, inside the city. Together, you and I will win all the glory in this war, promised Fimbria and Sulla's exploits in Greece will be forgotten. What would happen now? Lucullus was loyal to Sulla. He loathed Fimbria, an ally of the hated Marius. Lucullus announced that his navy belonged to Sulla. He refused to block Mithridates' escape route so that the king could approve the treaty worked out between Sulla and Archelaus. It was an extremely close call. Had Lucullus thrown in with Fimbria, Mithridates would have been finished. Instead, Lucullus allowed Mithridates to take a boat from Pitani to Lesbos. There, Mithridates joined Neoptolemus' navy and arrived in Dardanus. Here, on a plain, not far from Troy, in view of both their armies in late 85 BC, Sulla and Mithridates met face to face. Both were wary, but extremely eager to declare peace. Sealed with a kiss. Each man was a master showman, skilled in the art of self-presentation. Each man scored propaganda points with oratory and body language, witnessed by thousands on the plain at Dardanus, and recorded for history by Appian and Plutarch. Mithridates, defeated but still not beaten, wanted to make a strong impression. He was accompanied by Neoptolemus's two hundred ships, Dorylaus's twenty thousand infantry, and six thousand cavalry, and a throng of scythe-bearing chariots. The victor's party was more modest. Sulla brought one thousand men and two hundred cavalry. Mithridates, in his old-fashioned Persian finery, walked forward, hand outstretched. Sulla, standing at attention in Roman army attire, stiffly asked whether Mithridates accepted the terms agreed to by his general Archelaus. Mithridates didn't reply immediately. Surely, spat out Sulla, it is the victor who has the right of silence, while a suppliant should ask forgiveness. 
Mithridates broke his dramatic silence, pointing out that he and his father had been good friends of Rome. But Roman ambassadors, governors, and generals started this war out of pure greed, the vice of most Romans. They wronged me by taking away Phrygia and Cappadocia, and they urged Nicomedes to attack my kingdom. Everything I've done since then was in self-defense and out of necessity. I know you are a clever orator, Sulla cut in, always justifying your wrongdoing. You should have sent an embassy to Rome long ago if you thought you were the victim of injustice. You had no right to Cappadocia and Phrygia. Nicomedes attacked you because you sent the assassin named Alexander to kill him, and you armed his rival, Socrates the Good. You have been planning this war a long time, thinking you could rule the whole world. Why else have you allied with Thracians, Sarmatians, and Scythians? That's why you built up such a huge army and navy, and that's why you timed your takeover of our Asian province while we were subduing revolts in Italy. You freed our slaves and cancelled debts. You killed sixteen hundred men on false accusations. You poisoned the princes of Galatia. You butchered or drowned all the residents of Italian blood in Provincia Asia, including mothers and babies, not even sparing victims who fled into temples. What cruelty, what impiety, what boundless hatred you showed toward us. Playing to the audience of officers, soldiers, and officials, Sulla continued to castigate Mithridates for war crimes, even declaring himself the liberator of Greece from the slavery of Mithridates. You invaded Greece and deprived the Greeks of their freedom. Mithridates' final card was unspoken. Deal with me or I deal with Fimbria. Knowing he had the upper hand, he calmly broke in on Sulla's vehement discourse. I consent to the terms agreed by my general Archelaus. Before the crowd, Sulla and Mithridates embraced and sealed the peace of Dardanus with a kiss. What were the sentiments of each man during this intimate, traditional ritual? It's interesting to consider the cultural differences. Romans sealed treaties with the Osculum Pacis, a mutual kiss on the cheek. Persians kissed equals on the mouth but superiors accepted a kiss from inferiors on the cheek. Did Mithridates fake his kiss and accept Sulla's lips on his cheek as that of an inferior? What passed through Sulla's mind as he kissed the man who had snuffed out the lives of tens of thousands of Romans? Mithridates promised to withdraw from Bithynia, Cappadocia, and Paphlagonia. He hated to give up the title King of Kings. It was galling to go through the motions of a formal reconciliation with the loathsome puppet kings. Mithridates had agreed to hand over Roman deserters and former Roman slaves in his armies, but he had no intention of following through. He did release Oppius, the captive Roman general who had served as the king's personal servant since his defeat in 89 BC. Oppius went to the Temple of Healing on Kos to recover from his ordeal. Mithridates paid the fine demanded by Sulla. 2,000 talents. As we've heard, Mithridates had recently imposed a fine of 2,000 talents on Chios as a penalty for their revolt. Considering the king's present circumstances and wealth, the fine requested by Sulla was a piddling sum. Mithridates could simply transfer the Chian payoff to Sulla. He turned over 70 ships to Sulla, along with 500 archers, but he still commanded more than 100 ships and an army of 80,000. Mithridates the Great sailed away to Pontus, his original stronghold, leaving Sulla to deal with the loose cannon Fimbria. The war between Mithridates and Rome was over. All parties had given their word to abide by the truce, with one exception. The Roman Senate, controlled by Marius's populars, never recognized Sulla's peace of Dardanus, Yet who, besides the irrepressible king of Pontus, could imagine, in 85 B.C., that this was only the first round in a conflict that would last a lifetime? Sulla Mops Up Sulla's soldiers weren't impressed with the peace of Dardanus. In fact, they were enraged. They had witnessed Sulla's eloquent speech, reminding everyone of the crimes of Rome's most hostile enemy. Mithridates had killed 150,000 innocent Romans in a single day. Now they saw Sulla kiss this vicious murderer and allow him to simply sail off, loaded with fabulous wealth, to his kingdom by the sea. Where was justice? 
Sulla's mild conditions were due to his haste to return to Rome after regaining Greece and punishing Anatolia, and his belief that Aquilius, an ally of Marius, bore responsibility for starting the war. But Sulla perceived his soldiers' anger and deflected it, explaining that Fimbria was the clear and present danger now. What if Mithridates had joined Fimbria? How could they carry on a war against those combined forces? After we defeat Fimbria, Sulla promised, there'll be riches galore, and victory will be ours in Italy. Sulla marched to Fimbria's camp and demanded that he surrender the two legions which he held illegally. Fimbria refused, pointing out that Sulla had been voted Rome's public enemy. War between Roman legions on foreign soil seemed inevitable. While Sulla's soldiers fortified their camp and dug trenches around Fimbria's camp, a wondrous thing occurred. Fimbria's men came out and pitched in to help their fellow Romans. In despair, Fimbria fled to Pergamon and entered the great temple of Asclepius, where so many Romans had lost their lives in 88 BC. There, Fimbria fell on his sword and died. In the words of the contemporary Greek historian Diodorus, Fimbria should have died a thousand deaths for the terror he had spread. Issuing proclamations praising Lycia, Rhodes, Stratonicea, Magnesia, Patera, and other places that had cooperated with Rome, Sulla dispatched troops to punish all the towns that had allied with Mithridates. Blatantly ignoring the treaty's amnesty terms banning reprisals against partisans, he proceeded to take savage revenge on Anatolia for supporting Mithridates. Sulla imposed a penalty on the entire province of Asia in the extraordinary amount of twenty thousand talents, ten times what he had demanded of Mithridates. He assigned his mild-mannered and efficient officer Lucullus to collect this money. Sulla billeted his unruly troops in private homes and forced the Anatolians to pay outrageous sums for the privilege of feeding and clothing their insolent guests. All freed slaves were ordered back into slavery. In Ephesus and other cities, Sulla compelled citizen assemblies to borrow money at exorbitant interest rates, mortgaging their theaters, gymnasiums, harbors, city walls, statues, and every other scrap of public property. Sulla also plundered artworks and treasures on a massive scale. All this money and property went into Sulla's personal war chest. Many towns resisted. In retaliation, Massacres were carried out by Sulla's soldiers, despite his many speeches claiming that Romans would never dream of indiscriminate slaughter or other acts of barbarism. In this chaotic period of Mithridates' withdrawal and Sulla's vindictive rampage, swarms of pirate ships plagued the Aegean coast, attacking harbors and castles in coastal cities and islands from Miletus to Samothrace. Sulla callously allowed the brigands access to sack and burn towns such as Iasus that had supported Mithridates. The economic devastation was deep and long lasting. Many of these cities wouldn't recover the prosperity they had enjoyed under Mithridates until the reign of Constantine four hundred years later. In 84 BC, Sulla declared his mission accomplished. He left his eager young officer Murina to occupy Phrygia with the two legions that had served Fimbria. On his way back to Italy, Sulla stopped briefly in Greece. He visited a hot spring to treat a mysterious illness, and arranged for the shipment of thousands of objets d'art, famous paintings, precious manuscripts, fine sculptures, and other antiquities, including colossal columns from the unfinished temple of Olympian Zeus in Athens. Several ships laden with Sulla's loot sank in a storm on the way to Italy. Archaeologists have identified the contents of at least one shipwreck as part of his plunder. From the bottom of the sea, modern divers hauled up a great number of marble columns, bronze statues of Eros and Dionysus, and marble sculptures of Aphrodite, Pan, Satyrs, and other figures. Sulla returned to Italy with 40,000 men, many of them recruits from Macedonia and Thrace. Historian Barry Strauss speculates that one of these auxiliaries may have been Spartacus, a Thracian, who in ten years' time would become the gladiator who led the great slave revolt in Italy. The horrors visited upon Asia and Greece were now repeated in Italy. In 83 BC, Sulla's ruthless confiscations of land, proscriptions, and murders culminated in a partisan bloodbath of such horrendous proportions 
that in the view of the Roman historian Cassius Dio, Sulla's cruel tortures and killings of his fellow Romans surpassed even Mithridates' massacre of 88 B.C. Husbands were butchered with their wives, mothers and babies were slain, wrote Plutarch. Homes and even temples were soaked in blood. What a sea of Roman blood was shed, wrote St. Augustine, the scale of death beyond computation. Sulla's men annihilated 18,000 of Marius's men at Fidentia. At Capua, 7,000 enemies were slaughtered. At Signia, 20,000. One day Sulla ordered a massacre of 6,000 innocent people locked inside the Circus of Rome. On yet another day, Sulla executed 12,000 men accused of favoring Marius. Sulla became dictator in 81 B.C. At his triumph, Pliny the Elder says Sulla paraded 115,000 pounds of silver and 15,000 pounds of gold, the combined loot from all his victories. The Second Mithridatic War, 83-81 to B.C. What was Mithridates' state of mind as he retired to his drastically reduced corner of the world after a grueling round one with Rome? Among the conflicting emotions of chagrin, resentment, relief, despair, hope, determination, suspicion, and calculation, one conviction stood out. He was King Mithridates the Sixth, Eupator, Dionysus, Vazraka, the Great, proud descendant of Persian and Macedonian monarchs, emperor of the Black Sea Empire, the divinely chosen champion of liberty, light and truth, the enemy of darkness and deceit, the one true alternative to Roman imperialism in the East. He was aware that the Roman Senate had failed to ratify the peace of Dardanus which he and Sulla had sealed with a kiss. In fact, there had been no written signed document setting out the terms of the truce. Just exactly how binding was a verbal agreement with a renegade Roman bent on ravaging Italy? The same idea occurred to Murina, the commander in charge of the twelve thousand Fimbrians that Sulla left in Anatolia. Murina, the eel, who had rallied Sulla's men at the battle for Piraeus, was among those disgusted by the lenient terms of the treaty. He decided to take matters into his own hands. Murina's ill-considered self-serving decision to resume the war played right into the hands of Mithridates. But first Mithridates had to do some house-cleaning. He decided not to restore all of Cappadocia to Ariobarzanes. The populace favored Mithridates, and he had always considered Cappadocia part of his kingdom. Disturbances brewing in Colchis and among some of the tribes around the Cimmerian Bosporus demanded immediate attention. To convince the tribes of the northern Black Sea of his power, Mithridates enlarged his navy and recruited another huge army. Learning from his defeats in Greece, Mithridates gave up the old-fashioned lockstep hoplite formation and drilled his foot soldiers in smaller, more flexible units dispersed in thin lines, better able to fight Roman legions. He increased the number of lightly armed skirmishers and archers. He made a personal decision to fight in the front ranks when necessary. A large cavalry made up of courageous, highly skilled Persian and Armenian knights was the centerpiece of his new army. These forces were dispatched to quell the restive north, where his son Macares was viceroy of the Bosporan kingdom. The Colchians requested that the king's eldest son, Mithridates the Younger, be their ruler. As soon as Mithridates agreed, they renewed their allegiance. Without any evidence, Mithridates instinctively suspected that his son harbored ambitions to supersede his father. Mithridates sent for his son and heir, who had served faithfully in the war against Fimbria. But after all, this son was the offspring of Queen Laodice the Younger, the king's sister, his first wife, who had to be executed for plotting against him. Had Laodice's oldest son inherited the treachery, inbred in his maternal lineage? Perhaps he held a grudge for the murder of his mother. In sorrow, Mithridates bound his son in golden fetters and put him to death. We can imagine that for this regrettable necessity he administered the most gentle and rapid poison in his apothecary, perhaps hemlock mixed with opium, the deadly cocktail drunk by the philosopher Socrates, or the microscopic toxin from India, dechiron. A trusted Persian, 
Moafernes, from Amasiah, great uncle of the historian Strabo, became Mithridates' viceroy in Colchis. Paranoid thoughts continued to assail the king. The question of Archelaus's loyalty preyed on his mind. The more Mithridates mulled it over, the more convinced he became that his star general had yielded far too much to Sulla in the peace negotiations. Word of the king's suspicions reached Archelaus. Was Archelaus really planning to jump ship? That's unknown, but the veteran soldier of fortune understood that it was time to look out for himself. Archelaus defected to the Romans. His brother, Neoptolemus, remained loyal as commander of Mithridates' navy in the Aegean. It seems likely that Archelaus was the source of much of the information available to Roman historians about Mithridates' personality, strategies, troop numbers, and other facts. Archelaus requested a meeting with Murina. He convinced the Roman commander that Mithridates was creating the large fleet in the Black Sea and training another grand army with the secret intention of renewing hostilities against Rome. Murina, eager for plunder and a triumph of his own, and seeking trifling pretexts for war, was persuaded to launch a preemptive strike before Mithridates could make the first move. In the summer of 83 B.C., Without any declaration of war, Murina marched deep into western Cappadocia and made a lightning strike on Mithridates' garrison at Cappadocian Commoner. In this large, sacred city, said to have been founded by Agamemnon's descendants after the Trojan War, was a fabulously rich temple of love, similar to the sanctuary at Commoner in Pontus. In the temple was an archaic statue of Artemis. It was said that Agamemnon had sacrificed his daughter, Iphigenia to Artemis. Iphigenia's sword was one of the precious relics displayed in Commoner. Many of Mithridates' cavalry were killed in Murina's attack. Taken by surprise, and angry over Archelaus's treason, Mithridates nevertheless scrupulously refrained from escalating the war. He sent ambassadors to Murina, protesting that he had broken the treaty. Murina's sarcastic reply, Treaty? What treaty? I've never seen a treaty document. Murina proceeded to rob all the money and ornaments in the Temple of Love and set up winter quarters in Cappadocia. Still Mithridates held back, following a strategy of restraint and statesmanship. He sent an embassy to Rome to appeal to the Senate and Sulla, registering a formal complaint that Murina had broken the terms of the Peace of Dardanus. He would await their reply before reacting to Murina's unauthorized aggression. Meanwhile, his old Cappadocian friend Gordius replaced the traitor Archelaus as general. In the spring of 82 BC, Murina crossed the Halus, flooded with melted snow, into Mithridates' home territory. That summer and fall, Murina's legions raided 400 villages in Pontus, amassing wagon loads of plunder. He departed with his haul across Roman controlled Galatia. Still, Mithridates did nothing but sent spies to track Murina. Sulla and the Senate dispatched a commissioner to investigate Mithridates' complaint about Murina in 81 B.C. The official met Murina and announced that the Senate ordered him to cease attacking Mithridates, who had made peace with Rome. But, as Mithridates' spies reported, the commissioner also admitted that the Senate had not issued a written decree to that effect. Then the spies observed the official whispering privately with Murina. Murina invaded Mithridates' home territory again. Mithridates was now perfectly justified in assuming that the commissioner had conveyed a secret message from Rome to Murina authorizing him to attack Mithridates in an all-out war. This was even more bald-faced than the unauthorized war begun by Aquilius and Nicomedes back in 89 B.C. Mithridates gave Gordius the order to retaliate. Gordius quickly collected a local citizen army eager to fight for Mithridates. They took up a position across the Hales River from Urena's two legions. Mithridates himself arrived, riding a fine horse at the head of his very large new army. With little personal combat experience, Mithridates vigorously threw himself into battle against Murina, a determined young veteran of Roman victories under Sulla. Well aware that his royal Persian ancestors never took part in actual combat, Mithridates, at age fifty-one, was now emulating young Alexander in his decision to rush into the thick of battle. The opposing armies exploded into fierce fighting at the riverbank. Mithridates prevailed, 
pushing across the river and sending Murida and his men running up a hillside. Commanding his smaller, flexible units, Mithridates decisively routed the Romans. In the hail of arrows from Mithridates' Armenian archers, the jackal Murida and his men fled west over the mountains by a pathless route. Mithridates and Gordius drove the rest of Murina's garrisons out of Cappadocia. The entire country welcomed Mithridates as liberator. The brilliant victory over Murina was a much-needed jolt of good news. Ebbing popular devotion surged back, and Mithridates' Eupator was again hailed as the people's savior king against rampaging Romans. He was still the good father who drove off the ravening wolves. At some point in this period, a young patrician in the Marius faction named Julius Caesar enlisted in the Roman army. Sailing to Anatolia, he was captured by Cilician pirates and held for ransom. Caesar escaped by a clever ruse involving poison wine. He earned his first battle honors at Lesbos, where Romans killed five hundred soldiers allied with Mithridates and enslaved six thousand people. Caesar was sent to Bithynia to request ships from Nicomedes IV. It seems that Caesar's sojourn in the Bithynian court took much longer than necessary. For the rest of his life, Caesar's enemies taunted him with the nickname Queen of Bithynia, claiming that he had become Nicomedes' lover. In Rome, meanwhile, Sulla had been urgently scrambling to try to stop Murina before his foolish war obliterated Sulla's victory over Mithridates. Sulla sent a stern tribune, Gabinius, to threaten Murina with severe punishment. As Sulla's peacemaker, Gabinius also arranged a conference between Mithridates and Ariobarzanes, whose throne in Cappadocia was wobbling again. Mithridates, arguing from a position of righteous indignation and military strength, had his conditions ready. He betrothed his little daughter, Athenaeus, age four, to Ariobarzanes to seal their new friendship under Mithridates' terms. As part of the alliance, Mithridates stipulated that he not only retain western Cappadocia, but receive another large chunk of central Cappadocia. Desperate to ensure stability in the region where Mithridates suddenly held all the cards, Gabinius and Ariobarzanes had to agree. Then everybody attended a lively Persian-Macedonian-style banquet, hosted by an expansive and jubilant Mithridates. As in the old days before the wars, Mithridates was the master of ceremonies, surrounded by happy friends and beautiful consorts. He bestowed lavish rewards on the best singers and cithara players, the most amusing jesters, and the most amazing jugglers. He doled out prizes of gold to those who excelled in boisterous drinking and eating contests. According to Appian, everyone at the party, Ariobarzanes, Gordius, Doraleus, even Monime, joined in the jolly excess. Everyone except for the glum Roman at the foot of the table, Gabinius. Fire on the Mountain Mithridates also celebrated his victory over Murina with a solemn ritual, a mountaintop fire ceremony to thank Zeus and Mithra. Appian described this ceremony, which he says Mithridates performed according to the ancient traditions of his ancestors, Cyrus and Darius. He had learned the ceremony at his father's side as a boy in Sinope. Mithridates and his entourage ascended Buyuk Evliada to the sanctuary of Zeus the warrior. Archaeologists have discovered many inscriptions in this important site of native Anatolian and Iranian-influenced worship. At this and many other similar shrines in Cappadocia, Zoroastrian priests called fire keepers tended an eternal flame, the source was petroleum, on the altar. Mithridates' magi, wearing high felt turbans, murmuring incantations, and waving their barsoms, or myrtle wands, sacrificed white animals to fire, earth, wind, and water. Then, following old Persian custom, the chief magus, Mithridates himself, dragged logs to the hilltop, creating an immense woodpile. Around the altar, he arranged trestles made of logs and branches, and laid out a feast of meat and bread for the celebrants. Mithridates donned a purple headdress studded with silver stars and the pure white cape of the magus over his purple robe of kingship. He climbed to the top of the woodpile to pour the sacred libations, milk, honey, wine, and oil. Throwing handfuls of sweet-smelling frankincense and myrrh over the offerings, 
Mithridates recited a heartfelt prayer to the gods. His prayer wasn't recorded, but it was probably something like the prayer offered by Cyrus, according to Xenophon. O ancestral Zeus, and Helios, and all of the gods, accept these offerings as tokens of gratitude for help in achieving many glorious enterprises. After the king descended, the magi knelt at the bottom of the high woodpile and kindled a fire with laurel fans, taking care not to pollute the sacred flames with their breath. The spectacular bonfire to the gods burned for many days, lighting up the night sky. The heat was so intense that no one could approach the altar. The towering flames could be seen for a distance of a thousand stades, or about a hundred and fifteen miles, visible to Mithridates' ships at sea. Gazing up at the fire on the mountain, Mithridates and his followers could still fervently believe in his grand destiny. Chapter 11 Living Like a King Like a wrestler, ready for another bout, marveled Plutarch, Mithridates had risen to his feet despite the blow Scylla had dealt him. And now, wrote Appian, after his resounding victory over Murena, Mithridates was at leisure. The war for Greece had ended in disaster with terrible casualties and the destruction of Athens, yet, in a way, the result was an ancient forerunner of what modern military strategists call the Tet Offensive effect. The phenomenon was named after a massive assault by the North Vietnamese in 1968 during the Vietnam War. The offensive failed on a grand scale, but the nominally victorious U.S. and South Vietnamese forces were demoralized by the strength and determination of the enemy. The North Vietnamese gained international support and eventually won the war. The Tet Effect describes a disastrous major military campaign against a more powerful enemy which nevertheless becomes a public relations victory with renewed support for what is seen as a righteous cause. The concept of glorious failure, noble defeat, was well known in antiquity. The Spartans at Thermopylae, Hannibal, Aristonicus, and Spartacus are some famous examples. Justin described a Tet-like effect for Mithridates, who went down in defeat before the greatest generals, only to rise again, all the more redoubtable for his losses. In Rome, Cicero sought to account for Mithridates' remarkable ability to draw reinforcements after so many losses. Somehow, exclaimed Cicero, Mithridates has done more by being defeated than if he had been victorious. Sulla's reign of terror continued in Rome. A great many of Marius's populars fled Italy. These exiles, veterans, and statesmen who had held high offices under popular rule regrouped on the eastern and western frontiers of the empire and raised banners of revolt. Some went to Spain to join Sertorius, the Roman commander leading an insurgent army of native Spaniards. Others joined Mithridates in Pontus. These experienced Roman officers brought six thousand soldiers, a full legion, and trained Mithridates' new armies in Roman discipline and tactics. From now on, Mithridates' war chest no longer paid for ostentatious equipment, which had simply provided rich booty for the enemy. No more lavishly decorated ships with silk canopies and luxurious pools on the decks for entertaining concubines. No more armor, shields, and weapons inlaid with gold tracery and precious stones. Mithridates maintained peaceful coexistence under the peace of Dardanus, which he knew he had been lucky to win from a very distracted Scylla, but he was determined to keep his Black Sea kingdom secure. According to Appian, Mithridates took an army to subdue the Achaeans of northern Colchis. A fierce tribe that claimed descent from Greek heroes of the Trojan War, the Achaeans were notorious for luring ships to wreck on their rocky shores and then sacrificing the sailors to their gods. Fighting in their mountainous terrain was harsh. Mithridates lost a great many men to ambushes and freezing snow. The Achaeans were never defeated. Their allegiance could not be counted upon. Although some Achaeans later joined Mithridates' army, and the experience of mountain warfare was valuable. Mithridates remained ever vigilant for both opportunity and threat, but for nearly a decade he ruled in relative peace. Agates for my meat, strychnine in my cup. Mithridates loved spectacle and theatricality. He often staged dramatic performances to demonstrate his remarkable ability to dine on poison-laced meat and wine. 
Such evenings not only provided entertainment, but enhanced the Poison King's carefully crafted reputation of invincibility. And, of course, the morbid proceedings also furthered his experimental research. Let's imagine one of these banquets. The evening might feature the poisoning of someone condemned to die for a heinous crime. Mithridates followed the ethical approach of Attalus III of Pergamon, experimenting only on criminals. In the Greek world, capital punishment was usually carried out with poison hemlock, but Mithridates was systematically studying the effects of known and rare pharmaca, and men on death row were his scientific subjects. In at least one instance, we know that Mithridates received a messenger carrying a letter and package from his friend Zopyrus, the royal physician in Alexandria. Zopyrus's letter informed Mithridates that the messenger was sentenced to death and invited the king to test the accompanying antidote on him. So, as the guests take their places on couches, turbaned Hindus might charm cobras with sinuous flute music, and Silai serpent handlers allow themselves to be bitten by Libyan adders. Scythian shamans milk venom from the fangs of a step viper. Dipping an arrowhead in the poison, a Scythian archer shoots the criminal, the arrow zipping over the heads of the guests. On another evening, the old root-cutter, Cretius, might measure out some dread plant poison. With a flourish, he sprinkles it atop a tasty dish and serves it to another condemned man. Mithridates provides learned commentary as everyone observes the result of the poison. Suspense builds as servants proffer the same dish to the guests, minus the poison, of course. Meanwhile, the dying victims were quickly carried out of sight for secret experiments with antidotes. With grand gestures and banter, Mithridates awes the guests by swallowing a drop of snake venom. For the climax of the evening, the poison king invites the guests to salt his own plate of roast lamb or his wine cup with arsenic or belladonna. Mithridates was not only a toxicologist, he was a magus, a magician. Both skills came into play in creating his image of invincibility. With a debonair smile, the poison king raises his goblet in a toast. The reactions of the courtiers and foreign dignitaries to Mithridates' sensational demonstrations of immunity fascinated the poet and classical scholar A. E. Hausman. This verse from his 1896 poem about Mithridates became famous. There was a king reigned in the east with poisoned meat and poisoned drink. He gathered all the springs to birth from the many venomed earth. First a little, thence to more, he sampled all her killing store, and easy, smiling, seasoned sound sate the king when healths went round. They put arsenic in his meat, and stared aghast to watch him eat. They poured strychnine in his cup, and shook to see him drink it up. They shook, they stared, as whites their shirt. Them it was, their poison hurt. I tell the tale that I heard told. Mithridates, he died old. It was his mastery of poisons and his long life that made Mithridates a household word in Western literature and popular culture. His name is memorialized in the term Mithridatism, the practice of systematically ingesting small doses of deadly substances to make oneself immune to them. With some toxins, the process is effective. It is possible to acquire tolerance for levels of arsenic that would kill others, for example, and it was observed in antiquity that some people in Libya, Armenia, or Egypt were unaffected by local venomous insects, scorpions, and vipers. Mithridates also grasped the little-known fact that snake venom can be safely digested if swallowed. It is deadly only if it enters the bloodstream. The rising popularity of poisoning in the Roman Empire inspired the Roman satirist Juvenal to joke that murder weapons of cold steel might make a comeback if people would take a hint from old Mithridates and sample the pharmacopoeia till they are invulnerable to every drug. Nearly two millennia later in Mithridates, the poet-philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson visualized the poison king calling for more and more poisons to test on himself, from blister beetles to cyanide. Give me agates for my meat, give me cantharids to eat, bring me foods from all zones and altitudes, from all natures sharp and slimy, wild and tame, tree and lichen, bird and reptile be my game. Hemlock for my sherbet cull me, and the prussic juice to lull me.
Mithridates' Secret Antidote In antiquity, every natural poison, animal, plant, or mineral, was believed to have a natural antidote. Mithridates combined both toxic and beneficial pharmaca into his personal theriac, later called Mithridatium. Traditionally, theriacs combined substances thought to counter poisons. Some common ingredients were cinnamon, myrrh, cassia, honey, castor musk from beaver testicles, frankincense, rue, tannin, garlic, lemnian earth, cayenne wine, charcoal, curdled milk, centaury, aristolochia or birthwort, ginger, iris or orris root, rue, eupatorium, rhubarb from the Volga, hypericum, St. John's wort, saffron, walnuts, figs, parsley, acacia, carrot, cardamom, anise, opium, and other ingredients from the Mediterranean and Black Sea, Arabia, North Africa, Eurasia, and India. Modern science reveals that some of these substances can counteract illness and toxins. For example, the sulfur in garlic neutralizes arsenic in the bloodstream. Charcoal absorbs and filters many different toxins. The chemical compositions of lemnian earth was recently analyzed and shown to contain toxin-absorbing and antibacterial minerals. Garlic, myrrh, cinnamon, and St. John's wort are antibacterial. Recent scientific studies of many common mithridatium ingredients reveal alexipharmic bioactivities in the immune system. Certain plants, traditionally used by folk healers in Africa and India, can actually neutralize cobra, adder, and viper venoms. Building on the work begun by Attalus III, Nicander of Colophon, and others, Mithridates recorded the properties of hundreds of poisons and antidotes in experiments on prisoners, associates, and himself. Through tireless research and every possible experiment, says Pliny, he sought ways to compel poisons to be helpful remedies. We can imagine Mithridates and his team, Cratius, Papias, the Magi, and Agari healers, and Timotheus, a specialist in war wounds, wearing protective masks made from pig bladders used by ancient alchemists, and testing, say, the colorless, fiery poison of Egypt. This would be created by fusing natron sodium carbonate common in Egypt with realgar, or orpiment, arsenic. Health-giving essences were compounded with minute amounts of poisons into an electuary, a paste held together with honey. The paste was molded into a pill the size of an almond. The king began each day by chewing his secret theriac tablet with cold spring water. Apparently, the concoction caused no serious physical problems and promoted his immune system, since ancient sources agree that Mithridates enjoyed excellent health and sexual vigor throughout his long life. After his death, Mithridates' personal library and papers were taken to Rome and translated into Latin by Pompey's secretary, Linnaeus. Pliny, who studied Mithridates' own handwritten notes, praised his erudition. We know from direct evidence and by report, wrote Pliny, that Mithridates was a more accomplished researcher into biology than any man before him. In order to become immune to poison by making his body accustomed to it, he alone devised the plan to drink poison every day after first taking remedies. At the height of his reign, Mithridates amassed detailed knowledge from all his subjects who covered a substantial part of the world. His international library of ethnobotanical and toxicological treatises may have described drugs used by the Druids of Gaul, Mesopotamian doctors, and the works of Hindu long-life practitioners. The Theriac of Sushruta, around 550 B.C., boasted 85 ingredients, and the Mahigandahashti of Cherika, from around 300 B.C., had 60. Mithridates could have studied the alchemical writings of Democritus of Egypt, drawing on King Menes, who cultivated poisonous and medicinal plants in 3000 B.C., and we know Mithridates corresponded with Zopyrus in Egypt, who shared his universal remedy of twenty ingredients. Another scientific colleague was Asclepiades of Bithynia, who founded an influential medical school in Rome. He declined Mithridates' invitation to work in Sinope, but dedicated treatises to the king and sent him antidote formulas. Perhaps Mithridates sought out the last living members of the Ophiogenes, or snake people, near Troy to learn the secrets of venoms. 
the Marsai of Italy, whose envoys met with Mithridates in 88 BC, were also known for venom-based pharmaca. We know that the king's Agari doctors milked the venom of Caucasian vipers to make antidotes and medicines. Recently, scientists studying traditional healing practices using Caucasian vipers in Azerbaijan discovered that tiny doses can stop life-threatening hemorrhage. And as we shall see, this fact known to the Agari more than two thousand years ago would save Mithridates' life. Crystallized Caucasian viper venom is now a valuable medical export. The key principle of Mithridates' theriac was the combination of beneficial drugs and antitoxins with tiny amounts of poisons, the approach followed by Attalus and Hindu doctors. Myriad poisons were known in antiquity from vipers, scorpions, and jellyfish venoms to the deadly sap of yew trees and crimson crystals of cinnabar. Pliny described about 7,000 venific substances in his Encyclopedia of Natural History, and listed scores of plants, some toxic themselves, said to counter them, such as scordion, agaric mushrooms, artemisia, centaury, polymonia, and aristolochia. Arsenic, the notorious powder of succession, would have been the first poison Mithridates sought to defend against. Arsenic interferes with essential proteins for metabolism. In small doses, however, enzymes produced by the liver bind to and inactivate arsenic. Taking minuscule amounts over time causes the liver to produce more enzymes, allowing one to survive a normally lethal dose. Might a similar process work with plant poisons? Mithridates had observed tolerances to poison plants in rats, insects, birds, and other creatures. Pliny and Aulus Gellius stated that the poisoned blood of Pontic ducks was included in his Mithridatium. It is now known that some species of ducks, larks, and quails eat poison hemlock without harm. Because they do not excrete the toxic alkaloids, their blood and flesh are poisonous. What other poisons were included in the original Mithridatium? Perhaps toxic honey from Pontus. Bees were immune to the poison nectar, and in tiny amounts it was considered a tonic. Reptiles, toxic skink, salamander, or viper, were said to be part of Mithridates' recipe based on the ancient belief that all poisonous creatures produce antidotes to their own toxins in their bodies. Recent scientific experiments show that non-fatal doses of snake venom can stimulate the immune response and allow humans to withstand up to ten times the amount of venom that would be fatal without inoculation. A similar process works with some insect stings and a variety of toxins. Surprising new studies of a counterintuitive process called hormesis show that very low doses of certain toxins activate a protective mechanism so that when a larger dose is encountered, it's not as damaging. As the scientists describe this new concept, remarkably akin to Mithridates' own hypothesis, minute doses of poison substances can be beneficial, analogous to a vaccine. St. John's wort, Hypericum, listed in many Mithridatium recipes, might help solve the ancient riddle of Mithridates' immunity to poisons. Molecular scientists have recently discovered Hypericum's astounding antidote effect. This herb activates the liver to produce a potent enzyme that can neutralize literally thousands of potentially dangerous chemicals. The scientists suggest that if St. John's wort was included in Mithridates' antidote, it would have stimulated a powerful chemical surveillance system on high alert, able to sense and break down otherwise deadly doses of many different toxins. After Mithridates' death, Imperial doctors in Rome claimed to possess the top-secret Mithridatium formula. Poisonings and fears of poisoning had become rife in Rome. As dictator, Sulla had enacted strict laws against poison sellers. If you want to survive to gather rosebuds for another day, commented Juvenal, find a doctor to prescribe some of the drug that Mithridates invented. Before every meal, take a dose of the stuff that saves kings. How might Mithridates' recipe have come into the hands of the Roman emperors? One possibility is that Mithridates entrusted the secret to his friend Asclepiades, the most famous doctor in Rome. A doctor named Elias 
prescribed Mithridatium for Julius Caesar, who was in Pontus only sixteen years after Mithridates' death. Elias was a college of Asclepiades, and perhaps knew Mithridates himself. An intriguing inscription from the time of Augustus, Rome's first emperor, was discovered near the Appian Way. It describes one L. Lutatius Paxius, a non-Roman name, as an incense seller from the family of King Mithridates. Renach assumes that L. Paxius was a liberated slave or relative of Mithridates, who was the king's chief perfumer. But there is little doubt that Paxius, like other ancient apothecaries, sold more than aromatics. Why else might an incense purveyor advertise his relationship to the legendary poison king? Poisons had been strictly regulated since Scylla's legislation, which explains why an apothecary might advertise only aromatics for sale. Many of Mithridates' family and friends ended up in Italy. The inscription suggests that Paxius might have known or claimed to know the original Mithridatium recipe and produced this famous trademark antidote in Rome. In fact, another Paxius, probably this man's son, later made a fortune selling a very special medicine in Rome. This Paxius family formula was a profound secret, and Paxius the Younger bequeathed it to the Emperor Tiberius, Augustus's successor, in A.D. 14. Was the Paxius family formula the basis for the later imperial Roman recipe, said to improve on Mithridates' original, compounded by the imperial doctor Andromachus for Nero? Andromachus's Mithridatium had sixty-four ingredients. He replaced minced lizards with venomous snakes and added opium poppy seeds. Italian archaeologists made an exciting discovery at a villa near Pompeii in 2000. Analysis of the residue inside a large vat consisted of reptile remains and several medicinal plants, including opium poppy seeds. The archaeologists concluded that the vat might have been used to prepare Andromachus's Mithridatium. After Nero, every Roman emperor religiously ingested what his doctor claimed was a version of the poison king's own personal antidote. Recipes multiplied. More and more costly and rare ingredients were added along the way. A century after Mithridates' death, Celsus in Gaul listed thirty-six ingredients mixed into a concoction weighing nearly three pounds, good for about six months' worth of pills, to be taken with wine. In A.D. 170, Galen of Pergamon, who prescribed a liquid Mithridatium for the emperor Marcus Aurelius, added more opium and fine vintage wine, improving the flavor and ensuring that his patient drank his medicine every day. Later medieval recipes contained as many as 184 ingredients. Arabic and Persian theriac recipes in ancient and medieval Islamic toxicology manuscripts followed Mithridates' concept of combining poisons with antidotes. In his treatise on theriac, Averroes, the learned Spanish-Arabic philosopher-physician, cautioned against the prolonged use of theriac by a healthy person, warning that it could actually transform human nature into a kind of poison, an allusion to paranoid despots of his day who were obsessed with poisoning. In A.D. 667, Islamic ambassadors from Rum presented the Tang Emperor of China with a gift of the Mithridatium theriac. It was described as a dark red lump the size and shape of a pig's gallbladder. Chinese manuscript illustrations show foreigners wearing Persian-style clothing, offering these Mithridatium pills as tribute to the emperor. In Europe, from the Middle Ages on, Mithridatium was eagerly ingested. European laws require apothecaries to openly display all the precious, expensive ingredients and to concoct Mithridatium in the public squares. For more than two millennia after the death of Mithridates, aristocrats and royalty, from Charlemagne and Alfred the Great to Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth I, swallowed some version of the Mithridatium faithfully every day of their lives. The royal mixture was kept in ornate apothecary jars, illustrating scenes from the life of Mithridates. There were also cheaper versions of Mithridatium for the poor. The Poison King's universal antidote became the most popular and longest live prescription in history, available in Rome as recently as 1984. 
Most of the surviving recipes for theriacs in Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Indian, Arabic, and early Islamic medical writings include an array of plant, animal, and mineral pharmaca to counteract toxins and disease. Aside from Andromachus's addition of chopped vipers for Nero's antidote, however, most of these theriac recipes didn't deliberately include poisons. Yet, the ancient writers agreed with Pliny that Mithridates achieved immunity to poisons by ingesting deadly substances along with a cocktail of specific or general antidotes. In Pliny's words, he thought out the plan of drinking poisons daily after taking remedies in order that sheer habit might render the poisons harmless. Although we can guess some of the counteracting drugs that Mithridates is likely to have put in his formula, his method of calibrating minuscule doses of poisons and exactly what they were remain a mystery. Mithridates worked in secrecy. The original lost recipe was believed to contain more than fifty ingredients, many of them expensive substances from faraway lands. Oddly, however, the notes translated after his death revealed only a few commonplace ingredients, with the exception of the blood of Pontic ducks. Even the learned naturalist Pliny expressed surprise at the lack of arcane or toxic substances in the Mithridatic notes he studied. He ridiculed a scrap of paper in the king's handwriting. Pound together two dried walnuts, two figs, and twenty leaves of rue with a pinch of salt. He who takes this while fasting will be immune to all poisons for that day. As Pliny remarked, this mundane recipe cannot be taken seriously. Some modern scholars suggest it was a forgery, or hoax. So what happened to Mithridates' formula? Several possible explanations come to mind. The archives taken to Rome may have recorded only Mithridates' earliest experiments, superseded by successful tests whose records we do not have. The genuine records could have been lost or hidden during the chaos of the Mithridatic Wars. The documents may have been encrypted. Ancient alchemists wrote in codes or obscure languages. Mithridates possessed the linguistic skills to facilitate this. Perhaps the real formula was kept secret by the imperial Roman doctors who inherited Mithridates' papers or Paxius's recipe, but was later forgotten or lost. Maybe written versions of the perfected formula were destroyed on Mithridates' orders, or entrusted only to closest friends and allies such as Tigranes, who, like Mithridates, enjoyed robust health and an extremely long life. Perhaps it was destroyed when Callistratus, Mithridates' personal secretary, was murdered by Roman soldiers. Pompey might have burned some of Mithridates' archives, as he did with Sertorius's papers. Or, as suggested by historian Alain Touwed, maybe Pompey obtained the recipe, but kept it secret within his circle. Finally, the instructions for the Mithridatium may never have been written down. Perhaps they were recorded only in Mithridates' prodigious memory. Unless new evidence emerges, say, a verifiable recipe on papyrus or stone, or sealed jars of the king's own Mithridatium containing residue, or Mithridates' mummified corpse sufficiently preserved to allow an autopsy and hair and bone sampling, the poisoned king's universal antidote is irretrievable. Yet Mithridates' ambitious goal of creating a universal antidote lives on. Sergei Popov, a top scientist in the ultra-secret Soviet bioweapons program based in the homeland of the Agarai, defected to the United States in 1992. Popov now seeks to perfect a broad-spectrum biodefense, a universal antidote to promote immunity to a wide range of biotoxins and weapons-grade pathogens. Like the Janus-faced pharmaca of the Mithridatium, the materials Popov works with carry the potential for great harm or great good. Mithridates took further precautions against assassination by poison, employing guards in his kitchens and royal tasters. Some metals and certain other crystals and stones were said to detect even neutralize poison in wine or food. Mithridates and his best friends surely owned poison cups, chalices of electrum, a gold and silver alloy. A goblet of electrum revealed the presence of poison when iridescent colors rippled across the metallic surface with a crackling sound, apparently the result of a chemical reaction. Red coral, amber, adamus, and glossopetra, tongue stones, were thought to have magical properties against poison. 
Tongue stones, fossilized giant shark teeth from limestone deposits, would sweat or change color on contact with poison. Ground into powder, they deactivate poison. In fact, the calcium carbonate in fossils does react with arsenic. In a chemical process called chelation, the arsenic molecules are mopped up by the calcium carbonate. Mithridates tested the nature of poisons for many reasons besides immunity. Which poisons were best for efficient, undetectable assassination? What if one found oneself in the situation of Hannibal or Jugurtha, with enemies closing in and no escape route? Which poison was ideal for suicide? We know that Mithridates carried suicide capsules and distributed them to Dorylaeus, his generals, and close friends. Those capsules concealed in rings, bracelets, amulets, or sword hilts obviously contained an extremely fast-acting, relatively gentle, lethal poison with no known antidote. Agates and Art Mithridates' dominions were rich in mineral resources. Perhaps toxic pigments such as red cinnabar, yellow orpiment, blue azurite, and green malachite led to his fascination with gemology, the magical properties of precious metals and gems. Mithridates himself wrote a treatise on the powers of amber sacred to the sun. He corresponded with the leading gemologist of the day, Zacalius, a Jew in Babylon, who dedicated his treatises to the king. Mithridates was especially fond of agates, beautiful translucent forms of chalcedony. Gazing on agates' colored bands and speckled, swirling patterns was thought to bring pleasant dreams. Agates from Sicily were said to repel scorpions, and the Magi advised athletes to wear red agates to become invincible. Zacalius recommended wearing a ring of heliotrope, sun-reflecting, a green jasper agate flecked with red iron oxide to make one a convincing speaker. Mithridates often gave agate rings with his likeness to his ambassadors to help them argue his case before the Romans and others. Mithridates' vast dactylotheci collection of agate rings was renowned. In his love of carved gemstones, Mithridates followed Alexander, the first to inspire the popularity of glyptics, the intricate art of engraving animals, mythic scenes, and other images on intaglio seals and cameos, reliefs on sardonyx, a multi-layered agate. The only artist permitted to create gem portraits of Alexander was his personal engraver, Pergatiles. Like Alexander, Mithridates patronized his own highly skilled engravers and artisans. A connoisseur of precious objets d'art, Mithridates owned thousands of cups, pitchers, plates, and bowls of polished agate from the Rhodope Mountains, Crimea, and Colchis, and onyx and rock crystal from Cappadocia. His treasury at Talora alone held two thousand onyx and gold drinking cups, wine critères, and drinking horns. A precious burnished agate pitcher now in the Louvre was believed to have belonged to Mithridates. Artisans achieved its unique dark brown coloring by slowly heating Rhodopian agate in honey. The rare beauty of Mithridates' collection inspired a fashion for agates among the Roman aristocracy. Mithridates' dactylotheci ended up in Roman hands after his death in 63 BC. Pompey dedicated several large chests of his carved gems to Rome's Temple of Jupiter. Julius Caesar placed six of Mithridates' agate rings in the Temple of Venus, and other rings were dedicated to the Temple of Apollo. Some of Mithridates' agates and miniature gem portraits have survived. During the Crusades, the Venetians plundered Constantinople, dispersing many fine Mithridatic agates among European royalty. Agates from rich hordes and royal tombs of Mithridates' friends, envoys, and concubines, and some belonging to Mithridates himself, found their way into Catherine the Great's personal dactylotheci of ten thousand ancient cameos. The Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg now stores a large collection of exquisite cameos, many taken from wealthy Mithridatic-era tombs around the Crimea. Mithridates also amassed the jeweled caskets, golden horse trappings, curios and ornaments, armor and weapons set with precious stones, jewelry, vintage robes, carpets, and tapestries, and unique scientific instruments. He inherited antique couches and chairs from Darius I, and Mithridates himself enjoyed making furniture of maple and nutwoods. 
On state occasions the king sat on a fancy throne under a silk canopy, carried an ornate scepter, and rode in a chariot studded with gems. The opening of the Silk Road from India and China to the Black Sea meant that he could acquire silks, brocades, jade, cinnabar, rare spices, exotic drugs, and hardy camels from Bactria and Margiana. An admirer of fine art, Mithridates could afford the highest quality and the best artists. Renac believed that Mithridates himself had the soul of an artist. His coin portraits are remarkable for their clarity and beauty, vigor, and kinetic energy. Their superb artistic quality advertised Mithridates as a discerning patron of high culture. Some coin profiles with windswept hair evoke a futuristic illusion of speed and progress, hinting at Mithridates' ability to escape danger. A handsome bronze crater over two feet high shows off the skills of Mithridates' craftsmen and reveals the complex destinies of his treasures. Part of his largesse to supporters in Greece, this inscribed crater was given to a gymnasium, a college probably in Athens early in his reign. The members called themselves the Eupatoristai, after their patron, Eupator, who promised to liberate Greece. During the First Mithridatic War, this crater was apparently plundered by Sulla and taken to Rome. Two hundred years later, the crater belonged to the Emperor Nero, who kept it in his luxurious seaside villa at Antium. Unearthed from the villa's ruins by Pope Benedict XIV in the 18th century, the crater is now a centerpiece in Rome's Capitoline Museum. During Mithridates' reign, cosmopolitan Pontus on the Black Sea became the intellectual and cultural capital of the ancient world, drawing sophisticated artists and scholars from many lands. A lover of Greek poetry, literature, music, and theater, Mithridates sponsored plays, dramatic readings, and musical contests. Tyrannio the Grammarian, a leading poetic orator, was one of many stars in Mithridates' court. The modern Greek poet, Constantine Cavafy, imagined the private thoughts of a Cappadocian poet in Mithridates' retinue. In Cavafy's poem, the poet is penning an epic about Darius I, commissioned by Mithridates. Suddenly, he is interrupted by a servant shouting that the Roman army is coming. The terrified poet realizes that Mithridates' interest in poetry will be set aside in favor of war. Before taking cover, the poet searches for the perfect phrase to describe the Persian king and, by implication, Mithridates. The final words on the page, arrogance and exultation. A Musical Interlude As we've seen, an evening with the king might feature any manner of entertainments, from rowdy drinking contests and shocking poisoned pageants to elegant cultural events. At one of the royal banquets, a musician brought along his pretty daughter. She played the cithara for Mithridates while he was savoring a mellow old wine. Female harpists were unusual. Mithridates was charmed, perhaps recalling that Aristonicus's mother had played the cithara. The girl's Macedonian name, Stratonice, or victory in war, was a good omen. Plutarch says that Stratonice made such a swift conquest that Mithridates immediately took her away to his bed, without a word to her father. The next morning, the distraught father awoke to find his tables laden with silver beakers and golden dishes. Servants and smiling eunuchs held out beautiful garments. Outside his humble house stood a fine horse, caparisoned like those of the king's knights. Assuming the fairy tale trappings were a mean practical joke, the man tried to run away. The retainers explained the situation. Stratonice was now Mithridates' favorite concubine, held in such high esteem that the king was bestowing the estate of a rich, recently deceased friend upon her father. The dubious musician was finally convinced. To the good-natured amusement of Mithridates and the townspeople, Stratonice's father donned his new purple robe and rode through the streets on his handsome horse, shouting, All this, mine, mine, I'm mad with joy. Kabira Doctors, pharmacologists, botanists joined the artists who flocked to Pontus, along with architects, scientists, and military engineers, such as Nicomedes of Thessaly and Callimachus, who designed fortifications, catapults, siege machines, and other innovative projects. Not all of these scientists' bold technological experiments were successful. Remember the collapsing Sambuca at Rhodes, and the catastrophic Nike Deus Ex Machina at Pergamon. 
but the ambitious construction projects at Kabira were striking examples of Mithridates' scientific interests and unlimited wealth. Young Mithridates had been struck by the natural beauty and defensibility of Kabira, surrounded by steep mountains and forests of beech, maple, walnut, pine, and spruce on the Lycos River. There were important cinnabar mines, toxic mercury ore used for pigments. Perhaps the Poison King knew a useful toxicological fact that modern scientists have only recently discovered, that mercury in the soil here taints the local wild mushrooms. On a remote rocky peak, Mithridates constructed Kainon Corion, New Castle, a fortified treasury for precious valuables. The vaults contained not only gold and silver and priceless artworks, but also Mithridates' private papers, court archives, and personal correspondence. Strabo, who traveled there, said it was about two hundred stades north of Kabira, about twenty-five miles. In 1912, the ruins of this citadel were discovered, complete with underground stone staircases. At Kabira, Mithridates built towers to confine his younger sisters, Nyssa, Roxana, and Statyra, sentenced to lifelong spinsterhood. The king's new lover, the Scythera player Stratonice, became the lady of Kabira, Perhaps their son, Zipheres, was born there. Mithridates loved to relax at this luxurious, secure residence. The well-watered grounds with willows, poplars, grape arbors, and apple trees were surrounded by extensive gardens where the royal botanists tended plants and ducks nibbled hellebore and hemlock. Mithridates maintained a large zoological garden and game park at Kabira for rare creatures from far-flung allies and trading partners. Ostriches, cobras, and scorpions, crocodiles, pheasants from Colchis, Bactrian camels, perhaps an Indian elephant, and tigers. Mithridates and Aurelius and their friends stayed at the hunting lodge and chased rabbit, partridge, quail, fox, lynx, bear, and boar. The king modeled these lavish features on the Persian gardens, zoos, and hunting parks created by Cyrus, Xerxes, and Darius. He was also following the example of Alexander, who kept an exotic menagerie of lions, bears, mongooses, and ostriches. One of the most striking features of Kabira was a very high waterfall. The prodigious force and volume of the waterfall inspired Mithridates and his engineers to harness the rushing water. They constructed the first water-powered mill. It was described by Strabo, who observed the mill or its ruins after the Mithridatic Wars. Until this invention of the watermill, humans and oxen had laboriously turned heavy grindstones to mill grain. After Strabo wrote his description of Mithridates' mill at Kabira, watermill technology spread to Italy and Europe. Master of Languages Mithridates' dazzling memory and facility with languages were legendary in his own time, and a book in several languages is still called a Mithridates. The king was naturally endowed with these gifts from childhood, but he may also have benefited from special memory techniques taught by the leading philosopher in his court, Metrodorus, the Roman hater. Metrodorus invented a memory device based on the zodiac and mythological stories. The twelve constellations were subdivided into 360 storage compartments, each box a category of information. This technique could be invaluable for toxicological experiments and languages. Mithridates far excelled Cyrus the Great, who knew the names of all his officers and satraps. Only one other individual in antiquity had linguistic abilities that even approached those of Mithridates. According to Plutarch, Queen Cleopatra of Egypt spoke many languages and gave audiences to most foreign ambassadors without the help of interpreters. She knew Greek and Latin, and some Ethiopian, Coptic, Hebrew, Median, Arabic, Syrian, and Persian. Mithridates was reportedly so fluent in the languages of his subjects and soldiers that he never required interpreters. Aulus Gellius remarked that he was thoroughly conversant in the dialects of the twenty-five nations that he ruled, and spoke each language as if it were his native tongue. Pliny, who personally studied Mithridates' library and letters, declared, Mithridates spoke or read the languages of twenty-two nations. He could address and listen to the petitions of all of his subject peoples without interpreters. Valerius Maximus cited Mithridates' linguistic proficiency as a shining example of industrious study. 
Mithridates' international court, allies, and armies presented unique opportunities. Considered Colchis. This region was said to have more than one hundred tribes, each with a different dialect. Roman traders in Colchis required the services of a hundred and thirty interpreters, according to Pliny. In the land south of Colchis, twenty-six different tongues were spoken. It's unlikely that Mithridates learned every single dialect of these remote places, but he could make himself understood by most of his subjects. Which languages did Mithridates speak or read with ease? These are certain. Greek, Macedonian, Persian, Latin, Aramaic or Hebrew, Parthian, Armenian, Old and New Phrygian, Cappadocian, and the Gaulish dialect of his Galatian lover, Adabagiana. Other languages may have included Avestan, Old Iranian used in Zoroastrian prayers, Sanskrit, Hindu medical texts, Egyptian and Punic, Celtic Gallic, perhaps Allobrogesian, the language of his bodyguard, Betuitus. He knew some Anatolian tongues, such as Carian, Mysian, Isaurian, Lydian, Lycian, and Pisidian, and maybe had a smattering of Syriac, Elamite, and Sumerian, used in religious texts of the Seleucid era. He could have learned Italian dialects, Marsic, Oscan, and Umbrian, Thracian, spoken by many of his cavalry regiments, and Getic, spoken in Thomas on the Danube. Other possibilities include vestigial forms of Assyrian or Hittite, and dialects of Colchis, Sarmatia, and Scythia. Mithridates' ease with languages meant that he could receive and send messages in private without risking wide knowledge of his dealings. In the peaceful interlude after the Treaty of Dardanus, the king reigned uneventfully, shoring up his Black Sea Empire, building new strongholds, training armies, seeking new allies, and considering strategies vis-à-vis -vis Rome. Meanwhile, what were his friends and foes up to? Tigranes the Great, King of Kings The Romans now controlled Bithynia and western Anatolia. To collect the massive fine of twenty thousand talents imposed by Sulla, tax collectors returned to prey on Anatolia. Plutarch compared them to harpies stealing the food of the people, causing unspeakable and incredible misfortune. In fact, Sulla's fine had been paid off. Roman creditors had already made a profit of twenty thousand talents. Their exorbitant interest rates had inflated the total public debt to an astronomical one hundred and twenty thousand talents. Anatolian families were forced to sell their young sons and virgin daughters into prostitution and slavery. Towns sold sacred statues and temple dedications. The Roman creditors were vicious, torturing debtors before selling them into bondage. The land was also oppressed by the greed and violence of the two occupying Roman legions who had run wild under Fimbria and Murina. Just as Mithridates had anticipated, Galatia, the buffer zone between Pontus and Bithynia, allied with Rome. Cappadocia remained uneasily divided between Mithridates and Ario Barzanes, who owed his crown to Sulla. Mithridates' ally and son-in-law Tigranes of Armenia had taken over Syria. After violent intrigues among the Syrian king, Gripus, and his murderous relatives, the Syrians looked abroad for a stable monarch. They wanted to invite Mithridates to rule Syria, but others, perhaps Mithridates himself, worried that this might attract the attention of Rome. In 83 BC, the Syrians chose Tigranes of Armenia to be their king. Tigranes was powerful and imperious. After the peace of Dardanus, the title King of Kings was up for grabs. Tigranes took it. He now ruled a kingdom that stretched from Syria to the Caspian Sea, from Artaxata to Mesopotamia. Tigranes' armies swelled with divisions from Arabia, Caucasia, and Central Asia. But Rome had paid little attention, since Sulla turned Tigranes out of Cappadocia in 95 BC. The new king of kings was building a magnificent fortified city for himself on the Tigris River, Tigranocerta, city of Tigranes. Sulla, the Perfumed Corpse In about 80 BC, Mithridates sent ambassadors to Rome, hoping to sign the peace agreement of five years earlier. But Ariobarzanes had complained to Sulla that Mithridates still held part of Cappadocia. Sulla ordered Mithridates to give it up, as agreed at Dardanus. Mithridates complied and withdrew his army. 
he dispatched his ambassadors back to Rome, ready to formalize the treaty. But in the meantime, Sulla had unexpectedly resigned his dictatorship. The man so feared as a monstrous tyrant resumed his old lifestyle, drinking and carousing with musicians and prostitutes. At age sixty, Sulla succumbed to a mysterious, gruesome disease. According to Plutarch, Sulla's bowels rotted, corrupting his entire body into a mass of worms. Relays of servants worked to scrub away the teeming maggots. Sulla spent hours in the baths, but the vermin defied all purification. Upon Sulla's death, his young associate, Pompey, took the body to Rome for cremation. To mask the stench, Sulla's female friends contributed vast quantities of spices and perfumes. These alone required two hundred and ten litters in the funeral cortege. A large figure of Sulla himself was molded out of frankincense and cinnamon and placed next to the corpse on the pyre. On the day of the funeral, glowering clouds dumped heavy rains. According to Plutarch, everyone heaved a sigh of relief when the rain lifted long enough for the flames to consume the repulsive remains. Mithridates' reaction to the news of Sulla's dreadful affliction and death is unknown, but his feelings must have swung between schadenfreude and apprehension. Mithridates' envoys came home again with no official agreement with Rome. The Senate was too preoccupied to meet Mithridates' ambassadors. Or were they hostile? In fact, many in Rome considered the Mithridatic wars unfinished. Mithridates may have compared his uncomfortable situation to the tragedy of Jugurtha in North Africa. Jugurtha had struggled in vain to reach a viable peace with Rome, but the Senate repeatedly refused to sign the terms of his surrender, and in the end he was betrayed to Sulla and murdered. By all accounts, Mithridates had lived up to the terms of the Peace of Dardanus. He had made good-faith efforts to formalize the treaty with the Senate in Rome. He complied with Sulla's last demand to leave Cappadocia. His actions certainly appear to have been those of a man desirous of peaceful equilibrium. Trying to deal with the Republic as it was thrashing about in its death throes was frustrating, nerve-wracking. But the situation also presented interesting possibilities for a man as ambitious, resourceful, and opportunistic as Mithridates. Cappadocia Mithridates conferred with his old ally Tigranes. With Sulla dead, Rome was in no position to enforce the still unsigned treaty. The two monarchs agreed that Tigranes should invade Cappadocia. This time they intended to succeed. The Armenian army was massive. Tigranes drew up a hundred and twenty thousand foot soldiers and many ranks of war chariots. His general, Mithrobarzanes, led a hard-core cavalry twelve thousand strong. Tigranes' horsemen were mostly Parthian-style cataphracts, knights in chainmail riding large, heavily armored Nicene horses. The historian Sallust praised Armenia's cavalry as remarkable for the beauty of its steeds and armor. Tigranes also commanded twelve thousand mounted archers, deadly accurate at more than two hundred yards, and their arrows were tipped with poison for good measure. Jewish historian Josephus gave the figure of five hundred thousand for Tigranes' entire army, which included all the camp followers, men who tended the camels and mules loaded with baggage, weapons, provisions, and chests of gold and silver, trailing families and servants, shepherds with herds of cattle, sheep, and goats to feed the thousands. Tigranes' multitudes were likened to a swarm of locusts or the dust of the earth. Tigranes marched into Cappadocia. He met no resistance. According to the terms of Tigranes' agreement of 95 B.C. with Mithridates, the land of Cappadocia fell to Pontus, while Tigranes seized all the spoils and captives. Tigranes' army rounded up 300,000 Cappadocian men, women, and children. They were not harmed, and families were kept intact. They were even allowed to keep a few possessions and animals. This great mass of uprooted people was herded south to populate Tigranes' fabulous new city on the Tigris. Tigranes also moved captive populations of Greeks from Cilicia, Jews from Palestine, and nomadic Arabs to Tigranoserta. This forced transfer of whole populations was a very large-scale example of an age-old practice of powerful conquerors. Sertorius and the White Fawn 
The disintegration of Rome's foreign policy during the civil wars had allowed the pirate fleets to multiply by tens of thousands in the Mediterranean Sea. The pirates, always seeking loot and now a great military force, were allied with Mithridates and with Sertorius in Spain. No Roman ships were safe, a significant advantage for both men. In one of his orations in Rome, Cicero described how Mithridates and Sertorius corresponded through intelligence couriers aboard pirate corsairs. Sertorius sent two military strategists to Pontus, Lucius Magius and Lucius Fanius. They encouraged Mithridates to imagine a scenario in which the rebellions in Spain and Anatolia could succeed. They painted a rosy future of a reasonable Roman Empire led by Marius's moderate populars, an empire that would be content to rule the western Mediterranean while Mithridates ruled his Black Sea Empire. The last hope of the populars, Sertorius was a master of ambush, disguise, and guerrilla warfare. He had won military honors and lost an eye in Gaul and helped put down the Marseille Revolt in Italy. As rebel governor of Spain, Sertorius established a senate in exile for fugitive Marius supporters. Even though he dreamed of retiring to the idyllic Canary Islands far from tyranny and endless wars, he agreed to head the Spanish resistance movement and was winning battles against legions sent from Rome. Good at languages, Sertorius was a courageous revolutionary leader, beloved by his soldiers and the Spaniards. One day, a Spanish hunter presented Sertorius with a pure white fawn. Wearing a garland of blossoms, the fawn followed the stern general around camp to the delight of his men. This little albino doe was sent by the goddess of war, Diana, declared Sertorius. She slept in his tent and whispered to him, warning him of dangers. Whenever his spies reported a victory, Sertorius kept it secret. He brought out his white doe, assuring his soldiers that she had predicted success. The next day he would publicly announce the victory to his men, thereby fulfilling her forecast. The Third Mithridatic War Begins Sertorius was in many ways a Roman counterpart to Mithridates. The civil wars had filled Sertorius with venom against oligarchic Rome. As governor of Spain, Sertorius had become disillusioned with the greed and harshness of Roman tax officials. Like Rutilius Rufus in Anatolia, Sertorius sympathized with the native peoples embittered and oppressed by Rome's administration of the province. Because he reduced taxes and governed mildly, the Spaniards invited him to lead their revolt against Sulla. As Plutarch described Sertorius, his charismatic personality mirrored that of Mithridates. Sertorius inspired his followers with fresh hopes, offered them new adventures, and kept them united in spite of hardships. Sertorius's prestige had spread throughout the Mediterranean world. Traders, pirates, and envoys from Spain regaled Mithridates with tales of Sertorius's victories. Mithridates' Roman advisers compared Sertorius to Hannibal and convinced Mithridates to ally with him. If you, the most powerful king in the world, were to combine your strength with the world's most successful general, they promised, then Rome, destabilized by civil wars and slave uprisings in Italy, would be paralyzed by an unstoppable attack on two fronts. In 76 BC, a severe earthquake shook Italy. That year, Sertorius won great victories over Roman armies. The next year, Sertorius and Mithridates began negotiating in earnest. Mithridates promised to supply ships and money for a joint war on Rome. In return, Mithridates asked Sertorius to confirm him as sovereign over the former province of Asia, restoring the land he had given up under the treaty with Sulla. Sertorius told Mithridates that he was welcome to Bithynia, Cappadocia, Galatia, and Paphlagonia, but insisted that western Anatolia should remain a Roman province. Sertorius's audacity surprised Mithridates, Plutarch records the king's response. This Sertorius was driven to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, and yet he dares to mark out the frontiers of our kingdom. Can you imagine what he will demand when he is master of Rome? Despite some arm-wrestling over Anatolia, Sertorius and Mithridates drew up a treaty and swore oaths to uphold it. Sertorius agreed that Mithridates should resume possession of eastern Anatolia and sent his general Marcus Varius with an army to Pontus. 
Mithridates sent Sertorius forty ships, bearing three thousand talents of silver, half again the penalty of two thousand talents he had paid Sulla in 85 B.C. In 76 to 74 B.C., Mithridates' mints issued gold and silver coins at a great rate, in anticipation of war. Sertorius' general, M. Varius, and Mithridates together captured certain cities in Asia. Plutarch doesn't name the towns, but presumably they were places that had been harshly punished by Sulla for supporting Mithridates, yet without Roman garrisons. Mithridates graciously, wisely, allowed Sertorius' general to enter these Anatolian cities as their liberator. The towns were declared free and exempt from taxation on the authority of Sertorius. Mithridates' new compassionate Roman ally. Suddenly, wrote Plutarch, the downtrodden people of Anatolia were inspired anew by the prospect of better days to come, and they longed for the benign rule of Mithridates and Sertorius to begin. In Bithynia, Rome's miserable puppet Nicomedes IV died childless in either 75 or 74 B.C., in a suspicious déjà vu move, calling to mind the last testament of Attalus the Third, willing Phrygia to Rome, Nicomedes bequeathed his kingdom to Rome. The Senate sent a governor, Cotta, to organize the new province. This was the spark that kindled the Third Mithridatic War. Mithridates immediately declared the will phony. The alliance with Sertorius had given Mithridates new capacities and new hope. The unilateral Roman takeover of Bithynia was, as Reynac commented, tantamount to a declaration of war. It ruptured the equilibrium established by the peace of Dardanus. The king of Pontus threw himself into feverish preparations to recover his empire. He stored a huge amount of grain from the steppes in granaries all around the Black Sea. Scythia normally sent 180,000 medemni of grain and 200 talents of silver a year as tribute. But this year, according to records cited by Appian, Mithridates received an astonishing two million medimni of grain, enough to feed about three hundred thousand people for a year. All summer, fall, and winter, Mithridates cut great swaths of timber to build ships and purchased well-trained strong horses. His arms makers forged Roman-style spears, swords, and shields. His engineers constructed siege engines. His recruiters gathered up mobs of new soldiers to be trained by Roman officers. Mithridates called up armies from Cappadocia, Colchis, Armenia, and Scythia, and beyond. From the remote territories of the Amazons, along the Thermodon and Don rivers to the Caspian Sea, mounted women warriors joined their male counterparts, Taurians of the Crimea and Leucosyrians of eastern Cappadocia. Sarmatian men and women warriors joined the warlike tribes of the Basilidae, Dandarians, and the Iazyges around the Sea of Azuf, and the Coralli, and hordes of Thracians of the Danube and Rhodope and Hemus Mountains. The ancient sources agree that the bravest of Mithridates' barbarians were the Bastarni of Carpathia. Altogether, says Appian, Mithridates recruited a fighting force of 140,000 infantry and 16,000 cavalry, attended by milling crowds of beasts of burden, baggage carriers, road makers, supply agents, and other camp followers. He had doubled his navy to 400 ships. Archelaus, Mithridates' former mercenary general, had gone over to Rome, but Mithridates' lineup of commanders was impressive. The Romans M. Varius, L. Magius, and L. Thanius joined Dorylaeus, Gordius, Neoptolemus, Diophantus, Taxiles, Hermocrates, Alexander of Paphlagonia, Dionysus the Eunuch, Eumachus, former satrap of Galatia, Conicorix, a Galatian, Metrophanes, and Aristonicus. Sertorius was about fifty years old, and Mithridates was about sixty in seventy-four B.C. Without ever meeting in person, They had recognized their similar spirits and common interests. Despite their personal longing for peace and security, the two leaders swore to make war on the mighty Roman juggernaut. A very great deal was at stake for each man. Chapter 12 Falling Star Four snow-white horses pulled a golden chariot encrusted with gems flashing in the sun's first rays. There was no driver. 
the beautiful horses galloped at full speed across the windswept cliff and plunged into the sparkling sea below. It was dawn, the first day of spring, 74 B.C. Mithridates' magnificent sacrifice reported by Appian to the sun gods Mithra and Helios and to Poseidon, god of sea and earthquakes, was performed to ensure success in the new war on Rome. The vivid image of the majestic white horses plunging into the sea persisted in the later Roman, Byzantine, medieval, and modern imagination. Some five hundred years later, for example, the early Christian writer Sidonius Apollinaris described a splendid castle in Gaul adorned by a dramatic painting of Mithridates' sacrifice. In 1678, the English playwright Nathaniel Lee pictured Mithridates sending a chariot all with emeralds set and filled with coral tridents and a hundred horses wild as wind over the precipice. The grandiose ritual is ignored by modern historians, but its multicultural significance was not lost on Mithridates' followers. Horse sacrifices to the sun were practiced by the ancient Greeks, Trojans, Scythians, and Persians. Ancient kings of Persia sacrificed horses to honor the sun. The Magi traditionally killed fine white horses at the Euphrates River, and when Xerxes invaded Greece, they sacrificed horses at the river Strymon in Thrace. Mithridates must also have been influenced by, and perhaps even witnessed, the great horse sacrifice of Rhodes. Each spring, the Rhodians, those brilliant seafarers who had bested Mithridates' fleet, drove a chariot and four horses into the sea to honor Helios, who guided his son chariot across the skies. For good measure, Mithridates also performed the great fire sacrifice as he had done after his victory over Murida. After the rituals, to appease these powerful male deities, Mithridates marched into Paphlagonia at the head of his army. There he delivered a rousing speech to his soldiers. Grounds for War Mithridates expounded on his illustrious ancestry and described with pride how his small kingdom had grown great under his rule. Pointing out that his armies had never been defeated by Romans when he was present to lead them, Mithridates extolled his vast resources and strong defenses. The Romans, he declared, were driven by boundless greed to enslave everyone. Why did the Senate refuse to sign the Peace of Dardanus? Because Rome never intended to give us peace. They intended to break the treaty all along. Now this phony will of Nicomedes of Bithynia reveals their lust to dominate us. Mithridates emphasized Rome's troubles at home and abroad. The Romans are losing the war with our new ally Sertorius in Spain. Italy is ravaged by civil strife and slave uprisings. Because of their wickedness, the Romans have not a single ally, and not one of their subjects obeys them willingly. Gesturing to his three Roman generals, Varius, Fanius, and Magius, Mithridates shouted, Look, some of Rome's noblest citizens are at war with their own country and allied with us. After this stirring speech, Mithridates marched into Bithynia. The Roman governor, Cotta, fled to Chalcedon. Cyzicus sent three thousand hoplites to Cotta. But the people of Bithynia overwhelmingly welcomed Mithridates as their liberator. They'd been crushed under the heel of Sulla's tax collectors. At Mithridates' approach, fearful Romans rushed to Chalcedon, crowding around the city's gates, but the gates were bolted shut by Cotta, huddling inside. When Mithridates' army arrived, there was a pitiless slaughter. The Roman civilians and Cyzacene soldiers, stranded outside the gates, perished, caught between their friends and their foes, beseeching both. For mercy. Meanwhile, Mithridates' Bastarni smashed through the massive bronze chain, protecting the harbor of Chalcedon, burning forty boats and capturing sixty. Only thirty Bastarni died in the naval battle, but more than three thousand Roman, Chalcedonian, and Cyzacene sailors lost their lives. On land, Mithridates lost seven hundred men, but more than 5,000 Romans were killed, and 4,500 were taken prisoner in this first battle of the Third Mithridatic War. The Roman general, Lucius Licinius Lucullus, encamped on the Sangarius River, struggled to encourage his legions after this great disaster. Mithridates, reveling in victory, looking forward to regaining his Anatolian empire, 
marched on the fortified port of Sisychus, gateway to Asia. The army of a hundred and twenty thousand infantrymen, sixteen thousand horsemen, and a hundred scythe chariots trailed a horde of camp followers and road and bridge builders. Mithridates' total forces were said to approach three hundred thousand. Meanwhile, in Rome. Lucullus, Sulla's protege, had become consul in Rome in 74 BC. His co-consul, Cotta, was sent to govern the new province of Bithynia. Lucullus was envious of his rival Pompey, a younger and more ruthless protege of Sulla, who was winning honors fighting Mithridates' new ally Sertorius in Spain. Determined to be the general who would triumph over Mithridates once and for all, Lucullus schemed to keep Pompey occupied in Spain. Sure enough, Lucullus was chosen to fight Mithridates in 74 BC. The Senate, fearing that Mithridates planned to attack Italy itself with his armada, pledged 3,000 talents to raise a fleet. But Lucullus bragged that he wouldn't need a navy to overcome Mithridates. He raised three legions himself and took command of the two Fimbrian legions still stationed in Anatolia for a total of about 30,000 infantry and 2,500 cavalry. Not only was Lucullus seriously outnumbered, but the Fimbrian legions would prove to be a problem. They had been complicit in mutinies and the deaths of their two previous generals, Flaccus and Fimbria. Tough fighters, but insolent and unmanageable, the soldiers were, in Plutarch's words, spoiled by habits of greed and luxury, and Murena's undisciplined leadership. Like rotten apples, these Fimbrian legionnaires would insidiously infect Lucullus's army with demands for booty and with outright insubordination. Rome's renewed war, to destroy the enemy Lucullus called the New Hannibal, was marked by ripsawing loyalties, devastating mayhem, and shocking reversals. This conflict, which has been described as a struggle between Roman oligarchic hegemony and democratic ideals of suffrage, freedom, and nationalization of land, drew participants from all corners of the classical world, from Spain to the Caspian Sea, from the River Don to the Persian Gulf. Treacherous terrain, cataclysmic weather, even celestial marvels, strange prodigies, and the gods themselves would be players in this epic contest between Lucullus and Mithridates. The Falling Star Lucullus's advisers urged him to take over Pontus undefended while Mithridates was in Bithynia. The chief proponent was Archelaus, Mithridates' turncoat star general. Perhaps Archelaus recalled Sulla's earlier offer to crown him king of Mithridates' rich kingdom of Pontus during the negotiations at Dardanus. But Lucullus scoffed, Why would I hunt for a wild beast in his empty lair? Then Lucullus caught sight of the massive army drawn up by Mithridates. Stunned, he hung back. He needed a cunning strategy to overcome such an immense force. Mithridates immediately provoked a battle, sending out an army led by the Roman M. Varius, Sertorius's one-eyed general. At Otrae, Lucullus marched out to meet the challenge. The two armies faced each other on the plain under a clear blue sky, and were just on the verge of combat. Suddenly the sky burst asunder, a huge flaming object of molten silver ripped through the heavens and slammed into the ground between the two armies. The stunned armies separated, in Plutarch's words, but the retreat must have been frantic. Fiction writer Michael Curtis Ford, in his adventure novel about the Mithridatic Wars, imagines the two armies pelted with a shower of clods of dirt and searing metal shrapnel as the burning celestial object plowed into the earth. Ford creates a scene in which Lucullus and Mithridates peer into the mysterious crater across from each other. The two generals lock eyes, each attempting to read the divine message that the other has taken from this event. In Ford's fantasy, the commanders wordlessly agree to fight another day. What was the extraterrestrial object? Richard Stothers, a NASA meteorologist who studies ancient observations of astronomical events, analyzed this incident using the scientific categories of unidentified flying objects. Because there were thousands of eyewitnesses at close range, Stothers considers Plutarch's account credible. The blinding flash in daylight indicates a high scale of magnitude. To be clearly observed overhead by armies standing just out of bowshot distance, 
the flaming object Stothers estimates must have measured more than four feet across. A fresh meteorite, a meteor that lands and survives impact, is usually black, leading Stothers to suggest that the bright silvery color recorded was that of an incandescent fireball or bolide, an extremely bright meteor, while it streaked across the sky before impact. Meteorites were revered in antiquity in shrines at Pessinus, Troy, Sisychus, Abydus, and Ephesus. No surviving ancient sources indicate that the object at Otrai was recovered and placed in a shrine. Although Stothers believes that the evidence points to a meteorite, in strict scientific terms, this event must be classified as a close encounter of the first kind, an observation at close range of a large, unidentified space object that leaves no apparent physical evidence. Since Plutarch's original Greek terminology indicates that witnesses did examine the object on the ground, it seems safe to say that the battle was interrupted by a spectacular meteorite. Perhaps the meteor crater will be identified at Otrai some day. After the impact, the witnesses compared the meteorite's size and shape to those of Pithos, a very large earthenware storage jar with a pointed end. Notably, as meteors hurtle through the Earth's atmosphere, they can take on a tapered nose-cone shape similar to a Hellenistic storage jar. Modern historians pay little attention to this incident, except to assume that both sides saw it as an evil omen. Reynac, for example, says only that Lucullus used the ill-omened chute d'un bolide as an excuse to avoid fighting when outnumbered. No record survives to tell us how Mithridates' Magi or Lucullus's seers really did interpret this extraordinary prodigy, but we can make some educated guesses. It's true that Romans in this period feared comets, falling stars, and meteors. Both armies were alarmed and ran away. But afterward, I think it's likely that both Mithridates and Lucullus and their respective omen readers could find positive meaning in the event. Meteors were associated with the Anatolian mother goddess Sibylle, who was represented as a stone that fell to earth. Lucullus, as well as Mithridates and his circle, knew that Sibylle's sacred black stone was worshipped at Pessinus. Marius made a pilgrimage there in 98 BC, hoping for victory against Sulla. Lucullus had been present when Sulla himself was encouraged by a dream of Sibylle handing him a thunderbolt. Sibylle worship became popular in Rome after the Second Punic War. The Sibylline books had declared that Rome could defeat Hannibal only if Sibylle's sky stone was brought to Italy. With great pomp, her sacred meteorite was transported from Pessinus to Rome in 204 B.C. So, in 73 B.C., when a meteorite at Otrai saved him from a battle against vastly superior forces, Lucullus may well have considered the prodigy as a sign of Sibylle's protection. Mithridates, aware that Sibylle was a goddess of victory and protector of Anatolian cities, could have seen the meteor as a positive sign, too. Because the meteorite halted the battle, his seers could take it to mean that he would be victorious against Lucullus without bloodshed, or that the gods forbade a battle at that time. Mithridates and his priests usually considered a blazing light in the sky to be a good omen, recalling the awesome comets that had attended his birth, his coronation, and his massacre of Romans in 88 B.C. After the silvery fireball from heaven aborted the battle at Otrai, Mithridates took advantage of a dark rainy night to march to Sisychus, undetected by Lucullus. Mithridates captured about three thousand inhabitants of Sisychus's Cora and established what he assumed would be a brief siege to take the city. Siege of Sisychus, 73-72 B.C. Mithridates sent Metrophanes to blockade the harbor while his army camped on the slopes of the mountains. Sisychus was losing hope. There had been no word from Lucullus since the ignominious defeat at Chalcedon, Menacing siege towers began to encircle the city walls, the work of Mithridates' engineer Nicodides. Finally, Lucullus advanced. But Mithridates' soldiers terrified the Cisacenes by pointing to the army far in the distance. See those campfires? Those are Tigranes' great armies of Armenians and Medes coming to help Mithridates. Lucullus's intelligence reported that Mithridates depended on foraging and supplies delivered by sea to feed his vast army. 
"'All we have to do is stomp on Mithridates' belly,' remarked Lucullus to his officers, "'and simply wait for him to surrender without a fight.' But Mithridates, on the advice of Taxiles, held a mountain pass to the territory Lucullus needed to occupy to block Mithridates' foragers and feed his own legions. Lucullus's men were unhappy with the idea of camping idly all winter. No chance for plunder. Mithridates, meanwhile, received dispiriting news from Spain. His ally, Sertorius, had been murdered. The hero of Marius's populars was stabbed while at dinner with friends. Pompey's legions had easily overcome what remained of the Spanish rebellion. The assassination of Sertorius was a severe blow to the populars who had joined Mithridates. One of these was Lucius Magius, the general sent by Sertorius to advise Mithridates. Magius told Mithridates that the two Fimbrian legions, once loyal to Marius, wanted to desert Lucullus. So, let Lucullus camp wherever he likes, reasoned Magius. With those Fimbrian legions on our side, we'll be victorious with no need for battle. Mithridates trusted Magius and pulled his guards from the mountain pass. Crucial details are missing to explain this apparently irrational move. Was Magius a traitor? Maybe. But a different possibility was suggested by the biographer of Lucullus. Magius may have acted in good faith, based on secret communications with the unreliable Fimbrians. After all, they had betrayed two previous commanders, and they chafed at Lucullus's restraint. The ancient historian Memnon alluded to a deal initiated by the Fimbrians that went terribly wrong. Whatever Magius's true motives to give up the pass was a grave blunder. The Fimbrians didn't defect, and Lucullus now occupied the heights above Mithridates. Hemmed in by Romans and mountains, Mithridates could receive supplies only by sea, but winter would halt shipping. Lucullus could hardly believe his good luck. Speed was key now. Mithridates attacked Sisychus with everything he had. His men brought up battering rams and catapult towers. One stupendous tower, more than a hundred cubits high, about a hundred and forty feet, supported a superstructure for raining catapult bolts, stones, and fire missiles into the city. Another immense contraption, straddling two large ships lashed together, moved into position against the city's sea walls. This was a new version of the huge Sambuca at Rhodes, with a drawbridge to allow men to swarm over the walls. Mithridates, like Lucullus, hoped to win without risk. Both men wanted to avoid a bloody battle or long siege. Accordingly, Mithridates' first move was to herd three thousand prisoners of war from Sisychus onto his ships. He directed his captains to row into the harbor, in full view of the Sisycenes defending their sea wall. As Mithridates expected, the captives shouted to their fellow citizens, begging them to spare them in their perilous position. But the Sisycene general was unmoved. You are in Mithridates' hands now. We cannot save you. Meet your fate like men. When he saw that the Sisycenes wouldn't surrender, even to save their compatriots, Mithridates let down the Sambuca drawbridge. The Sisycenes were dumbfounded to see enemy soldiers running across the skyway to their walls. But the rest of Mithridates' men hesitated to follow the first sortie, and the Sisycenes quickly recovered from their shock. They poured burning pitch onto the ships, forcing the whole contraption to back away from the wall. Next, Mithridates deployed all his siege engines on land. Again, the city manned an amazing defense, hurling boulders to break the battering rams and wrecking the machines with gigantic grappling hooks. The defenders had draped their wooden parapets with wet hides and doused the stone walls with vinegar to fireproof them against Mithridates' hail of fiery missiles. In Appian's words, the Sisycenes left nothing untried within the compass of human energy to repulse the attack. But as Mithridates knew, and as modern scientists have proven, if vinegar-soaked limestone is heated enough, it crumbles. The intense heat of his firebolts collapsed a section of wall. The Sisycenes toiled all night to repair the breach. Then, as if in admiration for their resolve and bravery, Plutarch claims that Sisychus was aided by female deities who appeared to oppose Mithridates in all his wars. A tremendous winter gale suddenly toppled all Mithridates' siege towers. Inside the city it was time for the annual sacrifice to Persephone, protector of Sisychus. 
A ritual called for a black heifer, but the herds were in pastures across the water. Miraculously, a black heifer swam over to the city. Then Persephone herself appeared, urging her people to be resolute against the Pontic Trumpeter, Spirit's sword in Sisychus. Spirits plunged in the camp of Mithridates. Was he always fated to incur the wrath of goddesses? His friends and advisers strongly counseled a retreat from Sisychus, obviously under the protection of very powerful deities or magicians. But the king had received some good news. In Italy, a gladiator named Spartacus had gathered an army of six hundred slaves, which eventually swelled to seventy thousand and defeated a series of Roman legions. Spartacus was said to be Thracian. He may have belonged to a tribe allied with Mithridates. Spartacus sympathized with and apparently planned to join Sertorius's rebellion. He may have seen military action in Greece when Sulla defeated Mithridates there. In the pantheon of Rome's three most dangerous enemies, Spartacus stood alongside Hannibal and Mithridates. Notably, both Plutarch and Appian wrote admiringly of Spartacus's military skill and his humane ideals. The news of Spartacus's victories against Rome encouraged Mithridates. He'd lost his ally Sertorius in Spain, but now the Romans faced a formidable foe on Italian soil. In another piece of cheering news, Mithridates learned that his general, Eumachus, former satrap of Galatia, was victorious in southern Anatolia, killing a great many Romans there along with their families. Yet Mithridates desperately needed to succeed here in Bithynia before supplies ran out. He stubbornly devised an ambitious strategy. All winter his sappers dug tunnels under the city walls, and his soldiers constructed an enormous ramp out from Mount Dindymus, ominously for Mithridates, a mountain sacred to Sibylle. New siege towers were built all along this mound. Provisions dwindled. Winter storms prevented ships from bringing Mithridates great stores of grain around the Black Sea. Some of his famished soldiers looking for food were captured by Lucullus, who slyly asked each man how much food was left in his cohort's tents. From their replies, Lucullus calculated that Mithridates would run out very soon. Exulting that his strategy of kicking Mithridates in the stomach was working, Lucullus promised his impatient troops, whining for loot, that they would be victorious without bloodshed. Mithridates' generals tried to keep him in the dark about the specter of starvation. But the king soon learned the truth. He was appalled to discover his soldiers eating weeds, pack camels and mules, and even dead comrades. Plague had arisen from hundreds of unburied corpses, killing as many as the famine. There was no grass for the starving horses. Mithridates decided to send his entire cavalry on a roundabout route over the mountains for the winter. The horses, pack mules and shaggy Bactrian camels, were accompanied by a large contingent of wounded and sick soldiers— in freezing weather, the weak men and animals struggled through ice and snow. Lucullus pursued them with five thousand men and cavalry. A blizzard struck. Many Romans fell behind with frostbite, but Lucullus forged on and attacked Mithridates' limping cavalry at the river Rindicus. Many were slain in the snow, and Lucullus captured fifteen thousand of Mithridates' men, six thousand horses and the beasts of burden. For many of the Roman soldiers, this was their first sight of two humped camels imported from distant Bactria to the snows of Bithynia. Lucullus deliberately marched this long train of feeble prisoners and animals before the eyes of Mithridates' demoralized men. That humiliating spectacle was compounded by more bad tidings. Galatia hated Mithridates for murdering their leading families, and now the Galatian army, allied with Rome, had driven Mithridates' general Eumachus out of southern Anatolia. The Cyzacenes still had plenty of grain, which they had cleverly preserved from spoilage by mixing it with calcitic earth, lime carbonate. Lucullus sent some Roman soldiers into the city to dig a counter-tunnel. They managed to trick Mithridates himself into entering his own tunnel. A Roman centurion inside Sisychus sent a message to the king, promising to betray the city. That Mithridates actually agreed to meet this man in the tunnel reveals his desperation at this point, as well as his personal courage. Mithridates went down alone into the subterranean passage. 
As he cautiously approached the shadowy figure, the Roman suddenly rushed forward with his sword. Mithridates turned and dove behind the tunnel's door, slamming it shut in the nick of time. The Scissorcedes rejoiced when yet another winter storm struck. The wind tossed up immense waves, and Mithridates' new siege towers began to creak and sway. Suddenly, a gust of wind burst forth with incredible fury, shattering the towers. In nearby Ilium, ancient Troy, where the statue of Athena still stood after Fimbria's sacking, it was reported that an apparition of Athena had appeared. The goddess, panting and disheveled, had just come from saving Sisychus. Centuries later, Plutarch read all about the goddess's marvelous manifestation on a marble inscription in Ilium. Vengeful goddesses, treacherous weather, awful reversals of fortune, the irritating fortitude of Sisychus, dreadful plague and famine combined with Lucullus's constant pressure convinced Mithridates that he had no choice but to withdraw. Ironically, he had a fantastic amount of gold in his camp, but no food. As a last resort, Mithridates directed his admiral, Aristonicus, to sail with a shipload of ten thousand pieces of gold. The idea was to bribe loot-hungry Romans with the gold while distracting Lucullus so Mithridates and his army could escape. But someone betrayed the plan to Lucullus. The Romans captured all the gold before the ship even set sail. Mithridates' situation was dire indeed. Poison Pills Mithridates abandoned the siege of Sisychus. He sneaked out to his ships at night and sailed with his navy to the Hellespont, while his infantry marched overland by night. Many drowned trying to cross a river flooded with heavy snows. Lucullus set out in pursuit and slaughtered about twenty thousand men and took a great many prisoners. The survivors plodded on and took refuge in Lampsacus. Lucullus set up a siege there, but Mithridates sent a pirate fleet to rescue his soldiers and the entire population of Lampsacus. Lucullus was left besieging a ghost town. Mithridates sailed for Nicomedia, leaving fifty ships in the Hellespont with ten thousand of his best soldiers under the command of three generals, the one-eyed Roman Hemvarius, Alexander of Paphlagonia, and Dionysus the eunuch. Yet another winter storm swept across Bithynia. Many of Mithridates' naval divisions perished at sea. Lucullus hurried back to Sisychus to accept the victor's laurel wreath, then returned to the Hellespont to raise a fleet. To mop up his victory, he divided his forces among several officers. One, Voconius, was directed to sail east to Nicomedia to defeat Mithridates. The others subdued Bithynian cities. In these places, Appian and Memnon report that the Roman armies not only fought each other over booty, but they butchered a great many people inside temples where they had sought refuge, replaying the dreadful scenes of the massacre of Roman civilians in 88 B.C. Ships full of plunder, including a golden statue of Hercules, set sail for Rome, but many, massively overloaded, sank in the Black Sea winter storms. Near Troy, Lucullus decided to pitch his tent inside the sanctuary of Aphrodite. Goddesses had been good to him. One night Aphrodite appeared in a dream, shaking him awake. Why are you sleeping, great lion? The deer are in reach. Lucullus hopped out of bed and discovered that messengers had arrived in the night. Thirteen of Mithridates' warships had been sighted in the Aegean, going to join the rest of Mithridates' fleet, commanded by Varius, Alexander the Paphlagonian, and Dionysus the eunuch at Lesbos. The Romans believed that Mithridates' navy was poised to sail across the Mediterranean to attack Italy. Lucullus's fleet pursued the three generals, but the latter drew their bronze-proud warships up onto the beach of a small island off Lesbos. Frustrated, Lucullus sailed behind the island and sent soldiers ashore. They hiked across the island to attack the entrenched enemy from the rear. With this clever pincer movement, Lucullus trapped Mithridates' men. Some remained ashore inside their beached ships to fight the Romans on both fronts. Others tried to set sail. They were surrounded and slaughtered. The survivors fled inland. Lucullus ordered his troops spare any soldier missing an eye. According to Plutarch, Lucullus wanted to capture Varius alive so that he could personally inflict a degrading death 
upon the Roman senator who had supported Marius and served Sertorius and then Mithridates. Lucullus's men discovered Varius hiding with Dionysus the eunuch and Alexander the Paphlagonian in a cave. Mithridates always supplied his commanders with poison for this kind of emergency. At the approach of the Romans, the eunuch broke open his capsule, gulped down the bitter poison, and died immediately. Alexander and Varius were taken prisoner. Lucullus kept Alexander alive to be paraded as a trophy in his triumph. The Senate awarded a formal triumph if a commander had killed at least five thousand enemies in a single action in a foreign war. Hundreds of thousands of Romans would come to gawk at the defeated barbarians and their families wearing their native dress and in chains, trudging behind elaborate tableaux illustrating major battles and events in the campaign, and cartloads of weapons, armor, and other spoils. At the end of the parade, captives could be imprisoned, sold as slaves, freed, or strangled before the statue of Mars, god of war. According to Appian, Lucullus immediately tortured and killed Varius on the island, claiming that it would be unseemly to parade a Roman senator in a triumph. According to Plutarch's sources, Mithridates' losses were devastating. In his first campaign against Lucullus, nearly all 300,000 of Mithridates' land forces and camp followers were killed or taken prisoner. Memnon says 13,000 were captured. Lucullus sent an official communique wreathed in laurel leaves, signifying a great victory to the Senate in Rome. His letter brought great relief, since it was feared that Mithridates had intended to invade Italy by sea. Lucullus set sail for Nicomedia, where he expected to find the wild beast of Pontus cornered by his officer Voconius. Lucullus looked forward to personally capturing Mithridates alive for his triumph. But his confidence was misplaced. His man, Voconius, had taken a detour for personal reasons. Instead of going after Mithridates at Nicomedia, Voconius had sailed off to Samothrace, where he was busy celebrating his initiation into a sailor's mystery cult. Gnashing his teeth, Lucullus discovered that his prey had already departed Nicomedia, sailing for Pontus with his surviving ships. The war Lucullus had declared over was still on. Pirates to the Rescue Weather and goddesses turned against Mithridates yet again. Another severe storm raged across the Black Sea. Everyone said this tempest was sent by the goddess Artemis. She was enraged because some of Mithridates' pirates had plundered her shrine at Priapus, a place renowned for excellent wine and all manner of lewd and lascivious activities. The pirates had parted there on their way to rescue the soldiers and people of Lampsacus described above. Now high winds and towering waves destroyed about sixty of Mithridates' ships. For many days afterward, the sea tossed up wreckage and nearly ten thousand bloated, battered corpses onto the shore. At the height of this storm, Mithridates' own ship, weighed down with royal equipment and treasure, was damaged, swamped by cresting waves. It began to sink. A light brigantine drew alongside. It was manned by pirates. Admiral Seleucus of Cilicia had come to rescue the king. Mithridates' companions, fearing the buccaneers' motives, urged the king not to abandon ship. But Mithridates and Seleucus were old friends. He respected the pirate seamanship. Their craft were fast and seaworthy. Mithridates daringly leaped overboard onto the heaving deck of the small cruiser, entrusting his life to the pirates. They disappeared into the teeth of the howling storm. His companions expected never to see Mithridates alive again. Against all odds, Mithridates and his pirate rescuers made it to Heraclea. Some friends there distracted the citizens with a sumptuous feast outside the city, while Mithridates, Seleucus, and his pirates sneaked in. The next morning, the king assembled the populace, greeted them cheerfully as their liberator, and distributed gold and silver coins to everyone. Leaving a garrison of four thousand men, with his Galatian commander Conochorix at Heraclea, Mithridates and his pirates sailed away through rough seas and foul weather home to Sinope. From Sinope, Mithridates sailed on to Amisus. Taking stock there, reflecting on his miraculous multiple narrow escapes from the jaws of death, Mithridates remained optimistic. The situation was certainly perilous, 
but his subjects in Pontus were steadfast and willing to fight bravely against the Romans. What would Lucullus do now? Would he withdraw, assuming he had neutralized Mithridates, or would he pursue and invade Pontus? As usual, Mithridates intended to cover all contingencies. Mithridates couldn't allow his extended family and harem to fall into Roman hands. It was intolerable to think of the terror, rape, and torture they would suffer before being dragged to Rome and killed in the wolf's den. Several of his children were already safe in the Bosporan kingdom. Other members of the royal family, including his sister Nyssa, were confined to the towers of Cabira. His lover, Stratonice, and son, Zephyres, were also in Cabira. Tripatina, Mithridates' doting daughter with double teeth, was the lady of Laodicea. She now moved for safety to the fort at Cynera, accompanied by Menophilus, a trusted eunuch doctor. Mithridates decided to send the rest of his royal household to a fortress in Pharnacia, on the rugged east coast of Pontus, the land of his old allies, the Turret folk. Eunuchs accompanied this caravan, which included the two spinster sisters Roxana and Statyra, Queen Monomy and the Chian concubine Berenice and her mother. Descending into his secret vaults at Sinope, Mithridates filled a chest with a large quantity of gold and precious gifts. He ordered a courtier to deliver this treasure to his allies in Scythia in exchange for more aid. But, unbeknownst to the king, this man was more of an opportunist than an optimist. He defected and delivered the treasure to Lucullus. Undeterred, the king sent messengers to his son Macares, viceroy of the Bosporus, and to his son-in-law Tigranes, requesting assistance. Mithridates placed the city of Amysus under the command of his master of siegecraft Callimachus. With his friend Doraleus, the Megas Hermias, a Greek Bactrian name, and the rest of his inner circle, Mithridates traveled to his stronghold at Cabira for the winter of 72 to 71 BC. From this secure base, he and Doraleus raised a new army, bringing together about 40,000 foot soldiers and 4,000 cavalry. Most modern historians assume that neither Macares nor Tigranes replied to Mithridates' urgent messages. But these new reinforcements surely came from Scythia and Armenia. According to Memnon, Macares did intend to send grain and supplies to Sinope, and Mithridates' daughter Cleopatra convinced Tigranes to help her father. Some reinforcements went to defend Amysus and Sinope. Mithridates also stationed garrisons and scouts along the routes to Cabira to watch for Lucullus's approach in spring. He placed Phoenix, his son by a Phoenician concubine in command, with orders to relay fire beacons from the borders to Cabira to signal Roman troop movements. Lucullus was in a jam. He had officially and prematurely declared victory over Rome's most feared enemy, and then let Mithridates slip away. Meanwhile, the detestable Pompey not only had smashed the insurgency in Spain, but took, many said unfairly, all the credit for putting down the great slave uprising in Italy. Spartacus was killed, and six thousand of his followers were crucified on the Appian Way. For very different reasons, this dramatic news dismayed both Mithridates and Lucullus. Mithridates had lost an important political ally in Italy. Lucullus's rival Pompey was now ascendant in power. Lucullus's own supplies were running very low. Morale in his legions was rocky. The soldiers carped at the lack of looting opportunities. Many in Lucullus's command urged him to abandon the war. Lucullus ignored their advice. Realizing that the only way to stop Mithridates was to kill him, Lucullus ordered his army to invade Pontus just as Mithridates had anticipated. To do this, Lucullus had to hire thirty thousand Galatians. Each of these human beasts of burden lugged a bushel of wheat on his shoulders, slogging along behind the Roman legions. Invasions of Pontus As the Romans crossed into western Pontus, they found untold wealth and abundance. Lucullus's soldiers seized so much booty and so many prisoners that the glut drastically devalued everything. The price of a male slave dropped to four drachmas, and an ox sold for one drachma, a soldier's daily wage. As they marched across Mithridates' land of plenty, the soldiers who had howled for booty now abandoned or destroyed their worthless loot and captives. 
Lucullus left troops to besiege Amisus and Eupatoria, and sent another legion to besiege Themiscra, a remote castle on the river Thermodon, one of the fabled lands of Amazon horsewomen. Mithridates had sent men and weapons to these cities. At Amisus, the defenders constantly raided the Roman camp and even provoked the legionnaires into single combat, as if they were re-enacting the glorious duels of Homer's champions on the fields of Troy. At Themiscra, named for an Amazon queen, the Romans toiled underground digging tunnels so large that great subterranean battles were fought in them. But Lucullus's men abandoned the siege after the defenders resorted to wildly unconventional tactics. They tossed hives of furious bees into the tunnels. Then, while the frantic Romans flailed at the stinging swarms, the ingenious Themiscrians released wild beasts, weasels, foxes, wolves, boars, and bears into the underground passages. While these Romans contended with Mithridates' stalwart, resourceful subjects, Lucullus himself led most of his legions on a wandering course around the Pontic countryside that fall and winter. Leaving rich and sophisticated western Pontus far behind, they entered the territory of rustic tribes, like the Calabes and Tiberini. Ironically, Lucullus had no idea that this wild landscape hid more than seventy secret fortresses and secret treasuries built by Bithridates. Lucullus busied his men raiding tiny villages and ravaging orchards. A gourmand, Lucullus was enchanted by the luscious red fruits of Ceresian, city of cherries. Cherries were unknown in Italy. Carefully stashing away the pits from his repasts, Lucullus also dug up several cherry saplings to bring back to Rome. Perhaps he was emulating Alexander the Great, who had introduced the Armenian apricot tree to Greece. In the opinion of his impatient men and officers, however, Lucullus seemed to have completely lost focus, coddling trees and ordering useless raids. They agitated anew for battle and loot. We haven't taken a single city by storm. Why are we wasting time raiding these worthless villages of poor tribes? When will we enrich ourselves with plunder? Why are we leaving Mithridates, wealthy city of Amisus, behind? Why should we follow our feckless general into the wilderness while our greatest enemy rebuilds his army? That's exactly why we are lingering here, Lucullus retorted in a speech to his army justifying his strategy of delay. I am waiting for Mithridates to become powerful again. I want him to gather up a force that will be worth our while to fight, and so that he will stand his ground at Kabira instead of fleeing again. Don't you see that he has a vast and trackless wilderness to fall back on? The Caucasus Mountains could hide ten thousand wily enemy kings like Mithridates. Lucullus remembered the advantages enjoyed by Jugurtha and his son-in-law Bacchus, who repeatedly vanished into the North African hinterlands and surged back with new forces. His warning about Mithridates' ability to disappear into the Caucasus was more prescient than he knew. Lucullus also raised the daunting image of Tigranes' vast hordes. Only a few days' ride from Kabira lies Armenia, ruled by Tigranes, king of kings, Mithridates' son-in-law. Tigranes rules such armies that he levels cities and transplants entire populations, subduing Parthia, Syria, Media, Palestine, murdering the rightful rulers, and ravishing their wives and daughters. Tigranes is eager to make war on Rome. If we drive Mithridates into his arms, then we'll have to fight Tigranes the Great and his Medes and Armenians. No, declared Lucullus, we'll give Mithridates the time to gather up his own motley forces and muster up fresh courage. Then we'll crush him forever at Kabira. Lucullus was an able and fair commander, trying to stave off a strike by his men, most of them landless, homesick legionnaires seeking riches and glory, exhausted by years of duty in Anatolia since the First Mithridatic War. As Plutarch foreshadowed, Lucullus, a Roman aristocrat who lacked rapport with a common soldier, underestimated his men's grievances, never dreaming that their resentment and insubordination would later send them to commit acts of madness and mutiny. The Battle for Kabira In spring, Lucullus finally marched on Kabira. Warned by the fire signals sent by his son Phoenix from the watchtowers, Mithridates himself led four thousand cavalry to meet Lucullus. His fierce horsemen, Scythian nomads, sent the Romans fleeing in terror. 
Lucullus's bravest cavalry officer was captured. He was taken to Mithridates' tent, grimacing in pain from several arrow wounds. "'Will you be my friend if I spare your life?' asked Mithridates, smiling encouragingly. "'Only if you surrender to Rome,' the soldier shot back. "'Otherwise I remain your foe.' The king admired the Roman spirit and spared his life. Phoenix, Mithridates' son by a courtesan, was torn between filial loyalty and fear of defeat. Phoenix dutifully relayed signals to warn his father of Lucullus's approach, but then deserted to the Romans, bringing along his scouts. Lucullus was stymied, however. How to avoid Mithridates' superior cavalry? There was no way to sneak up on impregnable Cabira, defended by mountains and thick forests. Luck was with Lucullus. His men happened to capture two Greek huntsmen. They agreed to guide the Romans up a mountain trail to a stronghold overlooking Cabira. At nightfall, Lucullus lit all his campfires as a ruse. Then he and his army followed the hunters up switchbacks and over a deep ravine by an arched stone bridge, its foundations still exist. Lucullus set up camp by dawn with a view of Mithridates' camp at Cabira, just out of reach. Stalemate. Neither commander dared to risk outright battle. One day Mithridates' men went hunting. Chasing a stag, they were cut off by some Roman horsemen. Watching from their camp high above the skirmish, Lucullus's men cheered. But Mithridates' reinforcements arrived and routed the outnumbered Romans. Lucullus bravely rode down to the plain alone and ordered his fleeing cavalrymen to wheel around and attack Mithridates' force. His disciplined audacity won the day. In another battle at Cabira, Lucullus's men were winning. This time it was Mithridates in gleaming armor who leaped on his white horse, galloped out alone, and rallied his men. The king, remarkably fit and courageous for a man over sixty, led a formidable cavalry charge, sending the terrified Roman army crashing through the trees up the mountainside. Mithridates sent messengers throughout the land, proudly announcing this impressive victory over the Romans. His spies reported that Lucullus, low on supplies, had sent out ten cohorts, about five thousand men, to Cappadocia to get grain. Here was a chance for Mithridates to stomp on the Roman belly, as Lucullus had done to him at Sisychus. Mithridates dispatched Menander to intercept Lucullus's convoys returning from Cappadocia. Constant battle stress and inconclusive outcomes were beginning to fray nerves, interfering with judgment. Menander's advance cavalry caught the Roman supply train marching single file down a steep trail into Pontus. But Menander was too impatient to wait until they reached the open plain. His cavalry horses slipped on the rocky trail, and the Roman foot soldiers were able to force the men and horses over the cliff. A few cavalry reached Mithridates' camp before the others. They exaggerated the calamity into a disaster of great magnitude, claiming they were the sole survivors. As Appian remarked, the losses were large but not overwhelming, yet the rumors whipped up fear in Mithridates' camp. Mithridates remained steady. He sent out another large force to cut off another of Lucullus's returning convoys, led by Adrian. But Mithridates' forces really were annihilated this time. According to Plutarch, only two survivors returned to Cabira. Mithridates tried to hide the extent of this true catastrophe. Plutarch says he blamed this slight setback on the inexperience of his generals, but when Adrian marched back pompously past Mithridates' camp, showing off hundreds of wagons groaning with grain and the armor and weapons of Mithridates' dead cavalrymen, everyone in Cabira, already tense, learned the terrible truth. Finally, after this string of disasters, including the loss of his navy, Mithridates' optimism deserted him. A great despair fell upon the king, reported Plutarch, and his soldiers were seized by confusion and helpless fear. As soon as Lucullus received the news of Adrian's victory, he would attack Cabira. That night, Mithridates called his close companions Dorylaus, the Megas Hermias, eunuch advisers Bacchides, and Ptolemaeus and his generals to his tent. All agreed that flight was the only option. The plan was to meet at Carmina, the rich fortified town of the Temple of Love, and then seek refuge in Armenia with Tigranes. Before dawn each man hastily packed his own baggage on horses outside the gates and helped to load a mule train with bag upon bag of gold, royal regalia, and treasure. 
I imagine that Mithridates followed the practical advice of his old friend, King Perisides of the Bosporus. Always wear your finest costume to address your soldiers, but when it is necessary to flee, put on commoner's clothing to conceal your identity from the enemy as well as your subjects. Changing from royal garb into nondescript apparel for the flight, Mithridates concealed his daggers and essential drugs under his clothes. He had one final task before daylight. As Appian tells us, in utter despair for his kingdom, Mithridates assigned the eunuch Bacchides to carry out a terrible mission. The eunuch was to ride to the castle at Pharnacia. There he was to put to death the royal harem before the Romans could find them. Mithridates planned to give the general order for retreat at daybreak, but his frightened soldiers heard the commotion in the night and jumped to the conclusion that their high command was abandoning them. Panic raced through the camp. Fear mingled with rage scattered soldiers helter-skelter in the dark. In the chaos, the men attacked their own baggage trains. Mithridates dashed out of his tent and ran among his soldiers, shouting and pleading for calm in every dialect he knew. His second-in-command, Dorilaeus, throwing on his purple robe, rushed out to join the king in the tumult. They tried to reassure the crowd that they weren't abandoning them, that all would depart together at daylight. But no one could hear the king's words in the mad crush. He and Dorilaeus were separated. Hermias, the royal seer, was one of those trampled to death by the mob at the gates. And Mithridates? The king was swept up, alone and on foot, in the torrent borne along by the crowd, surging out onto the dark road to Comana. Without his diadem and finery, Mithridates was an anonymous figure in the fleeing throng. Far behind, at the gates of Kabira, desperate soldiers were still pillaging the baggage train of the king's friends. Some seized fine horses, while others murdered for an officer's fancy dagger, another man's glittering rings, or someone's money belt of gold. It was in this frenzy that Dorilaeus, Mithridates' steadfast companion since their childhood and years in exile, met his end. Dorilaeus was stabbed to death by one of his own men for the possession of his purple cloak. When Lucullus received the news of Mithridates' flight, he sent his cavalry to pursue the fugitives. Strict orders, the king was to be captured alive, along with his private papers. Lucullus himself led his infantry to take Kabira. As they surrounded the city, still a scene of confusion and hysteria, Lucullus ordered the legionnaires to refrain from killing anyone and to hold off looting until they could impose order. But the men, extremely resentful at having been starved of loot for two years and contemptuous of their leader's restraint, refused to listen. Dazzled by the eye-popping riches of Kabira, silver vessels, jewelry and gems, royal ornaments and exquisite purple and gilt-embroidered garments, the Romans snatched up whatever spoils they could carry. They set about killing indiscriminately. Lucullus stood by, powerless to stop them. At last, while his exhausted legionnaires slept, cradling their treasures, Lucullus investigated the desolate palace, castles, and towers of Kabira. He found even more treasure stored in vaults. He also found dungeons. Breaking the locks, he discovered many relatives of Mithridates long given up for dead. Plutarch described their release as more of a resurrection than a rescue. Among these wretched souls was Nyssa, Mithridates' younger sister. For nearly forty years since she was a little girl, Nyssa had been hidden away so that she could never marry. Nyssa joined Mithridates' captive general Alexander to be paraded later in Lucullus' triumph. No records explain exactly how Stratonice and her son Zipheres escaped, but somehow they reached the secret stronghold of Kynon Corion, undetected by Lucullus. While Lucullus took possession of Kabira, Bacchides arrived in Pharnacia to carry out his grim duty. He was the perfect choice. Strabo described this eunuch as a ruthless paranoid, always suspecting treachery. Bacchides enlisted the help of the other eunuchs to execute Mithridates' family in the most expedient ways at hand to prevent their capture by a mob of Roman soldiers. Detailed descriptions of that harrowing night were related by Plutarch, who had access to the accounts of witnesses who were later captured or deserted to the Romans. The scene, in all its poignant horror, has inspired artists, composers, poets, and playwrights to imagine the tragedy. Among the women at Pharnacia were young Berenice and her mother, 
rescued from their enslaved island of Chios, only to die now on the stormy shores of the Black Sea. Monomy, the intelligent Greek beauty who had resisted Mithridates' gold, holding out for the diadem and title of queen, was also in Pharnacia. Plutarch wrote, Bacchides ordered them all to die, in whatever manner each woman deemed easiest and most painless. The eunuch's inner thoughts are unknowable as he stood there with his dagger in one hand and a chalice of poison in the other, but the last words of some of the women were recorded for posterity. Monomy bewailed her unhappy marriage. Tearing off the purple ribbon that decorated her hair, she twisted it in her hands, sobbing, I traded my freedom and beauty for captivity, surrounded by barbarian eunuchs. Mithridates, she claimed, had once promised to take her to Greece, where she had hoped to find happiness. All the blessings I yearn for are nothing but dreams. Monomy knotted the diadem around her neck and hanged herself from the rafters, but the ribbon snapped. Clutching the frayed ends in her fist, she screamed, You cursed bauble, you have never been any use to me, not even for hanging. She spit on the diadem, hurling it away. Monomy bared her throat to Bacchides' knife. Berenice took the cup of poison. As she lifted it to her lips, her mother cried out, begging to share the same cup. Together they drank the poison, the daughter making certain that her mother drank more. The dose killed the older woman immediately, but Berenice was young and strong. As Berenice was long in dying, and Bacchides was in a hurry, writes Plutarch, the eunuch strangled her. Mithridates' two unmarried sisters, Roxana and Statyra, in their forties, were next. Both chose poison. Like Monomy, Roxana was embittered, heaping curses upon her brother. But Statyra drank calmly from her cup, without uttering a single reproach. Instead, Statyra asked Bacchides to convey her thanks to her brother, for even when his own life was in danger, she declared he had not neglected his sisters and concubines. She praised Mithridates for ensuring that they would not suffer at the hands of the Romans, but would die in Eleutheria. Freedom. Chapter 13 Renegade Kings When we last saw Mithridates, he was swept away by a desperate mob fleeing Kabira. The ancient sources tell us what happened next, but we can only imagine the king's emotions. No doubt his mind was replaying an anguished panorama of his disasters on land and on sea. Anxiety for his companions and kingdom mingled with images of the deaths he himself had ordered for his family, queen, lovers, children. But there could be no doubt that Mithridates also forced himself to think ahead, to calculate options for survival. If only he had a horse. Suddenly he hears a familiar voice, shouting his name, addressing him as king. Across the sea of fugitives, he spies Ptolemaeus, one of his eunuch advisers, with other friends on horseback, leading mules loaded with a royal treasure. The eunuch offers his mount to the king. After hurried words, Mithridates and his companions spur their horses toward Comina. The Roman cavalry is in hot pursuit. An advance party of Lucullus's Galatians catches up with them. It looks like curtains for Rome's elusive foe. But Mithridates whips out his dagger and leans down to slash open the bags on the back of the nearest mule. A cascade of golden coins pours out. While the squabbling Galatians gather up the trail of gold in the road, Mithridates escapes. These greedy soldiers cheated Lucullus out of capturing his prize quarry, the great adversary whom the Romans had chased for nearly twenty years of hardship and danger. The story of how Mithridates finessed his narrow escape by dazzling his pursuers with gold was retold often in Rome. The incident seemed to confirm the sense that Lucullus's campaign was more about robbing Mithridates' riches than crushing the mortal enemy of Rome. In the Senate, Cicero compared the king's ploy of scattering gold to the famous escape of the witch Medea, who scattered the severed limbs of her victims to distract her pursuers. Yet another group of soldiers disobeyed Lucullus's orders to bring Mithridates' personal secretary back alive. Callistratus was carrying Mithridates' private papers, a highly desirable prize. Roman soldiers did capture Callistratus, but then killed him in a melee over his money belt stuffed with five hundred gold coins. The king's blood-stained private papers were carelessly flung away, never to be recovered. Was the secret formula for the Mithridatium among them? 
Meanwhile, the fugitives from Kabira reached Kamana, the Temple of Love, where Mithridates had tarried with Dorylaeus and his friends so long ago. They were joined by about two thousand cavalry. Mithridates' little party included key players, General Taxiles and other officers, field medic Timotheus, and the Agarai shamans. Taking on supplies, the fugitives rode to Talora, where Mithridates had stashed heirlooms and gold. Then they made their way over mountain passes toward Armenia. With the Pontic navy no longer supreme in the Black Sea, and his army destroyed amid mounting defections, Mithridates had to expect his son Macarius to make a deal with the Romans. His only hope for personal survival lay with Tigranes, who would surely shelter his father-in-law. But could Mithridates somehow also convince Tigranes, now the most formidable bulwark against Roman rule in the east, to help him regain his kingdom? Lucullus and his army arrived four days later at Tolora. Too late. The Roman commander absorbed the dismal news. His prey had escaped yet again. Mithridates and two thousand horsemen had already slipped over the frontier into Armenia, ruled by the all-powerful Tigranes and his barbarian hordes. Plenty of plunder? No prey. In 70 BC, Lucullus completely lost track of his quarry. When he learned that Mithridates had also deprived him of capturing the royal family alive, Lucullus expressed sorrow for the loss of innocent lives. Historians portray Lucullus as humane, but he also regretted the loss of trophies to show off in Rome. Now, capturing or killing Mithridates was the missing capstone of his mission. Lucullus dispatched a stolid young officer named Appius to demand that King Tigranes turn over the fugitive war criminal. Lucullus continued taking over Pontic strongholds and besieging cities faithful to Mithridates. The historian Strabo's grandfather was a local Pontic leader, overseeing fifteen forts. But because Mithridates had executed some kinfolk for treason, Strabo's grandfather decided to surrender the forts to Lucullus. That was a mistake, Strabo reported. Not only did the Romans renege on the promised rewards, but after Lucullus returned to Rome, his successor, Pompey, actually arrested Strabo's grandfather and other relatives as enemy combatants. Thanks to Callimachus's counter-siege machines, Amisus fought off the Romans for a long time. In the end, Callimachus set fire to the city before escaping by sea. As the flames enveloped the walls, Lucullus desperately begged his troops to save the beautiful city before looting it, but the soldiers shouted him down, clashing their shields and banging their spears, baying for booty. They rushed in to pillage and slaughter all night, setting more fires with torches. Just before dawn, a cold rain doused the fires, but the destruction was total. At daybreak, Lucullus viewed the ruins and burst into tears. Callimachus had deprived him of an opportunity to make a grand gesture of mercy. Lucullus devoted himself to rebuilding Amisus. Alexander the Great had restored the town's democracy when he liberated it from Persia, and Mithridates was not the only leader in this era who strove to emulate Alexander. Lucullus, a Philhellene, deliberately invoked Alexander's gesture, claiming he had liberated the destroyed city from Mithridates. In Sinope, Mithridates had left a eunuch and a pirate in command. They were an unlikely pair. Bacchides had saved the royal consorts from fate worse than death, and Seleucus of Cilicia had rescued Mithridates in the storm. They vigorously resisted the Romans, although at one point Seleucus considered killing the citizens and handing the city over to Lucullus for a reward. When it became obvious that Sinope would fall, Bacchides and Seleucus burned all their warships, crammed treasure into a few pirate biremes, and sailed to Colchis. Lucullus was able to save Sinope from total destruction by his loot-crazed men, but they killed more than eight thousand Sinopeans. Lucullus personally plundered Mithridates' most valuable possessions, including his great library, masterpieces of art, and scientific instruments. Two outstanding trophies were singled out by Strabo. One was the statue of the city's founder, Autolycus the Argonaut. The Sinopeans had tried to protect it by swathing it in linen, but the Romans found the bundle abandoned on the seashore. The other prize was an object taken from Mithridates' palace, the Globe of Bilarus. 
This astronomical globe or sphere, terms used for mechanized planetariums, was not described by Strabo, but there is reason to believe that it was an invention of renown. Mithridates had a keen interest in technology and collected precious things. Italian historian Attilio Mastro Cinque proposes an intriguing theory. Could the globe of Bilaris be the mysterious Antikythera device, the oldest complex scientific instrument ever discovered? This intricate gear-driven bronze mechanism, the world's first computer, was recovered in 1901 by sponge divers from a Roman shipwreck near Antikythera, an island north of Crete. The 300-ton ship sank between 70 and 60 B.C. on the way to Italy crammed with plunder from the Third Mithridatic War. The divers also brought up superb marble and bronze statues, jewelry, datable coins, and an ornate bronze throne, all treasures looted from defeated Anatolian cities allied with Mithridates, perhaps including Sinope. The strange bronze instrument apparently belonged to Mithridates, or someone in his circle. In 2008, advanced technology deciphered the Antikythera device's complex workings and revealed inscriptions. The device's sophistication is astounding. It calculated the precise movements of celestial bodies, a particular concern for the Magi and Mithridates. The newfound inscription suggests that the device was created in 150 to 100 B.C. in, or by a scientist associated with, Syracuse or Alexandria, places linked to the famous scientist Archimedes. A similar but older celestial globe invented by Archimedes himself was looted from Syracuse by the Romans in 212 B.C. Scholars who study the Antikythera device are puzzled. How did this amazing instrument in the Archimedean tradition come to be among Mithridatic treasures seized by Romans? They assume that the device must have belonged to a pro-Roman Greek living in Rhodes. But Mastro Cinque's idea that the Antikythera device could be the lost globe of Bilaris taken by Lucullus from Sidopi is persuasive. As we know, Mithridates befriended leading scientists and had an interest in technology. Mastro Cinque argues convincingly that the Bilaris sphere was an astronomical instrument, and he notes that it was never mentioned again after Strabo. It would be quite a coincidence if two rare and important celestial globes were lost in this same time period. It's not unreasonable to suppose that the Bilaris sphere from Sinope was on the Roman treasure ship lost at sea near Antikythera. If Mastro Cinque is right, Mithridates' passion for technology, Lucullus's cultivated eye for fabulous plunder, and a sponge diver's lucky find combined to give us a unique glimpse into a high point of ancient science. After the fall of Sinope, Mithridates' son Macares, viceroy of Bosporus and Scythia, sent Lucullus a golden crown worth one thousand gold pieces, a crystal-clear message that he wanted to be an official friend of Rome. According to Plutarch, this was the moment that convinced Lucullus that he had decisively completed the war with Mithridates. Yet Lucullus remained awkwardly at loose ends until his man, Appius, returned with Mithridates in tow. Lucullus set about reorganizing Pontus as a new Roman province of Asia. As we saw, Sulla's war penalty of twenty thousand talents had resulted in unspeakable and incredible misfortunes perpetrated by tax collectors who tortured and enslaved debtors. Even though the Anatolians had already paid more than forty thousand talents to the moneylenders because of sky-high interest rates, the outstanding public debt now totaled one hundred and twenty thousand talents, a staggering amount of silver. All the Roman sources praise Lucullus for his honest efforts to alleviate the tax burden and establish order in Anatolia. In 69 BC, still no word from Appius. Nevertheless, Lucullus celebrated his defeat of Mithridates with festivals, gladiator contests, and sacrifices. The only thing lacking was a humbled Mithridates in chains, the perpetrator of so many crimes against Rome and its allies. More than a year and a half had passed since Mithridates and Appius's search party had vanished into Armenia. Where could they be? Tigranes the Great Tigranes' devious guides had promised to conduct Appius to Antioch, Syria. 
For many months they led the Romans on a circuitous route. Finally, a former Syrian slave in Appius's party pointed out the direct route to Antioch. There, Appius was commanded to await the pleasure of the King of Kings, busy subduing Phoenicia. While he waited for a whole year, Appius met many vassals of Tigranes. They regaled him with tales of the breathtaking riches and haughty omnipotence of the monarch who conquered great nations and moved diverse peoples around the chessboard of the Middle East. At last, Shahan Shah Tigranes appeared in all his glory, clad in a red and white tunic, a purple mantle with gilt stars, and his comet-studded tiara riding a white horse with four vassals running alongside. As his bodyguards took their places on the dais, arms folded across their chests, the monarch arranged himself on his magnificent throne. Appius was summoned to the great hall. It was Tigranes' first audience with a Roman legate. Unimpressed by the grandeur and the majestic personage, Appius brusquely handed over the letter from Lucullus and stated his mission in plain and tactless language, probably Greek. Hail Tigranes, Lucullus! Imperator of the Roman army and governor of the province of Asia, has sent me to take charge of Mithridates, who is to be brought to Rome as our prisoner and as an ornament in our triumph. Surrender Mithridates now. If you do not, Rome will declare war on you. Plutarch's description is amusing. It must have been five and twenty years since His Majesty had heard such rude speech in his court. Tigranes made every effort to listen to Appius with a pleasant expression and forced smile. But all in attendance winced at the arrogant Roman who didn't even address Tigranes as king of kings. Everyone could sense Tigranes' rage. But Tigranes replied evenly, I will not surrender Mithridates. If the Romans begin a war, the king of kings will defend himself. You are dismissed. Appius prepared to depart. He was interrupted by Tigranes' servants, bearing heaps of splendid farewell gifts. Appius refused them. More arrived. Appius selected one simple silver bowl and marched off with all speed to join the imperator, Lucullus. Upon Appius's return with nothing but an empty silver bowl, Lucullus felt compelled to follow up on his own rash ultimatum. The war on Mithridates of Pontus that had begun back in 88 B.C., the war Lucullus had twice declared over and won, suddenly expanded into a reckless attack on a boundless region, in Plutarch's words. Driven by pride and seeking glory, Lucullus was now committed to an unlimited war over an unknown land stretching from the Caucasus to the Red Sea, from Antioch to Seleucia, a wilderness of deep rivers and nameless deserts and impassable mountains covered in perpetual snow, defended by untold thousands of nomad warriors from countless warlike tribes. Lucullus's soldiers, unruly in the best of times, were near rebellion when they heard the orders to advance into Tigranes' empire. Earlier, Lucullus had played on his men's terror of Tigranes' barbarian armies. Moreover, as Tigranes and Mithridates knew, Lucullus had no authority to expand his campaign beyond the Euphrates. Back in Rome, there was a great outcry in the Senate when the populars, accusing Lucullus of deliberately perpetuating a needless war in order to accrue personal power and profit. Lucullus was clearly the aggressor in this new campaign. Leaving his two least reliable legions, the defiant Fimbrians, to occupy Pontus, Lucullus marched into Armenia with twelve thousand infantrymen and about three thousand cavalry to confront Tigranes and arrest Mithridates. Whereabouts unknown. Fortress of Solitude We left Mithridates riding into Armenia with two thousand horsemen. Tigranes had arranged for Mithridates to stay on one of his hunting estates, ordering retainers to provide necessities and entertainments, cooks, thespians, musicians, fine Armenian wine, and dancing girls. With Mithridates' well-known love of history and literature, it's likely that a library of Greek classics was at hand. This long interlude, a year and eight months to be exact, in Armenia, was an important respite. Here in safety, Mithridates could mourn his devastating losses. But from what we know of his character, it wouldn't take him long to regain equilibrium. Hiding out in the mountain fastness might have evoked bittersweet memories of roaming Pontus with his friends in the anxious years after his father's assassination. 
as in the tales of his Greek and Persian ancestors, and myths in which heroes overcome incredible odds, adversity seemed to invigorate Mithridates. Lucullus appeared to be crashing and burning, but the danger remained. Sooner or later, the Romans would renew the war. How should he prepare? After the flight from Cabira in 70 BC, Mithridates returned to basic survival essentially following a mature version of his youthful exile, taking on a nomadic life, striking obliquely, eluding direct conflict. Come defeat or victory, Mithridates would remain on the move for the rest of his days, a decision that was both personal and militarily strategic. During nearly two years in Armenia, Mithridates and his advisers devised new tactics that would define the rest of his epic struggle with Rome. The new approach appears to have been partly inspired by classical history. Herodotus's and Xenophon's accounts of the conflicts between the Persian Empire and Scythia and later accounts of Alexander's cavalry innovations in Afghanistan. Jugurtha and Aristonicus had also practiced asymmetrical warfare against Romans. In the past, Mithridates had depended on set battles, sending his numerically superior formerly arrayed hoplite armies marching out onto a plain for pitched combat. In battles to come, light, flexible cavalry attacks would be the key. From now on, his military strategy would mirror his diplomatic strategies. He would probe for weakness, feint, jab, and withdraw, keeping the Romans confused, exhausted, impotent to strike back. Besides studying past mistakes and planning strategies, how did the fugitives from Pontus spend their days? We would expect Mithridates and his men to maintain top physical condition with military exercises and athletic contests. Another pastime may have been visits to Armenia's temples of love, similar to those in Pontus and Cappadocia. Scattered throughout Armenia, these idyllic sanctuaries were temporary dormitories for maidens, consecrated to the goddess Aeneatis Anahit for a year before marriage. Many of the young women came from wealthy families— According to Strabo, they selected sexual partners of equal rank and enjoyed giving the men valuable gifts. The dashing king Mithridates would have been warmly welcomed. Beavers abound in Armenia's lakes and streams. Perhaps their testicles contributed to Mithridates' celebrated vigor. Armenia's pastures provided grazing for horses, and Mithridates and his men could hunt stags, boars, lions, lynxes, bears, snow leopards, and fowl. The high plateaus held a profusion of herbs and wild flowers. In the short summers the mountain air was perfumed by sage, juniper, and honeysuckle-scented thistles called flowers of the sun sacred to Zoroastrians. Brilliant yellow irises dotted the mountain slopes, along with poisonous blue monkshood, the mysterious narcotic silphium, and a strange wormwood parasite, a lily-like blossom of velvet crimson. Another curious, highly toxic plant bore drooping bunches of dark red berries on a tall stalk. About ten percent of Armenia's thousands of plant species are now recognized by modern science as medicinal. Mithridates and his doctors would have been familiar with all these and more. Rich veins of gold ore and purple sandix, Armenian arsenic, lay in the mountains. As the seasons turned, we can imagine Mithridates and his agari gathering and testing novel ingredients for theriac. Plutarch claimed that Tigranes insulted Mithridates by shunting him off to a remote, inhospitable landscape, but the evidence indicates that the two kings enjoyed mutual esteem and rapport. They had been friends since their alliance in 94 BC. True, their political styles certainly differed. King Tigranes, about seventy, was an absolute autocrat, with little understanding of the Roman threat, while King Mithridates, about sixty-five, accommodated democratic traditions and had dealt with Rome for decades. Both men enjoyed extraordinary physical stamina and intellectual vitality all their long lives. Did Tigranes, as one of the king's friends, benefit from a daily dose of Mithridatium? Both rulers had been raised to carry out Persian fire rituals, and each believed that divine Mithraic comets had blessed their reigns. While Mithridates' appreciation for Greek culture ran deeper than Tigranes, they shared Persian culture, love of hunting, erudition, and grandiose ambitions. Moreover, their goals were compatible, and each man hated Rome as the dark force that opposed righteousness. 
Another strong link was Mithridates' daughter, Cleopatra. She was Tigranes' chosen queen and advisor, favored above all his concubines. A dependable military ally when called on, Tigranes was never enthusiastic about Mithridates' Roman wars, preferring to carve out his own empire beyond Rome's notice. Mithridates' empire was a useful buffer. Instead of snubbing Mithridates, Tigranes arranged for Mithridates' safety and comfort from afar without arousing Roman ire. Then he simply went about his own pressing business until Appius delivered Lucullus's insolent demand. Lucullus's ultimatum spurred Tigranes to meet personally with his father-in-law. Tigranes warmly welcomed Mithridates to his palace. The reunion with Queen Cleopatra carried special meaning, given the fates of so many of Mithridates' other children. The two monarchs spent three days together in private. No translators, no witnesses. Based on papers discovered after Mithridates' death, Plutarch speculated that their conversation revolved around casting blame on others. He pointed to the case of Metrodorus, the Rome-hater, long a favorite of Mithridates, who had been sent to request aid from Tigranes. Tigranes revealed that Metrodorus had urged him to honor the request, but then honestly acknowledged that it might not be in Armenia's best interest. The philosopher died mysteriously. Plutarch implies that Metrodorus may have been killed by Mithridates, whose unerring instinct for detecting betrayal had kept him alive for more than half a century. Kill the Messenger the two monarchs surely did compare notes about who could be trusted, but they also conversed about practical, urgent matters. Tigranes generously gave his old friend ten thousand expert Armenian cavalrymen. With renewed hope, Mithridates prepared to set off from his hunting lodge base camp for Pontus with his new army. Case closed, thought Tigranes. But then a messenger arrived, shouting that the Romans were coming. Before the man could catch his breath, the king of kings had him beheaded for disturbing the peace. As McKing pointed out, Tigranes reasonably thought such a report was false. He was confident that Lucullus was not authorized to invade Armenia. That was a logical assumption. But Lucullus was following his own irrational agenda, aggressively attacking Armenia because of Tigranes' refusal to surrender Mithridates. After Tigranes' execution of the messenger, no one else dared to inform him of Lucullus's approach. It's safe to assume that no one spoke either of the great earthquake that had recently destroyed several cities in Syria. The quake killed 170,000 people. Soothsayers were interpreting this as a sign that Tigranes would no longer rule Syria. Unlike Mithridates, who always sought out the freshest intelligence, however dire, the king of kings, commented Plutarch, sat in a cocoon of ignorance while the fires of war blazed around him. While Tigranes was camped with his army in the Taurus Mountains, Lucullus coaxed his grumbling army of fifteen to twenty thousand men across the Euphrates into Armenia. His target was Tigranositor, where Tigranes kept his concubines and other treasures. An attack there would compel Tigranes to fight, reckoned Lucullus, and after his defeat he would surrender Mithridates, and there'd be plenty of booty for the soldiers. Although the city was still under construction, Tigranosator's walls rose seventy feet high. A contingent of Romans dug in for a siege, while Lucullus camped on the plains across the Tigris. Finally, Tigranes' brave general, Mithra Barzanes, dared to inform His Majesty about the Roman invasion and threat to Tigranosator. Mithridates, at the hunting lodge, also received the startling news from his own spies. Mithridates immediately cancelled plans to recover his kingdom and turned back with his cavalry to help Tigranes. This was a thrilling, if daunting, new development. Here was a chance to crush the Romans, using Tigranes' great resources. Mithridates sent letters and messengers ahead to Tigranes, offering excellent advice based on his own failures and his new ideas for resisting legions. Do not fight the Romans head-on, he warned. Harass and surround them with your cavalry. Devastate the countryside to reduce them by exhaustion and famine. Mithridates sent General Taxiles ahead with the same advice. Stay defensive, avoid clashing directly with the invincible Romans. But Tigranes decided to attack head-on. It was not an insane decision, given his vastly superior numbers, but he would have done better to follow Mithridates' wise counsel and knowledge of the Romans' battle prowess even when they were outnumbered. 
According to Plutarch and Appian, Tigranes called up an army of about 250,000, including 20,000 nomadic archers and slingers and 55,000 cavalry. 17,000 were cataphracts, knights in heavy chain mail, wielding long lances, riding large armored Nicaean horses. Trailing behind came a horde of carpenters, road and bridge builders, baggage handlers, grooms, cooks, supply agents, and families, totaling 35,000. This immense barbarian force, some trained as traditional hoplites and others in tribal warfare, like the fierce headhunters from the Taurus Range, each division in native armor, carrying traditional weapons and speaking hundreds of dialects, came from Armenia, Media, Syria, Comagene, Gordiini, Sophini, Mesopotamia, Atropatini, Mardia, Adiabene, Arabia, Parthia, and Bactria. Inside the city in progress, Tigranocerta's population was another great melting pot, made up of Cappadocians, Jews, Greeks, Arabs, Assyrians, Adiabeni, Gordiani, and other nameless displaced peoples, including a large contingent of professional actors, all transplanted by Tigranes and now besieged by the Romans. Tigranes led his massive army down from the Taurus. Queen Cleopatra was safe in Artaxata, Armenia's old fortified capital. But, as Lucullus expected, Tigranes worried about the Romans capturing his concubine, Zosimi, and the rest of his harem in Tigranocerta. Mithridates had been unable to defend his own harem during the defeat of Pontus. Perhaps he, or Taxiles, helped plan the daring rescue of Tigranes' harem, which featured his new hit-and-run strategy. Suddenly, six thousand nomad horsemen burst through the Roman besiegers surrounding the city. The riders dashed to the tower and roughly scooped up Tigranes' concubines, children, and valuables, and galloped back behind the lines. From a hill, high above the Tigris River, Tigranes and his eldest son, Tigranes by Cleopatra, looked down on the ant-like Roman army across the river. They seemed so insignificant. His men made witty jokes about the doomed Romans, while his Armenian, Median, and Adiabeni generals lazily cast lots to divide up the anticipated spoils. Tigranes' famous quip has come down in history as ironic last words. If those Romans have come as ambassadors, there are far too many of them. If they have come as an invading army, there are far too few. Only Taxiles, Mithridates' experienced general, was worried as he watched the Romans don their gleaming helmets and armor, raise their polished shields and standards, and begin to form ranks. Where was Mithridates? He was on the way, but saw no need to hurry, because he expected Lucullus to continue with the cautious approach he had followed in Bithynia and Pontus. No one imagined that Lucullus would provoke a battle. But Lucullus's strategy was the opposite of what Mithridates anticipated. Seriously outnumbered, the Roman used a lightning strike against Tigranes' cumbersome masses. Riding out at the head of his army in a red cloak with golden tassels, his steel breastplate flashing in the October sun, Lucullus had his finest hour. For once, his men were impressed. Dismounting, Lucullus raised his sword, shouting, This day is ours, my fellow soldiers. He gave the signal for attack before Tigranes' archers could let fly, and directed his Thracian and Galatian cavalry to slash the enemy's mail-clad horses from behind, giving them no time to maneuver. Incredulous that such a piddling force would actually initiate the attack, Tigranes could only choke out the same words over and over again. What? Are they really attacking us? It was a tremendous rout. Tigranes' wall of cataphracts reared up and bolted, running down their own infantry, trampling tens of thousands. The heavily armored horses collided with Tigranes' baggage train. Confusion and terror clotted the multitudes. The Romans closed in for the slaughter and pursued the fleeing enemy until nightfall. For once, Lucullus's legionnaires followed orders and didn't stop for plunder, bypassing mile after mile of glittering armor, weapons, and ornaments lying in the road. Shocked out of his fantasy of easy victory, aghast at the disaster, Tigranes rushed with his son and attendants into the foothills. With great emotion, the king of kings removed his tiara and handed it to his son, urging him to save himself. Not wanting to stand out as royalty, the prince entrusted the crown to his slave for safekeeping. Father and son, 
led by different routes into the mountains. Lucullus tallied only one hundred men wounded and five killed, while he claimed that more than a hundred thousand of Tigranes' infantry and most of the cavalry perished. Many escaped. Many were taken captive. Among the prisoners was the slave carrying Tigranes' tiara. His capture might explain how we know of Tigranes' personal reactions to the battle. Ancient and modern historians marvel at this spectacular upset, a battle like no other. Never had the Romans been so outnumbered, and never had they won so decisively against overwhelming odds. Alfred Duggan, writing in the 1950s, described the battle in racist colonialist terms, comparing the Syrian and Mesopotamian soldiers to feeble cattle, and commenting that the Arabs of the desert think only of joining the winning side. Duggan even stated that the outcome was a striking example of Westerners ascendant over cringing Asiatics. Yet, Tigranes' diverse sprawling army, reminiscent of Xerxes' great multinational army in 480 B.C., had been spectacularly successful in all his conquests so far. Obviously, however, Tigranes' massive polyglot forces also suffered problems of logistics and command and control similar to those faced by Xerxes. Tigranes' armies were ill-prepared and immobilized by Lucullus' blitzkrieg strategy and experienced legions. Indeed, historians praise Lucullus's military accomplishments. With delay and caution, he had worn down the lightning-fast Mithridates, and now, with speed and surprise, he defeated Tigranes' ponderous juggernaut. Yet despite all his successes in battles, Lucullus failed to lay his hands on Mithridates or Tigranes, nor could he prevent them from surging back with renewed forces. Rising from the Ashes Riding down from the mountains toward the Tigris Valley with his twelve thousand cavalrymen, Mithridates was unaware that the battle had already been lost. His heart sank when he met the first of Tigranes' soldiers fleeing in panic. As he encountered thousands of wounded fugitives streaming up from the plain, Mithridates learned the extent of the catastrophe. At this extremely bleak moment, after surviving a barrage of personal calamities and cutting short his own hope of recovering at least his kingdom of Pontus, one might expect Mithridates to criticize Tigranes' foolish arrogance and think only of saving himself. But as Plutarch pointed out, it is praiseworthy and revealing of Mithridates' character that instead of abandoning Tigranes, Mithridates continued down the mountain in search of his old friend. Mithridates found the king, crying alone by the side of the road, forlorn and humiliated without his crown or attendants. Leaping down from his horse, Mithridates embraced Tigranes. The two men wept together over their misfortunes. Mithridates quickly regained composure and inner fortitude. Placing his cloak over Tigranes' shoulders, Mithridates offered his own horse. He spoke encouragingly as they turned and hurried up into the mountains toward Artaxata. Mithridates must have persuaded Tigranes that they could still fulfill their grand and now intertwined destinies. The battle's outcome would have convinced Mithridates that his new indirect strategy was the only way to resist the Romans. In the face of overwhelming losses, the battered pair of kings began to forge plans to assemble yet another army. Tigranes graciously appointed Mithridates as the commander and strategist of their new combined forces, citing his old friend's wisdom and experiences with the Romans. Mission Impossible While Mithridates and Tigranes disappeared into northern Armenia, Lucullus remained on the plain to besiege Tigranocerta. For the first time, a Roman army experienced an extraordinary secret weapon, a flaming substance that burned everything, wood, metal, leather, horses, and human flesh. This strange chemical, marveled the historian Cassius Dio, is so fiery that it consumes whatever it touches and cannot be extinguished with any kind of liquid. Many men and machines were burned, but Lucullus finally took the imperial city after Tigranes' mercenaries opened the gates. He seized the royal coffers containing eight thousand talents of silver, unimaginably costly raiment, jewels, and other valuables. Each legionnaire received eight hundred drachmas, the equivalent of more than two years' pay, and all the plunder he could carry. When Lucullus discovered the company of dramatic actors cowering in the theater, he ordered them to perform plays to celebrate his victory. Then, 
Commanding his men to raise Tigranocerta to rubble, the Roman Imperator saved the wives of prominent men from rape and arranged for the displaced people from Cappadocia and elsewhere to return to their native lands. All traces of Tigranocerta were erased. Its location is unknown, although in 2006 Armenian archaeologists announced the exciting discovery of the walls of a large, fortified Hellenistic city near the Tigris. Elated by his success, Lucullus decided to ignore the fact that Mithridates and Tigranes were still free in the north. Turning west, he stormed Samosata, the wealthy capital of Commagene, a small kingdom on the Euphrates. Allied with Mithridates and Tigranes, Samosata controlled the strategic trade routes from Asia north to Pontus. But the Samosatans wielded the same horrendous weapon used by the Tigranocertans, a flammable mud called Maltha that oozes up from pools in the desert, wrote Pliny. The defenders on the wall poured Maltha over the Romans below. It clings like burning honey to anyone who tries to flee, said Pliny, and water only causes it to burn more furiously. Maltha destroyed Lucullus's siege machines and melted his soldiers' armor and flesh. The incendiary was well known in the Middle East to the worshippers of Ahura Mazda and Mithra, but unknown in Rome at this time. Maltha was viscous, highly combustible naphtha skimmed from petroleum lakes in the deserts of northern Iraq, Syria, and eastern Turkey. The terror of the burning Maltha forced Lucullus to withdraw from Samosata. Venturing into Gordiini, his army suffered another biochemical attack. Archers on horseback suddenly bore down, shooting arrows even as they galloped away and vanished into the hills. Lucullus lost a great many men in these ambushes. Their wounds were dangerous and incurable, wrote Cassius Dio. Not only did the nomads dip their iron arrows in deadly viper venom, but the tips were designed to break off inside the wound. Lucullus retreated to the Tigris with his soldiers vehemently protesting the hardships and lack of fresh loot. After the first flush of victory and plunder, the campaign now seemed endless, pointless. Why were they continuing to battle new barbarian enemies in these god-forsaken lands, while the renegade kings Mithridates and Tigranes escaped to Artaxeter? According to Plutarch, Lucullus had convinced himself that he had already neutralized Mithridates and Tigranes. They were old men, Lucullus told himself, no longer worthy of notice. Like an athlete in a triathlon, wrote Plutarch, Lucullus now dreamed of vanquishing the big three, the greatest empires in the known world. First Mithridates, then Tigranes, and now Parthia. Parthia's military power had been steadily growing in what is now Iran and Pakistan. Loosely allied with Mithridates and Tigranes, the king of Parthia refused to promise neutrality. Using this refusal to justify an invasion of Parthia, Lucullus dispatched a messenger back to Pontus with new orders for the two legions, the Fimbrian bad apples left behind in Mithridates' kingdom. They were to join him in Mesopotamia to help conquer Parthia. But the two Fimbrian legions refused to obey. They even threatened to abandon Pontus. Word of their mutiny spread to Lucullus's soldiers on the Tigris. They berated Lucullus for leading them on such a dangerous wild goose chase. Suddenly, Lucullus, despite his strategic brilliance, was no longer the imperator of the Roman army in the east. His authority evaporated. Lucullus, who for all his courage and intellect had never connected with a common soldier, was now a virtual non-entity in the midst of a disobedient, battle-weary mob. Meanwhile, in Armenia... Mithridates and Tigranes, from their base in Artaxeter, energetically crisscrossed the countryside in 69 BC, raising fresh armies. They recruited fighters from Armenia and the warlike tribes of Colchis, Caucasia, and the steppes beyond the Caspian Sea. Mithridates, as supreme commander, personally selected 70,000 Armenians to be trained as infantry. The rest were set to manufacturing armor and weapons. Taxiles divided the new army into Roman-styled cohorts and drilled them in Roman battle tactics, which would be needed to drive the Romans out of Pontus. But Mithridates also dipped into his Greco-Persian heritage, the experiences of Darius and Alexander. 
He counted on the maneuverability of smaller, flexible formations to fight the Romans in Armenia and eastern Pontus, where Lucullus's cavalry would be hobbled by rugged terrain. Mithridates recruited an unusually large cavalry force, about 35,000 horsemen and women from Caucasia, between the Black and Caspian Seas, and the lands beyond. Among the nomads of Caucasia and the steppes, each man and woman was a potential warrior, since both genders were raised to ride and shoot the bow and arrow, thus influencing Greek and Roman tales of Amazons. Mounted on shaggy ponies, this light-armed, nimble cavalry would be the heart of Mithridates' new army. It might have been during this recruiting drive that Mithridates met the nomadic horsewoman named Hypsicratea, mountain strength. Her age is unknown, but she could have been thirty or forty years younger than Mithridates. Her name suggests that she came from the Caucasus region. Hypsicratea first served as the king's groom, caring for his horses. Then she became his personal attendant and lover. They enjoyed riding and hunting together. The Amazon's endurance and courage rivaled the king's, and given Mithridates' love of literature, history, art, and intelligent women, we can guess that she was also his intellectual equal. Praising her manly spirit and extravagant daring, he called her by the masculine form of her name, Hypsicrates. Mithridates' relationship with Hypsicratea recalls famous mythic pairs, Theseus and Antiope, Achilles and Penthesilea, Hercules and Hippolyte, and he knew the story of Alexander and the Amazon queen from Caucasia. As we shall see, Hypsicratea's companionship would sustain Mithridates in future adventures. Mithridates and Tigranes stockpiled large supplies of grain and sent envoys to Parthia to solicit money and troops. Mithridates' personal letter to the Parthian king was preserved by the Roman historian Sallust. Whether or not it is the actual wording of Mithridates' message is debated by historians, but the content and tone match his other letters and speeches. Mithridates did keep copies of his correspondence discovered after his death, and early in his reign he enjoyed friendly relations with Parthian royalty included among his friends in the Delos Monument. Here is the essence of the letter of 69 B.C. showcasing Mithridates' animosity toward Rome and persuasive diplomacy, so different from the approach of Lucullus and Appius. King Mithridates to the king of Parthia, greeting, the letter begins. As one who is enjoying prosperity and glory, you may wonder why you should listen to my request for a military alliance. You may ask whether such an alliance is honorable, wise, or risky. If I did not believe that you too were exposed to the same wicked enemies, and that to crush Roman aggression would bring you glorious fame, I would not venture to ask for an alliance, and I would never hope to try to unite my misfortunes with your glorious success. Rome has always had the same motive for making war upon all nations and kings. That motive is a deep-seated desire for domination and riches. These Romans turned to the east only because the Atlantic Ocean ended their westward expansion. From their very origins, Romans have possessed only what they could steal from others, their homes, their wives, their lands, their empire, all stolen. Nothing prevents them from attacking and destroying allies and friends alike, weak and powerful, near and far. Rome is viciously hostile to every government not subject to Rome, especially monarchies. Mithridates lambastes Rome's hypocrisy and betrayals of those they pretend to befriend. The Romans stripped Anatolia of ten thousand talents when they betrayed Antiochus the Great. They enslaved King Eumenes of Pergamon. They forged the wills of Attalus III and Nicomedes IV so that they could take over all Anatolia. Here Mithridates describes the Roman murder of the tragic hero Aristonicus, the true son of King Attalus. Then he brings up Aristonicus's rebellion, now more than fifty years after the fact, indicates that the Sun Citizen's uprising still resonated in the anti-Roman East as far away as Parthia, the birthplace of Persian sun worship. You have great resources of men, weapons, and gold, writes Mithridates. It is inevitable that Rome will make war on you to obtain these resources. Ask yourself, if Tigranes and I are defeated, would you really be better able to resist the Romans? There is no end to war with the Romans, 
They must be crushed. Here Mithridates makes his pitch. Ally with us while Tigranes' kingdom is intact, and while I have an army of soldiers trained in warfare with the Romans. If you send us help now, Tigranes and I can win this war at the expense of our armies far from your borders, and with no effort, losses, or risk on your part. He concludes, The Romans hate us as the avengers of all those they subjugate. You possess all the riches and grandeur of Persia, but you can expect nothing but deceit and war from Rome. Romans want power over all, but they always aim their deadliest weapons against those with the richest spoils. It is through arrogance, treachery, and never-ending warfare that Rome has grown great. Believe me, they will blot out everything or perish in the attempt. Mithridates had lost his strong ally in the west, Sertorius. Spartacus was dead. Now he endeavored to convince Parthia that Rome was a real threat, and that helping Mithridates and Tigranes was in Parthia's best interests. Ultimately, however, the king of Parthia negotiated with Mithridates and with Lucullus, but aided neither side. Lucullus Chases Shadows Mutiny by his army forced Lucullus to abandon the dream of subduing the Parthian Empire. In summer of 68 BC, Lucullus took up his old goal to wrest Mithridates away from Tigranes' protection. Indeed, as long as Mithridates was alive, he was a threat to Rome. Lucullus's soldiers agreed to march to Tigranes' headquarters in Artaxata, designed by Hannibal. Lucullus liked to refer to Artaxata as the Armenian Carthage. Marching up into Armenia, the Romans were surprised to find no food, even though it was midsummer. Armenia's high plateau of 4,000 to 7,000 feet is surrounded by 10,000-foot snowy mountain ranges. At such high altitudes, the grain and fruit had not yet ripened. The soldiers were continually harassed by mounted archers. To the great consternation of the legionnaires, these male and female warriors skirmished in typical nomadic fashion, swooping in, and then scattering. To the Romans it seemed a cowardly way to fight, but it was effective. The legions were constantly under fire without being able to land a blow. Finally, a vast cloud of dust announced the approach of Tigranes and Mithridates. The two enemy commanders appeared flanked by cavalry units from Atropatini, Azerbaijan, leading an army of such splendor and might that Lucullus was suddenly struck with fear. He turned to attack the Atropatini flanks, but they melted away into the hillsides instead of meeting him head on. It may have been in this battle that Lucullus's Macedonian cavalrymen decided to desert en masse to Mithridates. Lucullus found it impossible to engage with Tigranes or Mithridates. They'd become shadows, constantly withdrawing. Lucullus doggedly pursued. He took a lot of captives and amassed a great deal of exotic booty, yet... Skirmish after skirmish proved indecisive. Lucullus and his army seemed to be chasing an illusion. Fleeting engagements were followed by unnerving silence. They never really lost, but they couldn't win either. By autumn, Lucullus had been drawn onto Armenia's highlands of golden-brown parched grass and alkaline lakes. Plutarch says he was still hoping for a decisive battle that would subdue the barbarian realm utterly. Plutarch, Appian, and other ancient and modern historians have criticized the poor battle performance of Mithridates and Tigranes and their army of barbarians, accusing them of shamefully running away over and over again. Appian, for example, remarked that all that summer and fall Lucullus could not draw Mithridates out to fight. Plutarch even claimed that Mithridates fled disgracefully because he couldn't endure the shouting and clamor of battle. The barbarian warriors did not shine in action, continued Plutarch. Even in slight skirmish with the Roman cavalry, they would give way before the advancing infantry, scattering to the right and left. Bandingly, the Gordii and Atropatini kept galloping off, instead of engaging at close quarters with the Romans. The pursuit was long and exhausting. The Romans, concluded Plutarch, were worn out. Exactly. The historians and Lucullus failed to understand the new guerrilla tactics that Mithridates had put in place, adopting the asymmetrical style of fighting that his barbarian warriors excelled in. 
Mithridates and Tigranes gave way in close quarters, avoiding direct conflict and turning the enemy's own momentum against them. While the Romans grew more frustrated and baffled, the barbarians and their tough little ponies were at home in the harsh landscape as fall turned to winter. They knew exactly where to find food, water, shelter, and hideouts. They monitored the movements of Lucullus and his men, while Lucullus had no idea where he himself was, where the enemy was hiding, or when they would strike next. Mithridates, astute student of history, appears to have studied Xenophon's discussions of his Greek hoplite army's difficulties fighting the mounted archers native to this same region where Lucullus now found himself. As noted above, Mithridates was also aware of Alexander's creation of new mountain-trained, light-armed, highly mobile cavalry to match the mounted resistance fighters he faced after his invasion of Afghanistan. The tactics were similar to those used by Jugurtha and by Mithridates' allies, the Scordisci horsemen from the Danube, against Lucullus in Pontus. Mithridates could also recall how the nomads of Scythia had outwitted Darius and his Persian army in 512 B.C. As the Greek historian Herodotus commented, the nomads understood self-preservation better than anyone on earth. If they wish to avoid engaging with an enemy, that enemy can never come to grips with them. Luring Darius to penetrate deep into Scythian territory, the nomads melted away whenever Darius attempted to attack. Darius sent an exasperated message to the Scythian chief. Why on earth do you keep running away? Why are you wandering all over the place trying to escape? If you are so weak, surrender. If you think you are strong enough to oppose me, stand and fight. But, as Herodotus pointed out, the Scythian strategy was not employed out of fear or cowardice. It was psychologically and militarily sound. As a result of their falling back, whenever the Persians had the upper hand, and then, unpredictably striking and fading away, Darius was kept off balance, and his supply lines were stretched to the breaking point. Again and again, wrote Herodotus, Darius's momentary success gave way to acute embarrassment. In this way, the nomads led Darius to march across the entire Scythian territory, all the way to the Danube, without ever engaging with the enemy. In 68 to 67 BC, Mithridates ensured that Lucullus was in the same predicament as Darius had been. The Roman army, unused to high altitude weather, trudged on, wary, hungry, complaining. Where was the enemy hiding? How could the air be so frigid when the sun shone brightly in an azure sky? Suddenly, long before the Romans expected it, winter arrived. Snow blanketed the ground, icicles crusted the pine boughs, streams froze solid, the sun's rays gave no heat, and the glare on the snow blinded the men. The freezing temperature gnawed at toes and fingers and caused the breath to congeal upon moustaches and beards, speedily forming icicles which hurt horribly. Ice on the dark rivers shattered when the horses tried to cross, and the jagged shards cut their legs. Wrapped in skimpy cloaks, legionnaires marched single file through narrow canyons and over frozen marshes. They were always shivering now, huddling in frosty tents and melting ice to drink. The soldiers' complaints escalated into tumultuous assemblies in their tents at night and threats of desertion. Trying to avert another mutiny, Lucullus urged them to persevere. They would soon destroy the city built by Hannibal and seize Mithridates, triumphing over Rome's two most hated foes. But Plutarch reports that the soldiers forced Lucullus to abandon his pursuit of the renegade kings. He accompanied his army back down from the mountains to the mild winter of the Tigris. There, Lucullus roused his men to storm Nisibis, held by Tigranes' brother Gorus. Defending this city was none other than Mithridates' engineer Callimachus, Lucullus's nemesis at Amisus, as we have seen. Gorus surrendered. He was saved for the triumph. Callimachus was brought before Lucullus. He promised to reveal Mithridates' secret stores of fabulous treasures, but Lucullus tortured Callimachus to death for burning Amisus, denying him the chance to spare the Greek city. When Callimachus died, the knowledge of many of Mithridates' most cleverly hidden caches of gold and valuables was lost, hordes overlooked by the Romans, and perhaps still awaiting discovery today. Lucullus and his army were burned out. The officers and men castigated him as arrogant and distant, thinking only of enriching himself. 
comparing their leader unfavorably to Pompey, who triumphed in Spain and Italy and looked after the welfare of his soldiers, they ignored Lucullus's pleas to resume the pursuit of Mithridates. In 67 BC, Lucullus's army camped at Nisibis and refused to budge. Mithridates' Surge in Pontus Mithridates was free to recover his kingdom of Pontus. Tigranes would arrive later to retake Cappadocia. Accompanied by the Agari, Timotheus, Hypsocratea, his bodyguard Batuatus, Roman deserters, and a highly trained army of about 8,000 infantrymen and cavalry, Mithridates received a joyful welcome from his people. Many eagerly joined his new army as he visited old strongholds to establish garrisons. Filled with optimism in spring of 67 BC, the old warrior, now about 67 years old, led his army against the two Fimbrian legions, about 12,000 men, still occupying Pontus. These were the soldiers who had refused to leave their lax tour of duty to join Lucullus in Mesopotamia. As the historian Eutropius remarked, it was their negligence and greed that gave Mithridates the chance to recover Pontus. Taken by surprise, the Roman legate desperately sought to increase his forces by arming the slaves kept by the Fimbrians. Could he be the one finally to stop Mithridates the Great? He led his crew of slaves and legionnaires onto the field where the battle lasted all day. The Romans retreated, leaving behind five hundred dead. Although the Roman threat still loomed, this was a rousing victory. Rising, phoenix-like from the ashes, Mithridates was surging back. But fighting in the front lines, the king was wounded, his first war injury. An arrow pierced his cheek, just missing his eye. He had to be carried from the battlefield. For several days, his worried troops feared for his life as he hovered in critical condition. The Agari shamans successfully treated the arrow wound, using their secret knowledge of serpent venom as a coagulant to stop hemorrhage. Mithridates was back in the saddle, in time to repulse a renewed Roman assault a few days later. Now nature intervened, once again sending extraordinary meteorological events. Before the battle began, wrote Appian, a freak tornado struck with howling winds, the likes of which were unknown in living memory. The cyclone blew away the canvas tents in both camps, sweeping men and pack animals over precipices. Both sides regrouped. The next battle would prove decisive. The Romans attacked Mithridates at night at Zila. Throwing on his helmet and armor, Mithridates rallied his men. They drove the legionnaires into trenches filled with rainwater and mud, soon clogged with dead Romans. But in the heat of the battle, a brave centurion came running up alongside Mithridates' horse. The centurion stabbed his sword into Mithridates' thigh with all his might. Those nearby, maybe Bituitus and Hypsocratea, immediately chopped the Roman to pieces, but Mithridates was felled, bleeding profusely. Again the king was carried off the field. The high spirits of victory descended into alarm and despair. Would their intrepid commander survive such a grave wound? The soldiers crowded together on the plain, trying to catch a glimpse of Mithridates lying on the muddy ground, attended by the field medic Timotheus and the Agari wizards. For the second time in this campaign, medical history was made. Again, the Agari staunched the flow of blood using snake venom. Mithridates regained consciousness. Everyone knew that Alexander had suffered a similar grievous thigh wound, and they recalled how his doctors had raised him high up above the Macedonian army to reassure the men that their beloved leader still lived. Now Mithridates' doctor, Timotheus, lifted Mithridates up so that he could be seen by his cheering soldiers. By late afternoon, Mithridates the Invincible was back on his horse, storming the Roman camp. But the camp was empty. The survivors had fled in terror, leaving behind seven thousand dead. As Mithridates and his men viewed the carnage, they counted twenty-four tribunes and a hundred and fifty centurions, the largest number of officers ever killed in a single ancient battle. Mithridates' recovery of Pontus in this great battle at Zela in 67 BC was one of the most unexpected remarkable feats in his long career. He erected a large victory trophy on the battlefield, thanking Zeus Stratios. Lucullus arrived in Pontus after the devastating defeat at the muddy trenches. 
He took command of the shattered Fimbrian units, but didn't arrange for burial of the seven thousand Roman corpses strewn over the battleground. This neglect, according to Plutarch, was the last straw for his demoralized soldiers. And Mithridates was long gone. True to his new strategy, Mithridates had withdrawn out of reach in western Armenia. Tigranes was coming to help secure his kingdom. Lucullus gave the order to march to the point where the two grand armies would meet, hoping to defeat the two rogue kings once and for all. But the battered Fimbrians deserted their posts. The mutiny spread throughout Lucullus's legions. At this point, says Plutarch, fortune completely abandoned Lucullus. So ill-starred and wandering had his course become that Lucullus nearly lost all that he had accomplished through no fault but his own. Lucullus went from tent to tent in tears, begging the men to obey. The soldiers mocked their commander, hurling their empty purses at his feet, telling him to fight the enemies alone, since he alone knew how to get rich from them. Lucullus sat by helplessly as Tigranes the Great rolled through Cappadocia, taking it over for the third time since the Mithridatic Wars first began. One wonders whether Lucullus gave any thought to the masses of wandering Cappadocian refugees who had been transplanted to Tigranosita by Tigranes, and now had been liberated by Lucullus and sent back to their homeland just in time to meet Tigranes' re-invasion. In Rome, the populars denounced Lucullus for prolonging the war and stripping the palaces of Mithridates and Tigranes for his own profit. He'd wasted years, money, and lives, railed his critics, compelling his soldiers to conduct caravans of camels and carts laden with golden beakers set with gems when he should have annihilated Rome's great enemy. Lucullus had assured the Senate that he had completely subdued Mithridates. Now officials arrived from Rome and observed the utter anarchy and collapse of the mission. The mission Sulla had failed to accomplish, the mission that Lucullus had claimed to achieve. Lucullus, fifty-two years old, was relieved of his command, his soldiers released from military service. In 66 BC, Nias Pompey, dubbed the Great by his patron Sulla, who admired his ruthlessness, was appointed to take over the war on Mithridates. At age forty, Pompey had already celebrated two triumphs. He claimed credit, many said unfairly, for defeating both Sertorius and Spartacus. Pompey and his older rival Lucullus, met at a village in Galatia. Through gritted teeth, they congratulated each other, then proceeded to snipe. Pompey belittled Lucullus, and Lucullus likened Pompey to a lazy vulture alighting on the kills of others. He warned that Mithridates was an illusory shadow enemy. Pompey assigned a mere sixteen hundred soldiers to accompany the disgraced commander to Rome. The rest of the legionnaires eagerly re-enlisted under Pompey. Returning to Italy, with shiploads of plunder, captives, and his precious cherry-tree saplings, Lucullus was allowed to celebrate a triumph. His parade began with mail-clad Parthian knights, followed by ten of Mithridates' scythe chariots. Tigranes' hapless brother, Gurus, carried the tiara of Tigranes. These had to stand in for Tigranes himself. Mithridates, of course, was also conspicuous by his absence. He was represented by a life-sized golden statue and a huge bronze shield adorned with precious stones. Trudging behind the statue came Mithridates' downcast sister, Nyssa, captured in Kabira, and about sixty of Mithridates' generals and advisers. Next, a hundred and ten bronze prows from Mithridates' warships trundled by. There were fifty litters heaped with Mithridates' gold and fifty-six mules loaded with more than two point five million silver coins, all looted by Lucullus from Pontus and Tigranosita. Lucullus used his war profits to take up a life of such excess that he went down in history as Rome's most notorious libertine and gastronome, lolling in luxurious villas and staging lavish banquets featuring exotic delicacies. The adjective Lucullan now describes an extravagant feast. Anecdotes were told about Lucullus's outrageous lifestyle, while gourmands praised him for introducing the cherry to Italy. Within a few years of handing over his command to Pompey, however, Lucullus began to lose his mind. He died insane in 57 BC, poisoned, some whispered, by an overdose of a love potion. But those events were far in the future. For Mithridates, buoyed by his success in regaining his kingdom, Battered though it was, the future looked bright again. 
tenacity, and his new tactics had paid off. He knew that Pompey couldn't afford to take up a new war against him right now. Rome and Pompey faced a crisis on the high seas that couldn't be ignored. During the wars, the pirates, more than a thousand ships equipped with silver oars, gilded sails, and awnings of purple silk, had infested the entire Mediterranean, from Cilicia to Gibraltar, plundering, raiding, and kidnapping to their heart's content. While Pompey took on the task of destroying the pirate nests across the Mediterranean, Mithridates rebuilt power and wealth from his headquarters in Pontus. Chapter 14 End Game From their tree houses in the rhododendron forests, the turret folk observed Pompey's army on the march across Mithridates' kingdom. As a young prince, Mithridates had befriended this fierce tribe. They knew the secrets of the local wild honey, the powerful neurotoxin that had felled Xenophon's Greek army in 401 B.C. After tasting the honey, his soldiers had collapsed, open to attack, in hostile territory. To Xenophon's great relief, his men eventually recovered. In 66 B.C., however, the poison honey would be deployed as a deliberate biological weapon against the Roman invaders, ignorant of Xenophon's experience. The turret folk placed tempting honeycombs along Pompey's route. Mithridates had recently passed through their territory ahead of Pompey. Were the turret folk following Mithridates' suggestion? That's unknown, but the ploy certainly would have pleased the poison king, and it was a great success. Pompey's advance cohorts stopped to enjoy the treat. Struck dumb and blind, racked by violent vomiting and diarrhea, they lay paralyzed along the roadside. The turret folk descended with their iron battle axes. When Pompey arrived on the scene, a black cloud of flies buzzed over a thousand legionnaires, sprawled on the road, sticky with honey and blood. And Mithridates? He was far away, a desperado on the run again from the long arm of Roman rule. Pompey A year earlier, in 67 B.C., Pompey had received a budget of 6,000 talents, an army of 120,000 soldiers, 4,000 cavalry, and 270 ships to quash the pirates whose armadas of odious extravagance dominated the Mediterranean. Other Roman campaigns against the pirates had failed, but by skillfully marshalling his resources, Pompey caught or killed about 10,000 of the Mithra-worshipping buccaneers. Rome's massive response to the piracy emergency persuaded most of the remaining pirates to relocate on land grants in Rome's provinces. Pompey's success gained him unlimited war powers to take over the command of Lucullus's failed war on Mithridates. Cicero urged Pompey to wipe out that stain which has now fixed itself deeply and eaten its way into the Roman name. Cicero was referring to the unavenged atrocity of 88 BC when Mithridates had ordered all the Roman citizens in all Asia, scattered as they were over so many cities, to be slaughtered and butchered. Yet Mithridates has never yet suffered any chastisement worthy of his wickedness, continued Cicero. Now, twenty-three years later, he is still a king, and a king not content to hide himself in Pontus or in the recesses of Cappadocia, but a king who seeks to emerge from his hereditary kingdom and ravage Rome's revenues in the broad light of Asia. While Pompey was pounding the pirates, Mithridates had a year to secure his kingdom, raise armies, and ensure the safety of his remaining family members. Concubines were assigned to various strongholds. Stratonice and Zipheres held Kainan Corion. His daughter, Tripatina, held Cinera. Other children were with Mithridates' sons, Macaries and Pharnaces, in the Bosporan kingdom. In Pontus, Mithridates stationed about 30,000 infantry and 3,000 cavalry to guard the frontiers. After the Roman depredations, provisions were scarce. This would hinder any new Roman invaders— but starvation also led to desertions. Mithridates harshly punished those caught abandoning the frontier outposts. Many Roman officers and soldiers had defected from Lucullus to join Mithridates. In 66 BC, their connections reported that Pompey the Great was en route from Rhodes to Pontus with a large army and navy authorized to make war on both Mithridates and Tigranes. Pompey had even forged an alliance with the king of Parthia. 
Seeking an honorable way to avoid this new war and determined to retain his ancestral homeland, the kingdom he had just rescued from the grip of Roman occupation, Mithridates immediately sent envoys to Pompey. What terms would he demand for peace? Pompey's blunt reply, Unconditional surrender and deliver up our Roman traitors. Mithridates relayed this response to the Romans in his ranks. They urged the king to resist. The rest of his soldiers agreed with their Roman comrades. Their reaction impressed Mithridates. Pompey's intransigence enraged him. Confident of the loyalty of his supporters, Mithridates vowed that this would be a united struggle to the end. No, I'll never make peace with the rapacious Romans. I'll never surrender anyone to them. I refuse to do anything that is not for the common advantage to all. The Last Campaign Pompey provoked an attack on the border outposts. Mithridates sent out his full infantry, and the Romans retired. After ascertaining the extent of Pompey's formidable forces, Mithridates withdrew to a mountain stronghold in southeastern Pontus that Pompey didn't dare attack. Indeed, a large number of Pompey's men deserted to Mithridates. Mithridates created the impression that he was digging in, but one night, after lighting their campfires as usual, Mithridates' army sneaked away from the stronghold, catching the Romans by surprise. Plutarch and Appian both claimed that Mithridates departed because he was ignorant of water and food in the region. That seems highly unlikely, given his intimate knowledge of his homeland. Appian was puzzled. Why did Mithridates allow Pompey to enter his territory without opposition? Mithridates expected that Pompey would be unable to find food. But Pompey maintained his supply lines, dug deep wells for water, and set up a siege of Mithridates' new position. After forty-five days, Mithridates killed his pack animals, keeping his cavalry horses and fifty days' worth of provisions. According to Plutarch, his wounded men, unable to march, were killed by their comrades to spare them from ignoble death at Roman hands. Again, Mithridates and his army stole away silently by night over bad roads to yet another stronghold. Cassius Dio thought Mithridates had become frightened and kept fleeing because his forces were inferior. Appian assumed these actions when Mithridates must have been suffering from fear and mental paralysis at the approach of calamity. But these notions are dubious given Mithridates' history, character, and recent vow to resist. Instead, Mithridates' evasive actions were in keeping with his new guerrilla tactics modeled on nomadic warfare and on Alexander's innovations in Afghanistan, and already tested successfully against Lucullus. Mithridates' actions appear to have been calculated to lure Pompey deeper into the unfamiliar, rugged terrain between Pontus and Armenia. Indeed, in the next century, Frontinus, a Roman military strategist, would present these incidents as examples of Mithridates' overall strategy to deceive Pompey. Mithridates' next movements confirmed this explanation. Pompey followed Mithridates over the rough mountain paths with great difficulty, reported Appian. When Pompey caught up, Mithridates refused to fight directly. Instead, he merely drove back the assailants with his cavalry and then disappeared into the thick forest in the evening. These new tactics perplexed the Romans, including the Roman friends who served in Mithridates' own army. They tried in vain to convince the king to fight Pompey head-on. But Mithridates took up a strong position in the mountains, near Dostyra. The place was naturally defended by boulders and steep cliffs, accessible by only one path up the slope, guarded by about two thousand of Mithridates' troops. Again, Mithridates counted on the scarcity of provisions to force Pompey to turn back. Nightmare by Moonlight At this place, during a full moon, Mithridates had a dream. It was written down by his soothsayers and discovered by Pompey among his papers after his death. The dream began happily. Mithridates was sailing with a good wind north across the Black Sea, enjoying the salt breeze, his face warmed by the sun's rays. His mood was exuberant. He and his companions on the deck were all conversing pleasantly. Soon, the green pastures and towers of Panticapion came into sight. Mithridates felt a glow of supreme confidence, joy, and security. He and his Amazon companion, Hypsicratea, would find peace in the kingdom of the Bosporus on the northern shore of the Black Sea with the freedom of the vast steppes at their backs. 
Suddenly, the idyllic dream flipped into a nightmare. Mithridates found himself bereft of all his companions and tossed about in a rough sea, clinging to a bit of wreckage. As the king thrashed in his sleep, his friends shook him awake. It was the middle of the night, but they were shouting, Pompey is attacking. Grabbing weapons and armor, Mithridates, Hypsicratea, and his generals rushed out to confront Pompey. Under the bright moon, Pompey observed their rapid deployment and called off his surprise attack. But his officers, eager to exterminate Mithridates once and for all, came up with a cunning plan. The full moon would be Pompey's ally tonight. As it was setting behind the Roman position, the moonlight would shine forth behind their backs, illuminating the way as they advanced. But even more crucial, as the moon neared the horizon, it would cast extremely long shadows. As his officers sketched diagrams, Pompey suddenly saw that the elongated shadows would disorient the enemy, preventing them from correctly estimating the distance between the two armies. In a lifetime of war and strife, remarkable for extraordinary meteorological and astronomical events, comets, tempests at sea, cyclones, meteors, perhaps it wasn't surprising that yet another powerful force of nature would be Mithridates' undoing. Certainly it's ironic that the moon, queen of the night, would bring about the downfall of Mithridates, champion of sun and light, in his epic struggle against the forces of darkness represented by Rome. That Pompey would choose to attack at night was in keeping with Rome's image in the Iranian-influenced east. Notably, Sulla had also attacked in the middle of the night. In contrast, Mithridates' hero, Alexander, had famously rebuffed his general's advice to attack Darius at night, refusing to steal victory like a thief. The Romans advanced by the pale white light of the moon. The long blue shadows thrown far ahead gave the impression that the Romans were much closer than they really were. Mithridates' archers, tricked by the optical illusion, let loose their arrows too soon. The missiles clattered harmlessly on the ground— far short of the mark. The Romans charged. Many of Mithridates' troops up the slope were still arming, rushing back to mount their charges in the rear with the pack camels. As the front ranks panicked and fell back in the Roman onslaught, terror coursed through Mithridates' army trapped in the rocky canyon. In the moonlight battle, in the late summer of 66 BC, Pompey's men cut down and captured nearly 10,000 of Mithridates' warriors, many of them unarmed. Pompey seized his camp and supplies. But Pompey was disappointed. King Mithridates was not among the dead, the wounded, or the captured. Mithridates and Hypsicratea At the outset of the battle, Mithridates, with Hypsicratea riding at his side, had led eight hundred of his riders to slice through the Roman advance. The fighting was ferocious. Pompey had ordered his infantrymen to stab Mithridates' horses to destroy his faith in his cavalry. Mithridates, Hypsicratea, and two other companions were cut off from the rest. These four finally broke out at the Roman rear and galloped up into the cliffs behind the battleground. Hypsicratea, in Persian Amazonian garb, short tunic, cloak, pointed wool cap with ear flaps, leather boots and leggings with zigzag patterns, never tired of rough riding or combat. She wielded javelin, battle-axe, and bow with such manly expertise that it isn't surprising that Mithridates called her Hypsicrates, and she was devoted to him. This heroic Amazon would accompany her lover to the very end of his long odyssey, wrote Theodore Renac. Mithridates had discovered the last best love of his life, a stout-hearted female companion for the desperate times ahead. After the Mithridatic Wars, as anecdotes from the last stage of the seemingly endless conflict circulated in Italy, even the Romans thrilled to the story of Mithridates and Hypsicratea. Within a generation or so, their companionship had become a romantic tale of noble courage, adventure, and abiding love. In the imagination of Valerius Maximus, writing in the early first century A.D., Hypsicratea was a queen who loved Mithridates so deeply that for his sake she lived like a warrior, cutting her hair and taking up arms to share his toils and dangers. When Mithridates was cruelly defeated by Pompey and fleeing among wild peoples, she followed him with body and soul indefatigable. In later tales of chivalry, Hypsicratea's renown blossomed. 
She was the first in a long line of female pages, heroines in male disguise, featured in fairy tales, ballads, and Shakespearean plays. Medieval chroniclers depicted the king and the Amazon as friends and equals, and their love exemplified an ideal conjugal relationship. Boccaccio imagined Hypsicratea choosing to make herself as tough and rugged as any man. Journeying over hill and dale, traveling by day and night, bedding down in deserts and forests on the hard ground, in perpetual fear of the enemy, and surrounded on all sides by wild beasts and serpents. Mithridates' comrade, wrote Boccaccio suggestively, soothed him with the pleasures she knew he longed for. Hypsicratea was included in the City of Ladies, a celebration by Christine de Pizan, who was born in 1364, of women who were the equals of men in war strength, intellect, and ingenuity. Like Boccaccio, Christine sympathized with Mithridates' struggle, reflecting the negative European image of the Roman Republic's avarice and antagonism toward popular monarchs. The Romans waged a terrible war on Mithridates, wrote Christine. The fate of the kingdom was at stake, and the threat of death at the hands of the Romans ever present. Yet, Hypsicratea traveled everywhere with him to far-off places and strange lands. Christine pictured her as a courtly lady made for softer living, cutting off her long golden hair to disguise herself as a man, giving no thought to protecting her complexion from sweat and dust. For love of Mithridates, Hypsicratea transformed her graceful body into that of a powerfully built knight in arms, clad in helmet and weighed down with a coat of chain mail. In reality, of course, Hypsicratea was a robust horsewoman warrior from a Eurasian nomadic culture in which girls and boys learned to ride, hunt, and make war together. Take the money and run. In the hills, above the battlefield, Mithridates, Hypsicratea, and their two comrades caught their breath. The others were not named by Plutarch. Perhaps one was Bituitus, a cavalry officer from Gaul, praised for fighting valiantly by the king's side. Maybe the other was Gaius, son of Hermias, a childhood friend, or General Metrophanes. The band of four walked their horses on rough trails away from the battlefield. Other survivors of the moonlight battle joined them, a few cavalry and about three thousand on foot. Mithridates had lost nearly ten thousand in Pompey's night attack, yet he and his most faithful followers had emerged from the ordeal. Mithridates led this ragtag group to Sinera, his fortified treasury on the border of Armenia. Near a Turkish village still known as Sunur or Sinuri, which means border, archaeologists have discovered the ruins of Sinera's strong tower. Here, the fugitives were welcomed by Dripatina and the eunuch Menifilus. In the Middle Ages, Dripatina's devotion became an icon of filial love. The girl was extremely ugly, wrote Christine de Pizan, but she loved her father so much that she never left his side. As queen of Laodicea, Dripatina could have lived a safe and comfortable life, but she preferred to share her father's sufferings and hardships when he went to war. Even when he was defeated by the mighty Pompey, she didn't abandon him, but looked after him with great care and dedication. The atmosphere at Sinera was fraught with anxiety and foreboding, but Mithridates had already devised a plan. He sent a messenger to Tigranes to request refuge again in Armenia. Mithridates needed to move fast. Pompey would soon pick up their trail. Sinera's great treasure was essential, but how to transport the heavy load of money and goods? Mithridates' wealth was useless unless it could somehow be made portable. He had no pack animals, only some cavalry horses and a few thousand loyalists. For Mithridates, as he had vowed, it was all for one, one for all. His solution was ingenious and generous. The king gave all that remained of his riches to his followers, thereby distributing the burden and possession among the many. Cedar chests filled with sumptuous raiment and jewelry were flung open. The king handed out robes, bracelets, necklaces, and rings to his soldiers. He then pried open bronze caskets filled with six thousand talents worth of gold and silver coins, equal to a year's pay for about a hundred thousand soldiers. He divided the coins, giving much more than a year's pay to each follower, and generous rewards to senior veterans. The rest was stuffed in leather saddlebags. 
In efficiently and equitably dispersing his treasure, Mithridates' solution recalled Alexander, who had shared his possessions with his loyal troops. It was also a remarkable testament to the mutual trust and loyalty of Mithridates and his followers. His kingdom was lost, yet they would follow their leader into danger and exile for the rest of their lives. Next, Mithridates and the eunuch Menipholus went to the citadel's apothecary and prepared poison pills. Plutarch reported that before departing Cynera the king gave Hypsicratea and each of his friends a deadly poison to carry with them, so that none of them would fall into the hands of the Romans against their will. The fugitive army must have been a bizarre sight. Mithridates' battered armor topped with a purple cape, the Amazon draped in unaccustomed finery, and each foot soldier and rider decked out like royalty in fancy cloaks, gold and silver bangles, and bulging money belts. There had been a slight change in plans. Tigranes, worried about Roman retribution, and against the advice of his queen Cleopatra, Mithridates' daughter, refused to shelter Mithridates in Armenia again. In fact, Tigranes had put a price on his old friend's head. Mithridates couldn't decide whether to be insulted or amused by the stingy reward Tigranes was offering for his capture, a mere one hundred talents. This was less than what Mithridates had offered for his enemies, Chiremon, and his two sons back in 89 B.C. Mithridates revised his escape plan. The outlaw army marched day and night north beyond the headwaters of the Euphrates River. Some of Mithridates' troops, natives of these mountains, served as guides. The region was teeming with snakes deadly to strangers. Locals were not bothered by the venom. By hidden forest paths they passed through the land of the king's allies, the Heniacoi and the turret folk. Three days later the group reached Colchis. At Phasis they might have been reunited with the eunuch Bacchides and the pirate Seleucus, who had sailed to Colchis after the fall of Sinope in 70 B.C. Here, Appian tells us, Mithridates halted to organize and arm his forces and those who joined him. Turret folk, Heniacoi, Iberi, Albanoi, and perhaps the Soanese of the noxious arrow poison, and the strange tribe known as the Lice Eaters. In the Land of the Golden Fleece Mithridates' army crossed the Phasis River. In the grassy meadows strutted beautiful golden-red birds with iridescent blue-green heads and long tail feathers. The Phasian bird, known today as pheasant, was prized for its succulent dark meat. Mithridates led his army further north. The road ended where the Caucasus range met the Black Sea. Here they camped for the winter of 66 to 65 B.C. at Dioscurius, a market town with a mild climate. Early in his reign, Mithridates' army had tried to subdue the wild Achaeans in the mountains here, but he lost many men to ambushes and freezing cold. Since boyhood, Mithridates had been steeped in the mythology of this land. Somewhere, in the alpine meadows above his camp, Medea had once gathered magical plants and liquid fire. On a snowy crag in the Caucasus, Hercules freed Prometheus from his iron chains. The quest for the Golden Fleece ended here. Ancient authors explained how the Colchians used lambskins to collect fine gold dust carried by streams flowing down from the Caucasus. During this strategic retreat, says Appian, Mithridates conceived of a vast plan, a strange one for a fugitive on the run. Pompey was closing in on Colchis, intending to trap Mithridates between the sea and the impassable mountains. Yet, marvels Appian, the irrepressible Mithridates pursued his chimerical project with supreme confidence and energy. The plan was indeed remarkable. Panticopion in the Crimea would become the new center of his Black Sea kingdom. The Bosporus was presently in the hands of Macares, Mithridates' last living son by Laodice, his sister and first wife. Sadly, Macares had inherited her treacherous ways, making peace with Lucullus while his father fought for his life and realm. So Mithridates planned to take back the kingdom he had given his ungrateful son and confront the Romans once more. The Black Sea itself was no longer in Mithridates' control, but most of the lands around it were allies, so the first step of his master plan was to trek overland counterclockwise around the Black Sea. Rounding the Sea of Azov, Mithridates would march across Scythia and Sarmatia down to the Crimea. All along the way, of course, 
he'd gather more followers and allies. It sounds feasible on paper, but a glance at a topographic map reveals the plan's breathtaking audacity. Mithridates intended to cross over the greater Caucasus Mountains, the monolithic barrier between Europe and Asia, stretching nearly a thousand miles from the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea. The highest peaks are eighteen thousand feet. Mithridates and his little army would attempt the crossing in early 65 B.C., braving snow and ice, precipitous trails, and the danger of avalanche. The final phase of this grand scheme declared Appian was even more audacious. After reclaiming the Bosporan kingdom, Mithridates planned to take Rome by surprise. He would wage war on them from Europe while Pompey was still stuck in Asia. With his multitudes, he would march west across the lands of the friendly Roxolani and Bastarni, around the Carpathians to the Danube. His ever-growing army would push northwest across Pannonia, and then, repeating the feat of Hannibal, Mithridates would cross the Alps and invade Italy from the north. Cat and Mouse in Colchis While Mithridates contemplated his grand strategy, where was Pompey? After the moonlight battle, Pompey's movements in 66 to 65 B.C. are confusing in the ancient sources, but one can reconstruct a rough chronology. Appian and Plutarch say that Pompey pursued Mithridates with major difficulties. In the land of the Turret folk he lost a thousand men to poison honey, as we have seen. Reaching Colchis in fall of 66 B.C., Pompey heard rumors of Mithridates' intention to escape over the Caucasus. In Pompey's mind, he had already won the war. Mithridates, he reasoned, had been driven out of his kingdom for good. His son Macarius was now Rome's friend, and the Roman fleet owned the Black Sea. Pompey couldn't imagine that anyone, especially an old man of seventy recovering from recent war wounds, could survive a journey over the mountain barrier. Assuming that Rome's mortal enemy was doomed to an ice coffin, Pompey decided to indulge in some military tourism at the edge of the civilized world. He prided himself on being the first Roman to claim this fabled territory. He was eager to see for himself the haunts of Hercules, Prometheus, and the Argonauts, and to retrace Alexander's route south of the Caspian Sea. Unsure of Mithridates' whereabouts, Pompey's expeditionary force marched east along the Faces and Cyrus rivers. Skirting the foothills of the Caucasus, they encountered warlike bands, proud to have resisted the Medes, Persians, and Alexander. Now they were highly motivated allies of Mithridates. Iranian-influenced, they worshipped the sun and Selene, moon, and noted Strabo, they assembled by the tens of thousands whenever anything alarming occurs. Halfway between the Black and Caspian Seas at Armazai, the ancient fort overlooking the confluence of the Aragus, fast water, and Cyrus rivers near Tbilisi, Georgia, Pompey made winter camp, surrounded by the hostile Iberi and Albanoi. While the Romans were celebrating Saturnalia, a jolly winter holiday of role reversals and heavy drinking, the Iberi, Albanoi, and allied bands ambushed the camp. The skirmishes were described by Appian, Plutarch, Strabo, and Cassius Dio. The barbarians numbered sixty thousand on foot and twelve thousand mounted. To the Romans, these tall, handsome people appeared wretchedly armed, wearing the skins of wild beasts. They were formidable guerrilla fighters who attacked, then took cover in the forest. Pompey methodically set the forest on fire to drive them out. After the battle, stripping the nearly nine thousand dead bodies, the Romans discovered many women warriors with typical Amazon weapons and clothing, just like what was depicted in Greek vase paintings. Their wounds showed that their bravery matched that of the men. Female fighters were also found among the thousands of captives. According to Strabo, Amazons dressed in wild animal skins inhabited these mountains and the steppes beyond. In detailing the Amazon lifestyle, Strabo stated that his information came from the writings, now lost, of Mithridates' old friend, the philosopher Metrodorus, and from someone by the name of Hypsicrates, the masculine version of Hypsicratea, who was quite familiar with this region. As noted earlier, Amazons referred to Eurasian groups in which both women and men hunted and made war. Since the 19th century, archaeologists have discovered numerous graves containing the skeletons of women warriors buried with their weapons in the same regions where the ancients located Amazons. 
It was said that Alexander the Great had met the Amazon queen Thelestris and her three hundred women warriors here between the Thasis and the Caspian Sea, the very region now traversed by Pompey. According to the tale, Alexander had devoted thirteen nights to gratifying the queen's desires. Now the Amazons were fighting on Mithridates' side. Pompey was eager to show off these captive women warriors in his triumph. Pompey's winter camp was selected for its strategic location. Cassius Dio says Pompey occupied the citadel of Armezi, built in the 3rd century BC, in order to secure the nearly impenetrable pass over the mid-Caucasus, the main route between Scythia and Armenia. Armezi also blocked the way to the eastern end of the Caucasus. The citadel's massive blocks can be seen today. The ancient bridge is still called Pompey's Bridge. In spring of 65 BC, assuming he was master of the pass, Pompey left a garrison there and ordered the Roman fleet to patrol the eastern Black Sea coast on the lookout for Mithridates. Then Pompey marched toward the Caspian to explore, and perhaps to assure himself that Mithridates hadn't somehow slipped around the eastern end of the mountains, through modern Azerbaijan and Dagestan. But Pompey was soon forced to turn back. The ground was crawling with deadly snakes, scorpions, and tarantulas. Filled with wrath and resentment, Plutarch's words, Pompey now had to retrace his route. Struggling across the flooded Cyrus, his army revisited hostile territory. The Albanoi, Iberi, and their friends had risen up again. After a series of frustrating skirmishes, Pompey decided to try to pick up Mithridates' trail. That summer, Pompey headed east again, fighting his way through unknown and hostile tribes along the Phasis to the Black Sea. Here, perceiving that Mithridates couldn't have escaped to the Crimea, either by boat or by following the coast north, Pompey gave up the chase. Pompey's seemingly aimless wanderings are best seen as a game of cat and mouse. Mithridates seemed to have vanished into thin air. Pompey was trying to intercept or locate his prey's three likely escape routes out of Colchis— around the mountains by the Caspian Sea, along the Black Sea coast, or over the daunting pass at the highest point of the Caucasus, the pass Pompey thought he had blocked. But as we shall see, the mouse enjoyed all the advantages and managed to slip away through a secret mouse hole virtually under the cat's nose. Tigranes surrenders, Pontus occupied. Pompey now crossed the lesser Caucasus range into northern Armenia to attack Tigranes' stronghold Artaxata. His men suffered severe hardships, thirst, and ambush, because the guides, Albanoi, Iberai, and Amazon prisoners of war, deliberately misled them. In Artaxata, Tigranes, nearly seventy-five years old, had lost his will to fight. His son, Tigranes, Mithridates' grandson, had revolted, and it looked as though his old friend Mithridates was beaten at last. Tigranes accepted Pompey's terms, prostrating himself on the ground and handing over his tiara in ancient Persian fashion. In exchange for six thousand talents and the surrender of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Phoenicia, Tigranes was pardoned. He ruled Armenia as a friend of Rome until his death at age eighty-five in fifty-five B.C. Mithridates, he died old, is the familiar refrain, but Mithridates' friend, Tigranes, would die even older. Considering the Mithridatic War won at last in late 65 BC, Pompey returned to Pontus and founded Nicopolis, Victory City, on the battlefield near Destyra, where he had defeated Mithridates by moonlight. He traversed Pontus, seizing fortresses and treasures that would add splendor to his triumph. The vaults at Talora yielded cups of onyx and gold, splendid furniture, bejeweled armor and gilded horse bridles, Persian antiques, and the treasure from Kos, including the precious cloak of Alexander the Great. When the Romans stormed Sinora Tower, the eunuch Menephilus feared that his mistress, Drippatina, would be raped. He killed her and then himself with his sword. Several royal concubines were captured in other strongholds and brought to Pompey. Plutarch points out that he refrained from raping them. Stratonice, certain that she would never see her king alive again, surrendered Kynon Corion to Pompey. In exchange for a promise to spare her young son Zephyres, she revealed the underground vault filled with Mithridates' treasure and archives. Stratonice and Zephyres were allowed to sail to Phanagoria on the Taman Peninsula. 
They joined other members of Mithridates' family there, overseen by Macarius. Pompey spent long hours poring over Mithridates' private papers, for they shed much light on the king's character. Curiosity ran high about the man who had defied Rome for so many decades. Rumors and speculations arose later about what state and private secrets these documents revealed. Did Pompey discover the Mithridatium recipe? The papers were shipped to Rome to be translated into Latin verse by the freedman Nius Pompeius Linnaeus, Pompey's learned Greek secretary. Linnaeus's life exemplifies the rapidly shifting fortunes of many in the Mithridatic Wars. Captured as a boy of twelve during Sulla's siege of Athens in 87 BC, Linnaeus somehow escaped and returned to Greece to study. He was recaptured but freed by Pompey, whom he accompanied on all his campaigns. It would be fascinating to read Linnaeus's character sketch of Mithridates, but sadly that work and all of Linnaeus's writings are lost. None of Mithridates' archives which pass through the hands of Pompey, Linnaeus, Plutarch, and Pliny are extant. In the first century A.D., Plutarch and Pliny consulted the original writings. The notes, according to Plutarch, named victims of Mithridates' poisons and included interpretations of the dreams of the king and his lovers. There were sheaves of royal and personal correspondence, including the racy love letters penned by Mithridates and Monomy. Plutarch says that Pompey shrugged off pursuing Mithridates beyond Colchis because, just as Lucullus had warned, the king was far more slippery in flight than in battle. Lucullus's premonition that Mithridates' strength could multiply a thousandfold if he escaped to the Caucasus was more accurate than Pompey realized. Remarking that famine would finish off Mithridates should he somehow survive the mountain snows, Pompey established a blockade to cut off trade to the Bosporus, apparently forgetting that the Crimea had access to abundant fish and grain. Then Pompey set off to embellish his resume of conquests from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. Leaving Pontus far behind, Pompey marched south to subdue Commagene, Cilicia, Phoenicia, Syria, and the lands of the Arabs and Jews. The Trek Over the Caucasus Mountains while Pompey was traipsing around Colchis, Mithridates accomplished his most daring exploit, crossing the Caucasus Mountains in early 65 BC. To the great surprise of his son Macares, Mithridates and his army suddenly appeared in the capital of the Bosporan kingdom that summer. Four ancient historians provide imprecise, contradictory information on Mithridates' route over the mountain barrier and around the Sea of Azov to Panticapion. Unfortunately, Livy's account has not survived. Mithridates' stunning feat was a mystery in antiquity and remains a puzzle today. Drawing on the ancient evidence and topographical conditions, I propose a mountain trek that differs from the coastal route accepted by historians since Reinach in 1890. Cassius Dio said Mithridates outstripped Pompey's pursuit, fleeing by the Phasis River to reach the Sea of Azov and the Bosporus on foot. Plutarch says he traveled all the way around the Sea of Azov and down to Panticapion. Strabo states that Mithridates despaired of the route north of Dioscurius, the Clucor Pass, owing to the rugged mountains and ferocious inhabitants, the Zigi, and embarked on another route along the sea traversed with great difficulty. Perhaps because he himself was uncertain, Strabo's passage is ambiguous. The Greek word for embark can mean to set off marching or to set off in boats. English has similar dual meanings for embark and launch an attack. Both translations appear in scholarly translations of Strabo's passage. A further difficulty is that Strabo claims the Achaeans were friendly to Mithridates. Appian says they were hostile. It is Appian who offers the most specific details. In describing Macari's shock at his father's unexpected arrival, Appian states that Mithridates traveled over the pass known as the Scythian Keyhole, which no army had ever done before, and then journeyed through the lands of strange Scythian tribes around the Sea of Asof and the River Don, arriving in Panticapion. Mithridates had several options to consider. He rejected the Clucor Pass, north of Dioscurius, because of forbidding topography and fierce Zigi, rumored in antiquity to be cannibals. 
The Caspian Gates Pass at the far eastern end of the Caucasus Range was nearly nine hundred miles distant, and the Iberi, Albanoi, and other allies would have advised him that the way east was blocked by the Roman garrison at Armezai Citadel, and that Pompey's army was exploring near the Caspian. Armezai also controlled the main approach to the high pass over the central Caucasus, the Scythian Gates mentioned by Appian. Believing that crossing the central Caucasus, as implied in the other three sources, was impossible for even a small army, Reynac interpreted Strabo to mean that Mithridates marched along the shore from Dioscurius, emerging at the Taman Peninsula. This raises the question of why Mithridates would then travel all around the Sea of Azov instead of going directly to Phanagoria and Pantocopion. By Reynach's day, a modern road had been dynamited above the sea coast, but in antiquity there was only a narrow strip of beach, obstructed by deep gorges, marshes, and sheer cliffs. Reynach imagined that Mithridates and his army bypassed these obstacles by taking Camari, dugout kayaks, provided by friendly pirates, the Achaeans. Reynach's route entails several drawbacks. An army of three thousand stretched out single file along the narrow beach would be vulnerable to attack by Zijai and Achaean bandits. As Appian and others state, the Achaeans couldn't be counted on. This rugged coast had never been pacified as part of Mithridates' Black Sea Empire. Moreover, according to Strabo, each camera held only twenty-five people, requiring more than one hundred dugouts for Mithridates' army and equipment and Pompey's navy was patrolling the coast looking for Mithridates. If Reinach's theory is correct, this would have been an impressive feat. But I suggest that the route described by Appian, the pass over the mid-Caucasus known as the Scythian Keyhole, is the more likely route. This would take Mithridates on foot through friendly tribes to the heartland of the Scythian tribes around the Sea of Azov, matching the details preserved by Cassius Dio and Plutarch. The so-called Scythian keyhole, or gates, was only a faint rumor for Romans at the time, but in fact it was the most reliable way over the Caucasus, the major migration route for Eurasian nomads, traders, and invaders. The Persians had named this strategic pass Darial, Dar-e-Alan, Gate of the Alans, one of the nomadic tribes of Scythia whose territory lay over the pass. Tigranes' mother was an Alan, the region is now Alania, North Ossetia. Fortification ruins dating from 150 B.C. or earlier mentioned by Strabo are still visible in the pass. The Darial's narrow defile with vertical walls accounts for its ancient nickname, Scythian Keyhole. Famed for its wild grandeur, the Darial Pass is featured in Romantic Russian art and literature. The Georgian military road begun in 1799 follows and obliterates the ancient route. Today, this region is violently contested by Georgia, Russia, Chechnya, Ossetia, Ingushetia, and others. The main route to the Scythian keyhole, Darial, followed the Aragus River up from its confluence with the Cyrus to the Darial Gorge. Pompey had secured this approach, guarded by Armezai Citadel, but he was unaware that there was an alternate route, a backway, to the Darial Pass. From Dioscurius, a march of less than 150 miles, would take Mithridates to a lesser-known trail, near modern Kutaisi, separated from Pompey's garrison at Armezai by a hundred miles of rugged foothills. Described by Strabo, this steep winding path followed the Phasis River to its source in the Caucasus. The route crossed a hundred and twenty footbridges over rushing torrents and yawning gorges to the Mami San Pass at an elevation of nearly ten thousand feet. The Ossetian military road, built in 1854-89, to followed this ancient route. After crossing another pass, Roki, 9,800 feet in South Ossetia, ancient Iberia, this path joined the main route to the Darial Pass, about 8,000 feet. I propose that this daunting route, avoiding hostile tribes and the Roman navy, and bypassing Pompey's garrison at Armezai, was Mithridates' only hope of escape. Pompey and the Romans believed it was certain death to attempt to cross the massive wall of eternal snows at the edge of the known world. But Mithridates' plan, though extremely dangerous, was not as unrealistic as it seemed. 
Many of his warriors, including Hypsocratea, were recruited from Caucasia. They were already familiar with this traditional migration route, and they were used to cold weather at high altitude. Indeed, it may have been their local knowledge that led Mithridates to camp at Dioscurius and to cross at Darial, taking the lesser-known route up the Phasis River. Mithridates could also have learned of this important pass from his Scythian allies and his study of Cyrus the Great, who was the first to fortify Darial. The Caucasus is one of the most linguistically and ethnically diverse regions in the world. According to Strabo, seventy tribes, speaking seventy dialects, dwelled in the High Caucasus, living on milk, wild fruit, and game. In the winter, says Strabo, these peoples came down from the mountains to camp at Dioscurius and barter for salt and other goods. The northern branch of the Silk Route linked the Caspian and Black Seas. We know that in the winter of 66 to 65 BC, Mithridates was camped at Dioscurius. It follows that he learned the logistics of the Darial and other passes from these mountaineers, benefiting from their survival tips and scouts. Mithridates' experiences with winter battles in Achaea and Cyzicus, and the battles on ice fought by his general Neoptolemus in the Bosporus, as well as details in Xenophon's March of the Ten Thousand, could have helped him to anticipate the dangers of crossing the high snowfields. Xenophon had trekked forty-five miles over snow-bound mountains from Armenia to Pontus, a shorter journey, at a lower elevation, but with a much larger army. He was harassed by hostile tribes, something Mithridates could avoid. The freezing north wind cut Xenophon's men's faces like a knife. Many animals and soldiers were lost in snowdrifts. The men suffered frostbite and snow blindness. Remove your boots at night and shade your eyes with dark cloth, advised Xenophon. In planning his mountaineering expedition, Mithridates enjoyed three crucial advantages over Pompey. His small army was lightly armed, mountain-trained, and locally supplied. The Iranian-influenced tribes in the central Caucasus were his allies, and he possessed local information and friendly guides. According to Strabo, the strenuous passage through the Darial Pass was a journey of about a hundred and thirty miles, perhaps a week in good weather. But two or three thousand people traveling single file would stretch out at least five miles. Mithridates' crossing may have taken a month. Although the elevation of this route is consistently higher than the highest passes of the Alps, Strabo remarked that this pass could be traversable by early spring, but only with the right equipment. In Dioscurius, Mithridates could provide his army with winter clothing and boots, dried food and hardy pack animals, all paid for with gold coins from the Cinera horde. Snow gear could be obtained from the mountain people wintering in Dioscurius. For ascending the summits, Strabo described their snow-shoe-like footwear. The people fastened to their feet broad shoes made of rawhide like drum covers, furnished with spikes to grip the snow and ice. Others tie large spiked wooden discs to their boots. For transporting loads they made sleds of animal hides. On this route, continued Strabo, whole caravans are often swallowed up in the snow by extremely violent blizzards and avalanches. For this reason, says Strabo, travelers carry long hollow sticks which they can push to the surface of snowdrifts to breathe and signal their location so they can be dug out. He also told how to find drinking water trapped in large air bubbles under the ice, and even mentioned the clouds of tiny high-altitude insects that hatch in the snow. Mithridates' allies would have kept him informed about Pompey's movements in the winter and spring of 65 B.C. Pompey's early spring expedition to the Caspian provided Mithridates the opportunity to sneak up to the Darial Pass, avoiding the garrison at Armazai. The adventure of setting off once again into the unknown was reminiscent of Mithridates' previous daring journeys with loyal entourages. Now he was about sixty-nine years old, vigorous and optimistic, this time accompanied by the love of his life, Hypsicratea. Let us follow them as they ascend the trail north along the Phasis torrent. The oak, almond, and maple trees give way to beech, spruce, and pine. Golden finches flit through the forest. The band crosses alpine meadows dotted with the first purple primroses and cobalt gentians of spring. The path begins to climb, crossing stone bridges over tremendous waterfalls and gaping gorges up steep switchbacks. Each night the long line of soldiers make campfires. 
They sleep wrapped in furs wherever they have halted on the narrow trail. There is game to hunt, ibex, mountain goats, hares. But there are dangers, too. Bears, Persian leopards, wolves, and frostbite, blizzards and avalanches. Here and there the travelers glimpse Caucasian wall creepers, tiny crimson birds often mistaken for butterflies clinging to the sheer granite walls. Turning east, the guides lead Mithridates' band across the dangerous ice fields of the high Mamison Pass, then the Roki Pass. As they approach the snow line at nine thousand feet, trees disappear, the temperature drops, oxygen thins. The desolate call of the Caucasian snowcock echoes in the bare rocks. Then, as the army turns north to join the main Darial footpath, ahead looms the sixteen thousand five hundred foot peak of Mount Kazbiek, mantled in perpetual snows. Large Eurasian griffon vultures soar over the black basalt crags, the fabled site of Prometheus's ordeal. Single file, Mithridates' army threads through the narrow keyhole of Darial, two perpendicular walls of rock, the gates, less than thirty feet apart, surrounded by glacier-capped peaks. Mithridates' trek over the highest passes of the snowbound Caucasus Mountains in early spring, with an army, was an epic journey in a long career distinguished by daring exploits. The exhilaration of accomplishing this astonishing feat, while Pompey searched in vain for his quarry on the other side of the mountains, must have restored Mithridates' sense of invincibility and destiny. Across Scythia to the Crimea The descent through alpine pastures was relatively easy, onto the steppes of what is now South Russia. Here, the enormity of the land and sky stuns the senses with monotony so vast that it achieves majestic proportions. The sight of unbroken horizons in every direction overwhelms some travelers, but I imagine that for someone like Mithridates and Hypsicratea, who loved to ride and hated to be boxed in, the sea of grass represented freedom. The only features on the flat prairie were kurgans, tomb mounds, some ancient, others recent. It has been said that the steppes seem incomplete without a horse and rider, and these soon appear to meet Mithridates' army. In the territories of strange and warlike Scythian tribes, says Appian, they traveled partly by permission and partly by force, so respected and feared was Mithridates still, even though he was a fugitive. Around the Azov and across the Don, nomadic chieftains and their bands rode out to greet Mithridates, bestowing gifts and horses and escorting him to the next territory. His reception was very different from that of Darius. It must have thrilled Mithridates to be welcomed in these immense fertile lands of his fellow nomads. Appian points out that he was a celebrity here. His deeds were legendary his great empire renowned, and most of all his courage and perseverance in defying Rome deeply admired. An exuberant Mithridates renewed alliances, heartily promising to send his beautiful daughters to marry the chieftains, and engaging them in his grand design to march across Europe and over the Alps to destroy the Roman wolves in their den. Meanwhile, in Panticopion, Macaries was stunned to hear that his father had crossed the Caucasus by way of the Scythian gates. Knowing his father's fearsome temper, Macaries killed himself. His brother, Pharnaces, welcomed his father. Mithridates was often heard to say Pharnaces would be his successor. Taking charge of his kingdom of the Bosporus and Scythia, Mithridates put to death several disloyal former friends there, including some Romans who had plotted against him. Mithridates' eunuch, Goros, was said to be the instigator of many cruel tortures and executions. True to his ideals, Mithridates spared inferiors who acted out of loyalty to corrupt superiors. There were two shocking exceptions, however. Mithridates killed a son named Exippodras for conspiracy, and he was enraged by Stratonices' bargain with Pompey. Betrayal by sons or women he loved was unendurable to Mithridates, and his revenge was particularly spiteful. He seized their son, Zipheres, and killed him on the deck of a ship in view of Phanagoria's castle. He threw the body overboard, while Stratonice in her tower watched in anguish. In this descent into suspicion and cruelty, Mithridates resembled Alexander, who, near the end of his life, became violently suspicious, seeing plots and conspiracies everywhere, spying on companions and torturing friends. But perhaps Mithridates' paranoia and fury 
were exacerbated at this time by a serious illness. According to Appian, the king withdrew from public view because of an outbreak of nasty ulcers on his face. For some time he remained inside his palace on the Acropolis, Mount Mithridates, overlooking Panticopion. Only three eunuch doctors were allowed in his presence. Had the king been poisoned? This intriguing ancient medical mystery hasn't been seriously investigated by modern historians. Duggan supposed Mithridates suffered a rash caused by strange food eaten during his terrible journey. It seems more likely that the lesions resulted from a severe case of frostbite from the trek over the Caucasus. Frostbite causes the skin to blister and redden, resulting in hard purple-black areas of necrosis and gangrene. Another strong possibility is that the facial ulcerations, as well as the episode of acute paranoia, were the result of long-term ingestion of arsenic, part of Mithridates' anti-poisoning regimen. Prolonged exposure to arsenic can cause bouts of mental imbalance, hallucinations, and paranoia. Arsenic also causes keratoses, which progress after ten to twenty years to skin cancers. Notably, frostbite causes arsenic-related skin cancers to putrefy. Frostbite, combined with a lifetime of tiny doses of arsenic and other photosensitizing toxins, such as rue and St. John's wort, appears to be the best explanation of Mithridates' skin ailment. Appian says the ulcers were healed, or perhaps covered up, by the eunuch doctors. It's unknown how long Mithridates remained out of the public eye, apparently some months, curtailing crucial face-to-face contact with his followers. Petition for Peace Mithridates usually went to war as a last resort, after what he saw as rejection of his attempts to negotiate with the Romans. Now that he had regained the Bosporan kingdom, and in light of recent events, including Tigranes' humiliating surrender to Pompey, Mithridates first considered options for avoiding further wars with Rome. He felt optimistic that he could make a deal similar to that given to Tigranes. So it came to pass that while Pompey was busy annexing Syria in 64 BC, he received a message from Mithridates. Not only was the indestructible renegade king alive in the Crimea, but he had kept track of Pompey's movements. Mithridates promised that if Rome would restore his paternal kingdom of Pontus, he would pay tribute to Rome. His request asked for nothing more than what Tigranes had received. But Pompey rejected the petition demanding that Mithridates pay obeisance in person, as Tigranes had done. Understandably wary and characteristically proud, Mithridates refused, but he offered to send an adult son, probably Pharnaces, his designated heir, to petition Pompey. Denied Pompey rejected this offer too. Ignoring Mithridates, he pushed further south, seeking adventure and glory. He made war on the Jews in Palestine, capturing their king and the holy city of Jerusalem. In late summer of 64 BC, Pompey attacked the Nabataean Arabs in Petra, Jordan. Some of his soldiers began to murmur that their general was evading his patriotic duty to destroy Rome's real enemy, Mithridates. They had heard rumors that the new Hannibal was preparing to march a new army across the Alps to invade their fatherland. Indeed, Mithridates always had contingency plans, and usually found the means to carry them out. He had fought the Romans over a period of forty-six years with intermittent successes, wrote the historian Justin. He had suffered defeat before Rome's greatest generals, only to rise again greater and more glorious than before in renewing his struggle. As Cassius Dio remarked, relying more on his willpower now than on his actual power, Mithridates did not falter. Sustained by his dream of saving the East from Roman rule, and by his own astonishing resilience, Mithridates prepared to make war for what would prove to be the last time. His illustrious ancestors must have been much on his mind at this point in his life. Darius had sent spies to Italy and contemplated an invasion of Carthage, Persia's great rival empire across the Mediterranean. Alexander, who dreamed of conquering all India, had persevered despite great dangers and obstacles. 
Like his hero, Mithridates had suffered grievous wounds and shared hardships and treasures with his soldiers, drinking from rivers fouled with blood, crossing streams bridged by corpses, surviving on grass and seeds, digging through snowbound mountains, sailing rough seas, and traversing parched lands. Yet, in spite of all the setbacks dealt by fortune, all the sieges, pursuits, revolts, desertions, riots of subject peoples and defections of kings, Mithridates, like Alexander, set his mind on high enterprise, clung to his high hopes, and refused to submit to defeat. Believing that his request to rule peacefully in his homeland of Pontus was unfairly denied, Mithridates had three options, surrender, flee, or attack. Accept Pompey's unconditional terms, groveling like Tigranes? Out of the question. Mithridates rejected flight, too, but if he stayed, war with Rome was inevitable. He chose a bold offensive strategy. The king resumed his Hannibalistic plan to invade Italy. Appian called this scheme chimerical. Modern historians debate whether it was a rational strategy or the sign of a desperate, even deranged mind. The king, analyzing Mithridates' foreign policy, wondered whether the wildly unrealistic plan was invented by the Romans or Pharnaces to paint Mithridates as a would-be world conqueror. But, notably, in 74 BC, when the Senate financed Lucullus's campaign, Rome had believed that Mithridates intended to invade Italy by sea. It's telling that Roman historians of this era argued over whether or not Alexander the Great could have successfully invaded Italy as Hannibal had done. As we saw, Mithridates had promised the Italian rebels that he would come to help them when the time was right. Some Romans thought his invasion plan was feasible. In the Senate, Cicero declared that Mithridates, despite having lost his army and having been driven from his kingdom, is even now planning something against us in the most distant corners of the earth. Adaptability, surprise, and creativity were strong features of Mithridates' character. Dugan saw the plan as the stupendous fantasy of a solitary mind, yet he appreciated the logic of it. From the Crimea, it was an easy march across friendly lands to the mouth of the Danube. Following the Danube to the Alps was a journey of about six hundred miles. Half the distance Mithridates' beleaguered band had traveled from Pontus to Colchis and on to Panticapion. After the first obstacle, the Iron Gates Gorge in the Carpathians, the Alps crossing over the Brenner Pass would be easy compared to that of the Scythian Keyhole in the Caucasus. One would emerge in the lands of the Gauls and Etrurians, chafing under Rome's rule. Reynac also recognized the feasibility of the plan. Who could predict what would happen, he asked, if suddenly a vast army of a hundred thousand barbarians, led by an invincible and brilliant king, appeared on the plains of northern Italy? By nature, attracted to grand projects, wrote Cassius Dio, Mithridates considered his many victories and failures, and decided nothing ventured, nothing gained. Should he fail, he preferred to perish along with his kingdom with pride, honor, and liberty intact. Mithridates directed his commanders, Roman officers, and Pharnaces to prepare for war on Italy. They levied heavy tributes and taxes to make up for the loss of his wealth in Pontus, began a massive fort-building program, and drafted workers and soldiers. By 64 BC, his new army numbered 6,000 crack troops, trained in Roman-style fighting, and a great multitude of others, steppe nomads, mountain fighters, archers, lancers, and slingers. Mithridates minted coins at a high rate, stored grain and other supplies, cut timber for ships and siege machines, set up factories to make armor, spears, swords, and projectiles, and killed many plow oxen whose tough sinews were needed for catapults. These war preparations dismayed and burdened many in the peaceable kingdom of the Bosporus, so far untouched by Rome's Mithridatic wars. Then, in 64 or 63 BC, a frightening natural calamity, a strong earthquake, seemed to portend a regime change. Some recalled the devastating quake that had foretold Tigranes' loss of Syria. The earthquake was described by Cassius Dio, Livy, and Orosius. It occurred while Mithridates was celebrating the festival of the goddess Demeter. The epicenter is unknown, but the tremor was severe at Panticapion, according to evidence discovered by Russian archaeologists in the ruins of the fortress and other structures. 
According to Cassius Dio, the quake was felt even in Rome. Several cities, allied with Mithridates, suffered destruction which fueled anxiety about the old king's future. Revolt in the Bosporus In order to secure both sides of the Bosporus, Mithridates dispatched his eunuch, Trypho, to take charge of Phanagoria. Inside the citadel, under the care of other eunuchs, were Stratonice, mourning her murdered son Zipheres, and Mithridates' children, Artaphernes, Eupatra, or Sabarus, Cleopatra the Younger, and their little brothers Darius, Xerxes, Cyrus, and Oscothres. Things seemed to be proceeding according to plan until an act of revenge and terror intervened. A citizen of Phanagoria rushed up and stabbed the eunuch Trypho. The killer, a Greek named Castor, incited Phanagoria to revolt. Inflamed by Mithridates' unpopular war preparations, a mob set fire to the citadel to smoke out the royal family. Artaphernes and the children were taken prisoner. One courageous daughter, Cleopatra the Younger, resisted and escaped on a ship sent by Mithridates to rescue her. The rebellion at Phanagoria sparked a domino effect in the Bosporan kingdom. Mithridates distrusted his army. Compulsory service under a commander, perceived to be unlucky, was a formula for mutiny. He quickly gathered his daughters in Panticapion's harem. Guarded by palace eunuchs, with an escort of five hundred soldiers, these girls were sent to the Scythian chieftains, to whom they had been promised with an urgent request that they send reinforcements to Panticopion. The two youngest girls, Nyssa and Mithridates, betrothed to the kings of Egypt and Cyprus, remained with Mithridates. Mithridates' overbearing eunuch advisers were despised by the soldiers because they isolated the king from his subjects and carried out purges. The caravan to Scythia wasn't long on the road before the soldiers killed the eunuchs and kidnapped the young princesses, intending to deliver them to Pompey for a reward. Appian expresses wonder at Mithridates' energetic and resourceful response to these new calamities. Although bereft of so many of his children and castles, and of his whole kingdom, and too old for war, and unable to expect any immediate help from the Scythians, there was still no trace of humility befitting his present circumstances. Mithridates stubbornly pursued his idea of invading Italy by land. After all, his feat of crossing the Caucasus surpassed Hannibal's crossing of the Alps. He knew that Hannibal's ability to attract insurgent Italians to join him had terrified Rome. Similar opportunities for an invader of Italy existed now. As Appian points out, Mithridates knew that almost all of Italy had recently revolted because of hatred of Rome, and that tens of thousands had joined the Thracian gladiator Spartacus. Mithridates had long cultivated the friendship of the Gauls of Europe who resisted Rome, and he could count on the Scythians and other northern allies. In Mithridates' grand vision, he and an enormous army of Rome-hating warriors from the Caspian Sea to Gaul would smash the empire once and for all. It was, acknowledged Appian, a very bold plan. If he could succeed, Mithridates would cover himself with spectacular glory. His mind filled with these ideas, Mithridates hastened to contact the Gauls. But his officers and soldiers, even the Roman exiles, were taken aback by the sweeping design. They began to get cold feet. The awesome scale of Mithridates' vision was intimidating. Many shrank from the idea of waging war in a distant foreign land, says Appian, against an enemy they hadn't been able to overcome in their own countries. His Bosporan subjects had enjoyed autonomy for the past twenty-five years. Now, heavy taxes and mandatory army service seemed to contradict Mithridates' core values and former promises. Some soldiers, who had served him for years, were becoming disillusioned. They had hoped to retire in the wealthy Bosporan kingdom. The two or three thousand who had come over the Caucasus with their king each had a full year's pay. They had hoped to make a new life. And it is worth noting that half a century separated the septuagenarian Mithridates from his royest recruits. Some older followers perceived the king's grandiose plan as a suicidal exit strategy. Not unreasonably, they believed it was a sign of despair. It offered a way for Mithridates to end his life honorably, fighting for a noble lost cause rather than surrendering. How much better to die on the battlefield than to be strangled at the end of Pompey's triumph. 
Yet Mithridates was still so deeply respected and beloved for his courage, his generosity, and his unbowed perseverance that the majority of his followers remained loyal and silent about their doubts. For even in his dire misfortunes, marveled Appian, there was nothing petty or contemptible about King Mithridates. He was the last independent monarch left standing in the new Roman world. But one key figure dared to act decisively on his fears and doubts. Pharnaces, Mithridates' favorite son and successor, was alarmed and motivated. The kingdom he was to inherit would be ruined if his father really attempted to invade Italy. Pharnaces, in his thirties, believed he could bargain with Pompey, but he had to prevent his father from carrying out his crazy plan. Pharnaces began secret talks with friends about usurping his father's crown. Pharnaces' Rebellion Pharnaces' treachery was discovered by the omniscient Mithridates, of course. The conspirators were tortured and killed, except for Pharnaces. According to Appian, Pharnaces was spared, thanks to Mithridates' old friend, General Metrophanes. He persuaded Mithridates that it would be wrong and inauspicious to put to death the son he loved most, his designated heir. Disagreements were common in wartime, counseled the old general, but they healed once the wars were over. Perhaps Metrophanes spoke of the sorrow such an act would bring to Mithridates' grandchildren, Pharnaces' children Darius and Dynamis. It seems that affection for Pharnaces and concern for the future of his kingdom overcame Mithridates' instinct for self-preservation. Mithridates, who had lost so many and so much, pardoned his son. It was the first time he had ever forgiven a traitor. As the king retired to his bedchamber, did he have second thoughts? Or was he already reconciled to the reality that Pharnaces would become king either now or in the near future? Pharnaces, perhaps thinking of the fate of so many of his brothers, most recently the murders of Zipheres and Exipidras and Macari's suicide, couldn't believe his father could ever truly forgive him. He sneaked to the camp of the Roman exiles and magnified the dangers which they well knew of invading Italy. Promising great rewards, Pharnaces convinced them to desert Mithridates. Then he sent emissaries to other camps and ships in the harbor and won them over too. All agreed that the next morning they would rise up and demand that the king abdicate in favor of Pharnaces. In his castle, Mithridates was awakened by angry voices. Many citizens joined the army's revolt, because in Appian's view they were fickle and worried about the king's string of bad luck, or because they feared being the only outsiders in an overwhelming rebellion. Mithridates sent retainers to find out what the commotion was about. The mob surrounded the castle. Soon he could hear for himself the people shouting out their grievances and demands. We don't want a king ruled by eunuchs. We don't want a king who kills his own sons, his generals, and his friends. We want a young king instead of an old one. We want Pharnaces to be king. Mithridates went down to the square to reason with the people. At the same time, some fearful guards from the palace ran to join the mob. But rabble-rousers in the crowd pointed at the king, refusing to welcome the guards until they proved their commitment by doing something irreparable. Some of the mob ran to the royal stables and killed Mithridates' horses. Mithridates quickly returned to his castle. He climbed the spiral stone stairs to the highest tower. From the tower window, Mithridates saw Pharnaces appear in the square below. He heard the people hail his son as their new king. Someone rushed up with a sacred papyrus leaf from the temple garden and offered Pharnaces this makeshift crown. A great roar of approval went up from the crowd. Chapter 15 In the Tower What happened in the tower after Pharnaces was acclaimed king? There was apparently only one witness, Mithridates' bodyguard, Batuitus, and it's not clear that he lived to tell the story. What we do know comes from Roman historians, who pieced together the scene from the contradictory reports of people in Panticopion at the time, interpretations of the evidence found in the tower, and hearsay and popular traditions about Mithridates' last hours. Let us look first at what the ancient writers tell us, and then consider how to read between the lines to reconstruct events and make sense of incomplete evidence. 
the most deadly of all poisons. Mithridates' worst fear was that he would be turned over to Pompey for a degrading public display and death in Rome. He understood that he had lost the goodwill of his people. He acknowledged that his son was the new king. His only hope was to go into exile. He sent several messages to Pharnaces requesting safe passage out of Panticopion. Not one of his messengers returned. Next, Mithridates sent old friends to petition his son, but either they were killed by Pharnaces' followers, according to Appian, or they were convinced to turn against the king, Cassius Dio's report. His entreaties for safe passage unanswered, Mithridates found himself in the same straits as Hannibal had been in 182 B.C., trapped in his palace in Bithynia. Like Hannibal, Mithridates had prepared for this situation. Mithridates thanked his bodyguard and other companions who had remained faithful. As in previous catastrophes, Mithridates directed his eunuchs to distribute poison to the courtesans and children in the seraglio. The two youngest princesses, Mithridates and Nyssa, were being raised in the palace with their father, which explains how they came to be in the tower with him. They were betrothed, but hadn't yet reached the age of marriage, so they were perhaps between nine and thirteen. According to the literary traditions, the king and his daughters took poison while Betuitus stood guard. Mithridates uncapped the secret compartment in the hilt of his dagger and tipped out the little golden vial beautifully crafted by Scythian artists. The two girls entreated their father to share his poison with them, begging him to stay alive until they died. He held them in his arms while they sipped from the vial. The drug took immediate effect. When the girls were dead... Mithridates drank the rest, but the poison didn't kill him. He paced energetically to propel the toxin through his body. He became very weak, but death didn't come. In the oft-repeated legend, heavy with irony and recounted in nearly every ancient version of Mithridates' death, the king, who had made himself invulnerable to poisoning by ingesting infinitesimal doses of poisons all his life, was in the end unable to poison himself. Mithridates' last words were widely reported. I, the absolute monarch of so great a kingdom, am now unable to die by poison because I foolishly used other drugs as antidotes. Although I have kept watch and guarded against all poisons, I neglected to take precautions against that most deadly of all poisons, which lurks in every king's household, the faithlessness of army, friends, and children. This pithy parable was taken up by medieval chroniclers and repeated by modern historians because the moral seemed so poetically apt for the poison king. But logic raises objections. If the Mithridatium regimen was effective through what is now known as the process of hormesis, as Mithridates certainly believed, what would be the point of his lifelong precaution of carrying poison for suicide unless it was a carefully calculated lethal dose of some special fast-acting poison that wasn't included in his daily antidote? Over his lifetime, Mithridates had tested numerous poisons on human subjects and knew exactly how much he would require for a quick, private, dignified death. On the other hand, if the Mithridatium did not actually shield against poison, then why was the precisely measured dose ineffective? There is a natural explanation that addresses both questions, overlooked by modern scholars, but evident in the ancient reports. The king had shared his single dose with two others, at least halving the amount. There wasn't enough left to kill a man of Mithridates' size and constitution. Like his unexpected mercy for his traitorous son Pharnaces, Mithridates' compassion for his innocent daughters brought harm to himself. The true irony is that his sacrifice was repaid with his own suffering. Perhaps this was a fitting mythic ending after all for one who had been hailed as a savior. When it became obvious that the poison was inadequate, Mithridates drew his sword and attempted to stab himself but physical weakness and mental distress interfered with his ability to drive the sword home. At that point he called upon his faithful guard, Betuitus, who faltered before his king's majestic countenance. According to Appian's version of the tradition, Mithridates encouraged Betuitus. Your strong right arm has kept me safe from my enemies many times in the past. Now I shall benefit most of all if you will kill me to save me, for so many years the ruler of so great a kingdom— from being a captive led in a Roman triumph. Deeply moved, 
Petuitus rendered the king the service he desired. Cassius Dio gives an alternate version. Farnese's soldiers hastened his end with their swords and spears. But Reynac reasonably suggested that Farnese's soldiers burst into the tower too late to capture the king alive, and in frustration mutilated his body. The ancient historians agree that after the bodies were discovered in the tower, Farnese sent a message to Pompey, now far away in Petra, requesting permission to rule his father's kingdom as a friend of Rome. Farnese embalmed his father's corpse, clothed it in Mithridates' kingly raiment and armor, and sent it, along with the royal weapons, scepter, and other treasures, across the Black Sea to Pontus. Other triremes carried the dead bodies of the royal family, including Nyssa and Mithridates, and the surviving children, Artifernes, Eupatra, Orsabarus, and little Darius, Oxithres, Xerxes, and Cyrus. The Pharnaces also turned over numerous Greeks and barbarians who had served Mithridates, including the men responsible for capturing Manius Aquilius, executed by molten gold for starting the Mithridatic Wars twenty-five years earlier. The presence of these men with their king after such a tumultuous quarter century is a testament to the remarkable loyalty of some of Mithridates' followers. Pompey's Victory Months later, Pompey received the news in camp somewhere between Petra and Jericho. Messengers flourishing javelins wrapped in victory laurels arrived, exulting that Mithridates had been forced by his son Pharnaces to commit suicide in Panticopion. Pompey clambered to the top of a hastily constructed mound of pack saddles to announce the tidings to his troops. Great feasts and sacrifices followed, just as though they had won a great battle and killed huge numbers of the enemy. Pompey's biographer Plutarch hints at a whiff of resentment and annoyance in Pompey's awkward situation. Indeed, what in the world was Pompey doing nearly a thousand miles south of the Black Sea? He had been sent to kill or capture Mithridates in 66 BC, yet Mithridates not only had escaped, but had ruled the Bosporan kingdom in peace for the past three years and had been preparing to invade Italy. Now the elimination of Mithridates terminated Pompey's legal justification for continuing to win personal glory in the Near East. Pompey sent an official letter to the Senate in Rome. The news was greeted with great relief and joy, and Cicero, as consul, proclaimed ten days of thanksgiving. Meanwhile, Pompey took his time traveling to Pontus to receive the remains of his adversary. But when Pompey's soldiers opened the royal coffin on the beach, the dead man's face was totally unrecognizable. Everyone knew from widely publicized portraits on coins and statues what Mithridates looked like but decomposition made identification of the corpse impossible. According to Plutarch, the embalming was poorly done. The face had rotted because the brain hadn't been removed. But the long, damp sea voyage and exposure at Amysus in summertime, the effects of poison, the ravages of Mithridates' recent facial ulcerations, and any mutilations by Farnese's soldiers would also have done their work. The obliterated face immediately raised suspicion. Was this really the body of Mithridates the Great? Had Mithridates' brilliant halo of Hwarna, spirit or luck, truly been extinguished at last? For superstitious reasons, Pompey averted his eyes, or perhaps didn't care to look on the corpse after hearing that the face wasn't worth seeing. Those who did examine the corpse claimed to recognize it by the scars. Modern scholars have accepted this claim without careful analysis. Mithridates' most distinguishing scar, of course, was the mark on his forehead from the lightning strike in infancy, but that wouldn't have been visible on the decomposed face. For the same reason, the scar from his cheek wound in the Battle of 67 BC couldn't be seen. That leaves the scar from the sword gash on his thigh from the same battle and the recent fatal stabbing wound dealt by Pituitus with no witnesses. If the body had been mutilated by soldiers, as Cassius Dio reported, old scars would be difficult to read. A former friend of Mithridates, Gaius, was part of Pharnaces' delegation, according to Plutarch. Perhaps he was one of those who identified the body by the thigh scar. But thigh wounds were commonplace for anyone who rode a horse in battle, and Mithridates' distinctive facial scars were obliterated. This means that the royal paraphernalia in the coffin was the only physical evidence that the dead man was King Mithridates.
The armor, cuirass, and greaves matched Mithridates' reputedly large proportions. The helmet was ornate, perhaps with a hyacinth-dyed plume like that of Cyrus the Great. There were other rich trappings of royalty, the purple cloak, Mithridates' opulent sword, the scabbard alone worth four hundred talents, his gem-encrusted scepter, a golden crown. Plutarch says Pompey admired these marvelously wrought things and was amazed at the size and splendor of the arms and raiment that Mithridates used to wear. After Pompey left the scene, the Roman officers and some men who had once served Mithridates circled the loot like jackals, grabbing up the scabbard, haggling over the crown and other treasures. Pompey's true feelings are unknown. Foremost must have been awe at this momentous occasion, the end of an era the passing of a charismatic, grandly ambitious, and independent monarch who had been Rome's relentless, elusive enemy for as long as Pompey had been alive. But Plutarch also suggested that there was a sense of anticlimax at the unexpectedly easy completion of Pompey's campaign, which he had been prolonging to great advantage. Frustration, too. Mithridates had slipped away yet again, ever defiant, and now forever immune to revenge, denying Pompey the glory of personally delivering to the Roman people and Senate the perpetrator of so many outrages and decades of warfare. Suicide, in antiquity, as in modern times, could be a noble escape from tyranny or capture by the enemy. It also robs the victor of the satisfaction of killing his enemy or bringing him to justice. The historian Cassius Dio stressed that Pompey didn't subject the body of Mithridates to any indignities or desecration. Instead, Pompey consciously copied Alexander's chivalrous treatment of the remains of his Persian enemy, King Darius. Treating the corpse with respect, Pompey commended Mithridates' bold exploits and declared him the greatest king of his time. He paid for a royal funeral and ordered that the body be placed with Mithridates' forefathers. No other enemy of Rome had ever been accorded such honors. As historian Jakob Munk Hertje points out, by treating Mithridates as Darius had been treated, Pompey contrived to demote the Philhellene king to an oriental despot, while he himself appeared as the new Roman Alexander. More questions. Where was the body buried? According to Cassius Dio, Mithridates was placed in the tombs of his ancestors. Plutarch and Appian believed that he was laid to rest in the tombs of the kings at Sinope, because that had become the royal residence of Pontus. In 1890, Reynac assumed that a new royal necropolis must have existed in Sinope, but the traditional mausoleum of Mithridates' forefathers was the set of rock-cut tombs at Amasaya above the Iris River. Extensive modern archaeology in Sinope has failed to turn up any tombs that would qualify as those of Mithridates or his royal ancestors, so the ambiguity surrounding the identity of Mithridates' body is further compounded by uncertainty about his gravesite. Ambiguity over a venerated figure's final resting place is one of the hallmarks of a mythic hero, a sure sign that Mithridates had passed into the realm of legend. The legendary aura and mystery surrounding Mithridates' demise raises other questions unanswered in the ancient histories. What, for example, became of his devoted Amazon companion, Hypsocratea? If it was known, or even rumored that Hypsocratea had been poisoned, killed, or captured, one would expect this to be included in the accounts of the fates of other members of Mithridates' family and entourage. The disappearance from the historical record of this appealing figure, the brave horsewoman who was so intimately involved with Mithridates in his last years, leaves a blank page too tempting to ignore. Queen Hypsicrates' love for Mithridates knew no bounds, declared Valerius Maximus. She was devoted to him, body and soul. Her extraordinary fidelity was Mithridates' greatest solace and comfort in the most bitter and difficult conditions, for he considered that he was at home, even when wandering in defeat, because she was in exile with him. Even Théodore Renac fell under the spell of this romantic passion sincère. Renac pictured Hypsicratea, the last living embodiment of his lost kingdom, tenderly comforting Mithridates in defeat. 
the novelist Michael Curtis Ford accounted for Hypsocrates' disappearance by imagining that she had been swallowed by a crevasse in the ice during the Caucasus crossing, leaving Mithridates in true mourning for the first time in his life. Medieval and Renaissance authors also speculated about Hypsocrates' fate. In an illustrated manuscript of Boccaccio's famous women, the artist depicted Mithridates and Hypsocrates drinking chalices of poison together with the king's two daughters and their retainer, Betuitus. Some French dramas of the 1600s about Mithridates also placed Hypsocrates in the tower, succumbing to poison with the king and princesses. Hypsicrates did possess the poison that Mithridates had given her after the defeat in the moonlight battle, and she could have committed suicide, but she was young, strong, resourceful, and free, not compelled to accept death like a courtesan trapped in the harem. An alternative story, in which Hypsicrates survived, is just as plausible. No ancient account speaks of Hypsicrates after the winter of 63 BC, but an exciting recent discovery by Russian archaeologists in Phanagoria proves that Hypsicrates did survive the Caucasus crossing and was with Mithridates after he regained the kingdom of the Bosporus. An inscription on the base for a statue of Hypsicrates honors her as the wife of King Mithridates' Eupator Dionysus. Unfortunately, the statue itself is missing, but the inscription tells us that Hypsicrates was commemorated as Mithridates' queen in the Bosporan kingdom. The inscription holds another extraordinary surprise. So, Hypsicrates was in the Bosporus before Pharnaces' revolt, but an idle life at Mithridates' court in Panticopion might not have suited the independent horsewoman warrior. It wouldn't be unreasonable for Mithridates to assign her military duties associated with his war preparations. Perhaps she was away during Pharnaces' revolt, carrying out some mission on His Majesty's service. Mithridates often employed close friends as envoys. Hypsicrates could have been dispatched to visit the nomads of the north or west to prepare for the invasion of Italy. She and Mithridates might have expected to be reunited on the march. If Hypsicrates was in Panticopion in 63 BC, one would suppose that Mithridates arranged for her safety at the first signs of Pharnaces' revolt. Was she among the soldiers escorting the princesses to Scythia? The only escape route would have been into Scythia. She and Mithridates might have hoped to meet there in triumph or in exile, if he received safe passage. Could Hypsicrates have been captured by Pharnaces and delivered to Pompey? If so, such a prize would have been displayed prominently in Pompey's triumph. But that's implausible, since her name is not included in the very detailed records of that celebration. Remember, you are mortal. Pompey's triumph took place in 61 B.C., two years after his victory. For two days all Rome marveled at a spectacle of such magnitude and extravagance that it surpassed all previous triumphs. As Appian pointed out, no Roman had ever vanquished so powerful an enemy as Mithridates the Great, nor conquered so many nations extending Roman rule to the Euphrates and the Black Sea. There were seven hundred captured ships on view in the harbor, and countless wagons loaded with barbarian armor and weaponry and bronze ship prows. Banners and inscriptions lauded Pompey's capture of a thousand castles and nine hundred cities. There were carts laden with an astounding twenty thousand talents worth of silver and gold coins, vessels and jewelry. Litters heaped with millions of coins, chests of carved gems, truly the official records of Pompey's incredible plunder were exhaustive and too exhausting to catalogue in full here. It had taken Pompey's secretaries thirty days just to make an inventory of the two thousand onyx and gold chalices from Mithridates' hoard at Talora, and only a fraction of the loot was actually included in the procession. Not to be outdone by Lucullus's lone cherry tree, Pompey even paraded two exotic trees from Judea, ebony and balsam. A host of 324 captives marched in the parade, among them Mithridates' grandson Tigranes, the son of Tigranes the Great, with his wife and daughters, and Zosimi, Tigranes' courtesan. Poor Nyssa, Mithridates' sister, was trotted out again to walk in shame, beside five of Mithridates' sons, Artaphernes, Cyrus, Oxithres, Darius, Xerxes, and princesses Eupatra and Orsabarus. There were various kings and royal families of Mithridates' allies, followed by Aristobulus, king of the Jews. 
A troop of Amazons captured by Pompey in the Caucasus was led past the crowd. Only Aristobulus and Tigranes the Younger were strangled after the parade. As in Lucullus's triumph, King Mithridates himself was conspicuously absent. In his place his throne and scepter were carried aloft, followed by litters of antique Persian divans and old silver and gold chariots, treasures passed down to Mithridates from Darius I. Next came a large silver statue of Mithridates' grandfather, Pharnaces I, and the marble statue of Hercules, holding his little son Telephus, modeled on Mithridates. Surpassing Lucullus's life-sized golden statue of Mithridates, a colossal ten-foot-tall solid gold statue of the king was displayed by Pompey. Pompey also commissioned large painted portraits of Mithridates and his family. Another series of giant paintings illustrated key scenes from the Mithridatic Wars. For a spectator, this narrative sequence of images would have produced the effect of the frames of a stop-motion animation film or the panels of a graphic novel. Here were Mithridates and his barbarian multitudes attacking— It was Mithridates losing ground, and Mithridates besieged. There were Tigranes and Mithridates leading their magnificent hordes, followed by images of these great armies in defeat, and finally Mithridates' secret flight by night. Next came a series of emotionally gripping paintings, showing how Mithridates had died in his tower, drinking poison with the daughters who chose to perish with him. These, of course, were scenes that no Roman had witnessed. They were based on artistic license and second- and third-hand reports. Taking credit for Farnese's revolt, Pompey boasted that he had accomplished what Sulla and Lucullus had failed to do, bring about the death of the untamed king of Pontus. The inscription on his dedication of war spoils announced Pompey the Great had completed a thirty years' war and routed, scattered, slew, or received the surrender of twelve million one hundred and eighty-three thousand people, Sanko captured 846 ships and subdued the lands from the Sea of Azov to the Red Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. Pompey restored to the Roman people the command of the seas and triumphed over Asia, Pontus, Armenia, Paphlagonia, Cappadocia, Cilicia, Syria, the Scythians, Jews, Albanoi, Iberi, Arabs, Cretans, Bastarni, and in addition to these over kings Mithridates and Tigranes. For Rome, commented Plutarch, the death of Mithridates was like the destruction of ten thousand enemies in one fell swoop. Emphasizing the greatness of Mithridates and his ultimate defeat served to aggrandize Pompey's own accomplishments, and after four decades of conflict a certain admiration and awe surrounded this king who eclipsed all other kings, a noble ruler who had reigned fifty-seven years, who had subdued the barbarians, who took over Asia and Greece, and who resisted Rome's greatest commanders, and shrugged off what should have been crushing defeats. A warrior who never gave up, but renewed his struggle again and again, and then, against all odds, had died an old man by his own choice in the kingdom of his fathers. Mithridates' life had been a roller coaster of sublime victories and harrowing losses, loyalties corrupted into betrayals, moments of divine happiness and terrible revenge, as players both east and west jockeyed to choose the winning side to make the best investment in a volatile market of alliances. The risks Mithridates took were never for mere riches or fame, though those stakes could be high, but for the very survival of his Greco-Persian Anatolian ideals and for freedom from Roman domination. Indomitable, even in defeat, marveled Appian, Mithridates left no avenue of attack untried. Pliny praised him as the greatest king of his era. Valeus eulogized Mithridates as ever eager for war, a man of exceptional courage, always great in spirit, in strategy a general, in bodily prowess a soldier, in hatred to the Romans a Hannibal. He was the greatest king since Alexander declared Cicero, a compliment that would have thrilled Mithridates. Pompey identified with Alexander, too. Now he assumed Alexander's mantle in a symbolic and literal sense. Pompey the Great was borne along the triumphal route in a golden chariot, studded with glittering gems of every hue. 
Across his shoulders lay the fragile, faded, purple cloak of Alexander the Great, once the cherished possession of Mithridates the Great, the Hellenized Iranian Alexander. Appian was dubious about the cloak, but belief had imbued the ancient garment with reverence, whatever its true provenance. As Pompey lovingly arranged the fabled robe for maximum visibility, the slave standing behind him began to murmur the traditional caution in the victor's ear. Remember, you are mortal. Did this memento mori send a ripple through Pompey's mood? Did it revive a lingering doubt, suppressed ever since he had declined to examine that ravaged body in the magnificent armor? It had been two years since the corpse had been laid in the tomb of the Pontic kings, yet Mithridates had made fools of both Sulla and Lucullus by popping back after everyone assumed he was demolished. One can imagine Pompey's fleeting thought, Yes, I am surely mortal, but is Mithridates. What if? Mithridates' life story is incomplete in many crucial details, and much is suspended in the amber glow of legend, inviting the imagination to fill in what we long to know. In the introduction, I discussed how narrative, history, and historical reconstruction help make sense of imperfect evidence and flesh out missing details and dead ends in the sketchy ancient record without violating known facts, probabilities, and possible outcomes. A related approach, counterfactual or what-if scenario building, allows us to reasonably suggest what might have happened under given conditions. The mysterious circumstances surrounding the demise of a larger-than-life individual like Mithridates beckon historians to imagine what happened behind the scenes presented in the fragmentary sources. As we saw, the ancient historians themselves sometimes disagreed over facts and presented alternative versions of the same events, such as Mithridates' Caucasus crossing and his last hours. From the Middle Ages on, the uncertainty in the ancient record is reflected in the numerous artistic illustrations of alternative scenarios for Mithridates' death. Just as Hypsocrates' disappearance encouraged medieval and modern writers to write the rest of her story, there is ample justification to try to reconstruct a plausible alternative scenario for Mithridates. By all ancient accounts, Mithridates died in his palace in Panticapion in 63 B.C., owing to a combination of self-administered poison and the sword of his bodyguard, or the weapons of Pharnaces' men. The body, retrieved from the tower, should have provided incontrovertible evidence of this event. But in fact, the decomposed body identified as that of Mithridates, after the passage of some months and far removed from the scene of death, was unrecognizable except for a commonplace scar and the royal insignia. Everyone involved, from Mithridates' son Pharnaces and his old friends, to Pompey and the Romans, agreed to assume that the dead man was Mithridates. But the extraordinary situation raises a host of questions. Was Mithridates really dead? Was this really his body? Others have posed these questions. Notably, the great French playwright Jean Racine began his famous tragedy, Mithridate, 1673, with Mithridates' fake death. Mozart's opera of 1770 also opens with Mithridates' reappearance after rumors of his death. Historian Brian McGing suggested in 1998 that the story of Mithridates' suicide in the tower might have been invented by Pharnaces, perhaps to divert accusations of parricide, a strong taboo among Persian-influenced cultures. But other deceptions and motivations were also possible. What if Mithridates was still alive? If anyone was capable of orchestrating a ruse to deceive the Romans into believing he was dead, it was Mithridates. He once substituted his son for the real king Ariathes. A brilliant escape artist, he had frequently eluded capture by stealth and trickery, and more than once he traveled incognito among his own subjects. Mithridates had cheated death repeatedly, and on at least four occasions he had disappeared and was presumed dead. Moreover, Mithridates was a connoisseur of Greek myths, and theatricality and dramatic allusions were his trademarks. Ancient tragedy, as well as comedy, often turned on mistaken identities, 
distinctive scars, birthmarks, gestures, favorite possessions. Mithridates and Pompey knew the story of how Alexander's corpse had been faked. Alexander's best friend Ptolemy had stolen the body from Babylon and transported it in secret to Alexandria, Egypt. To throw his rivals off his track, Ptolemy had sculptors fabricate a realistic wax model of Alexander and clothed it in his royal robes. This double was placed on a sumptuous bier of silver, gold, and ivory inside one of Alexander's own elaborate Persian carriages. Surrounded by Alexander's royal belongings, the replica fooled the pursuers while the real corpse was taken in a nondescript wagon by an obscure route to Egypt. Pharnaces could have sent Pompey a double, a corpse of a man of Mithridates' age and physique, and displaying a cavalryman's scarred thigh, recent sword wounds, and a decomposed face. Such a deception would prevent the Romans from desecrating Mithridates' true remains if he had really died in the tower. No one expected Pompey to inter his enemy's corpse with honors in the Pontic royal tombs. According to the ancient historians, Mithridates had requested safe passage from Panticopion to take refuge among his allies. A deception involving another's corpse could have been devised to cover Mithridates' last great escape. What follows is a plausible, admittedly romantic alternative scenario, drawing on the ancient sources and curious medieval and gothic legends, and turning on logical decision forks, but without venturing beyond the limits of the possible. The Great Escape In his long life, no conspiracy ever escaped Mithridates' notice, wrote Appian. Not even the last one, plotted by Pharnaces, which he voluntarily overlooked and perished in consequence of, so ungrateful is wickedness once it is pardoned. But what if Pharnaces actually had been grateful? If a deception about Mithridates' death and remains were to be perpetuated, it would have begun at this point upon Mithridates' discovery of Pharnaces' conspiracy. Pharnaces knew that his betrayal warranted death. Mithridates had never spared a proven traitor's life. He was especially harsh in punishing treachery within his family. His surprising pardon of Pharnaces was the opposite of what was expected, totally out of character for the practical, ruthless, unsentimental Mithridates. The pardon guaranteed that Pharnaces would be king, if not now, then soon. What was Mithridates' true motivation? When pressed to the wall, when all seemed lost, Mithridates had a long history of successfully slipping away and eluding pursuit. It's not difficult to imagine that with the help of the old general, Metrophanes, father and son, might have negotiated a bargain. When the plot was first discovered, Mithridates still held the upper hand. The stakes were high for both men. For Pharnaces it was life or death. Only by agreeing to Mithridates' conditions could he survive to inherit his father's kingdom. Mithridates, after a half-century of dealing with Romans, knew Rome would never allow him to rule in peace. His plan to invade Italy lacked crucial support, and Pharnaces was his chosen successor. If he forgave his son, Mithridates could pass the crown to his designated heir and promise to disappear completely in exchange for safe passage and a ruse to convince Pompey that he was dead. Pharnaces carried his great-grandfather's Persian name and had been raised within Persian culture. He named his son Darius, and the mother of his daughter, Dynamis, was probably a Sarmatian. Later, as queen of the Bosporus, Dynamis wore an Amazon Persian-style headdress, decorated with Zoroastrian sun symbols. Perhaps Mithridates discerned a strong strain of his own independent spirit in his son. Indeed, as King Pharnaces would retrace his father's path, after a peaceful early reign as a friend of Rome, he would take advantage of the Roman civil war to suddenly rebel, marching a large army with scythe chariots and a strong cavalry across Colchis and into Pontus, in a quixotic quest to recover his father's old kingdom. So, let us imagine that at the crisis of Pharnaces' attempted coup in 63 BC, father and son acknowledged each other as equals at the bargaining table, facilitated by Metrophanes. They would have sworn a sacred oath by the gods' men and Mithra that allowed them both to survive with honor. 
Then they could work out the details of the grand illusion. Now let's replay the events according to the script that might have been composed by Pharnaces and Mithridates. A large, robust corpse that could pass as Mithridates had to be discovered in the tower and shipped to Pompey. Any veteran cavalryman was likely to have the requisite battle scar on the thigh. The face could be easily obliterated beyond recognition with corrosive lime or acid. One cannot help wondering whether the faithful cavalry officer Batuatus volunteered for this supreme sacrifice. Mithridates' armor, scepter, crown, and other regalia would complete the illusion. Old retainers, perhaps Gaius or Metrophanes, could confirm the identification of the body for Pompey. Keeping his part of the bargain, Mithridates dons ordinary traveling clothes and steals away by night, something he'd done many times in the past. Perhaps his castle had secret exits like Hannibal's in Bithynia. The king takes his weapons and what treasures he can carry, gold coins, favorite agate rings, some valuable papers. Where would he go? Escape by sea was impossible. The only safe route was north. Mithridates could ride out and join any one of the Scythian or Sarmatian tribes on the steppes. Their ideals and physical prowess were compatible with his, and he could speak their languages. Mithridates had experienced a nomadic lifestyle in his youth and early reign, and during his evasions of Lucullus and Pompey. He'd recently renewed his friendships with the nomad chieftains. Pharnaces had maintained good relations with these tribes. Two intriguing facts lend support to the idea of an escape into Scythia. Mithridates' son by Adabagina, Mithridates of Pergamon, was ruler of the Bosporan kingdom after Pharnaces. During an uprising, this Mithridates really did take refuge among the Scythians. Mithridates' granddaughter, Dynamis, queen of the Bosporan kingdom during the time of Augustus, also went into exile for a time. She was sheltered by a Sarmatian tribe, perhaps that of her mother. Who would have accompanied Mithridates into secret exile? Perhaps Petuitus, if he survived. His fate is not recorded. And surely Hypsocratea, or perhaps she and the king had already arranged a rendezvous. There are ancient precedents for imagining a post-historical second life for Mithridates and Hypsocratea in the lands beyond the Black Sea. In romances about heroes and heroines of Greek myth, for example, Achilles and Helen of Troy were paired in an idyllic afterlife. They never met in the Troy of Homer's Iliad, but in popular lore the couple enjoyed an extraordinary post-mortem existence as lovers in a mythical Black Sea paradise. Notably, the 1707 opera Mitridate by Scarlatti offers an alternate history, in which Mithridates and Hypsocratea disguise themselves as Egyptian envoys. An obscure will-o'-the-wisp legend mentioned by Edward Gibbon in Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, 1776-88, to even gives Mithridates his final revenge. I have traced this tradition back to medieval Norse saga, in which a barbarian tribe from the Sea of Azov, allied with Mithridates, carried on his dream of one day invading Italy. Led by their chieftain, Odin, this tribe was said to have escaped Roman rule after Pompey's victory by migrating to northern Europe and Scandinavia. They became the Goths, who, still inspired by Mithridates' old struggle, avenged his defeat by overwhelming the Roman Empire. In the vision of the poet William Wordsworth, his old tale tells how vanquished Mithridates northward passed, and hidden in the cloud of years, became Odin, the father of a race, by whom perished the Roman Empire. And so let us suppose that on a May morning in 63 B.C., riding across the vast expanse of green grass carpeted with wild red peonies, Mithridates sheds his royal skin and chooses a nomad's life for the rest of his natural days. In this story, he and Hypsocratea would live among the untamed men and women who loved to roam the boundless plains. In the vision, limbed by the Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus, the steppe nomads were tall, handsome, and robust people with piercing eyes who wandered like happy fugitives from place to place, dressed in furs and wool leggings with blue tattoos, living on the milk of their herds, wild cherries and meat, never spending a night under a roof, eating and drinking, 
buying and selling, holding assemblies, and even sleeping on their steeds or in their wagons. They were no one's subjects. None can even tell you where they are from, since they are conceived, born, and raised in faraway places. Skilled warriors, they delight in danger and warfare, and do not know the meaning of slavery, since all are born of noble blood, and they choose, as their chiefs, those who are conspicuous for long experience as warriors. In this new life, our companions would have the leisure to share their life stories, Mithridates recounting the history of his kingdom, Hypsocratea telling of her free and equal people of Caucasia. Thanks to his Persian heredity and Theriac, Mithridates could have lived another five, ten, or even twenty years had he not died in the tower in 63 B.C. In time, death might have come to Mithridates, in battle, on a hunting expedition, or quietly, in sleep. He would die in Eleutheria, freedom, confident of his exalted place in history and myth. Mithridates' friends would have buried him in the nomad's traditional way, with his horse and a modest cache of golden treasures and cameo rings in an anonymous kurgan on the steps. Mithridates' passing, whether it occurred in the tower as reported in 63 BC or later in secret exile, would have been mourned by the strong woman he liked to call by the masculine form of her name, Hypsicrates. Younger than Mithridates, perhaps in her forties, Hypsicratea still had good years ahead. How did she spend the rest of her life? What follows is a further speculation, based on the conditions of possibility set out in the ancient sources and on new archaeological evidence. Let us begin with the name, Hypsicratea, Hypsicrates. Only two instances of this name are known in the latter part of the first century B.C., one is Mithridates' Amazon friend, Hypsicratea. The other is a mysterious historian named Hypsicrates, who was also associated with Pontus and the Black Sea Kingdom. Coincidence? Or is there a more interesting explanation for this doubling of a very rare name? Little is known about the shadowy figure called Hypsicrates. The historian turns up after 47 B.C., some sixteen years after Mithridates' death in 63 B.C., when Julius Caesar crushed Pharnaces' attempt to regain his father's lost kingdom. Taking over Pontus, Caesar freed a prisoner of war named Hypsicrates at Amisus. This Hypsicrates accompanied Caesar as his historian on campaigns and wrote treatises on the history, geography, and military affairs of Pontus and the Bosporan kingdom. Hypsicrates' works haven't survived, but they were quoted by other historians. Strabo of Pontus cited Hypsicrates as an authority on two highly significant topics, the military fortifications of the Bosporan kingdom and the lifestyle and customs of the Amazons of the Caucasus region. Notably, Strabo mentioned Hypsicrates along with another close friend of Mithridates, the philosopher Metrodorus. Josephus, quoted Hypsicrates on the campaigns of Julius Caesar and on Mithridates of Pergamon. Lucian, a Syrian from Samosata, 2nd century A.D., described Hypsicrates as a historian from Amisus who mastered many sciences. There is one more salient detail. Hypsicrates. He died old. According to Lucian's list of remarkably long lives, Hypsicrates lived to be ninety-two. This set of striking coincidence linking Hypsicratea and Hypsicrates has been overlooked by modern scholars apparently because of the gender difference. But we recall that Mithridates called Hypsicratea by the male form of her name. Mithridates' intellectual and athletic equal, she lived a manly life, riding, hunting, and making war. The name Hypsicratea disappeared from the historical record after 63 B.C., the year Mithridates' death was reported. Everything we know about the person known as Hypsicrates, especially the topics of expertise attributed to him, Amazons and Mithridates' kingdom, points to someone very close to Mithridates, and a notably long life could even hint at access to Mithridatium. I suggest that the historian writing under the name Hypsicrates was none other than Mithridates' beloved companion, Hypsicratea. 
The newfound inscription for the statue honoring Hypsocrates described earlier lends support to this idea. The statue was probably erected during the reign of Mithridates' granddaughter, Queen Dynamis, who knew Hypsocrates. Amazingly, the text of the inscription spells her name with E-S, Hypsocrates, the masculine form of Hypsocrates. We now know that this was not just a private nickname, but that Mithridates' companion was in fact publicly known as Hypsocrates. So, let us suppose that at some point after 63 BC, Hypsocrates returned to Pontus. Perhaps disguised as a man, she took up a scholarly life at Amisus, and was captured by Caesar after the battle at Zela in 47 BC. Another possibility is that she was fighting on Pharnaces' side, and was not taken prisoner by Caesar's soldiers. The lot of a female captive was not enviable. A permanent male persona, as Hypsicrates, would be advantageous. Caesar, impressed by this person's unique knowledge of Mithridates' kingdom and recent history, and possibly even aware of the gender switch and true identity, made Hypsicrates his personal historian. Even the politics of this association are fitting. Mithridates and his circle were pro-Marius foes of Sulla and Pompey. Caesar was pro-Marius and an enemy of Sulla and Pompey. Who was more qualified than Hypsicrates to preserve the story of Mithridates and his kingdom? She had loved Mithridates and fought by his side. She knew the king's store of personal anecdotes, desires, and accomplishments. If Hypsicrates later wrote as the historian Hypsicrates, she may well have been the source of many of the details about Mithridates' character and reign that were preserved by other ancient historians. Mithridates, from the beginning, was the self-conscious author of his own life. Through Hypsicrates, Hypsicrates, he could also have been responsible for his own legend. I have sketched a continuation of Mithridates' story as a historical thought experiment, but in reality Mithridates enjoyed a vital afterlife in history, science, and popular legend for more than two thousand years after his death. In his relentless resistance to Rome, Mithridates, the savior born under an eastern star, represented a genuine alternative to Roman imperialism in the turbulent last days of the Republic. Some sixty years after Mithridates' death, another savior and champion of truth and light was born under a different eastern star. In the turn of the millennium, in the new world that emerged from Mithridates' armed resistance and the Republic's military response, that new king of kings would challenge and eventually win over the mighty Roman Empire, but not by force of arms. Mithridates battled against the tide of history. This intrepid, complex, ideological leader ultimately failed to conquer Rome by violence and war. Yet if we let Rome stand for tyranny, the grandeur of Racine's vision of Mithridates' legacy still rings true. Take charge. Let us, following your name, live up to being your sons everywhere we go. Set dusk and dawn on fire by your hands. Fill the universe without ever leaving the Bosporus. May the Romans, hard-pressed from one end of the world to the other, be unsure where you will be, and find you everywhere. The End You've been listening to The Poison King, The Life and Legend of Mithridates, Rome's Deadliest Enemy, by Adrian Mayer, narrated by Paul Hecht and directed by Erica Jensen. This book is copyrighted 2010 by Adrian Mayer, this recording is copyrighted 2010 by Recorded Books. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.